Once they were in Robin's room, Jonathan took a box of chocolates out of his hold all and gave them to his sister. Thanks, John, that's lovely. Do you feel okay? You look a bit pale. I was blunted last night. Listen, Robs, don't say anything to Courtney about her being like my girlfriend or whatever. I wasn't going to. Good, because you've split up, Robin suggested sympathetically. We weren't ever... We hooked up a couple of times, muttered Jonathan, but I don't know. I think she might be into Kyle now. Courtney's laugh rang out from the upper floor. With a perfunctory smile at his sister, Jonathan returned to his friends. Robin tried to call Ilsa back, but her number was engaged. Hoping this meant that she'd located Nick, Robin texted, Just tried to call you. Please let me know what's going on. I'm worried about you. Robin. Kiss, kiss, kiss. She went back upstairs and started cooking pumpkin ravioli for Courtney. Apparently, sensing that the casserole would soon be leaving the oven, Wolfgang slunk around Max's and Robin's ankles. Checking her watch, Robin noted that Strike was already fifteen minutes late. His record was an hour and a half. She tried, without much success, not to feel angry, after the way he treated her for being late this morning. Robin was just draining the ravioli when the doorbell finally rang. "'Do you want me?' said Max, who was pouring drinks for Jonathan, Courtney and Kyle. "'No, I'll do it,' said Robin shortly. When she opened the door, she knew immediately that Strike, who was peering down at her with unfocused eyes, was drunk. "'Sorry I'm late,' he said thickly. "'Can I have a pee?' She stood back to let him pass. He reeked of doom bar and cigarettes. Tense as she was, Robin noted that he hadn't thought to bring Max a bottle of anything, in spite of the fact he'd apparently spent all afternoon in the pub. The bathroom's there, she said, pointing. He disappeared inside. Robin waited on the landing. He seemed to take a very long time. We're eating up here, she said, when at last he emerged. More stairs? mumble strike. When they reached the open-plan living area, he seemed to pull himself together. He shook hands with Max and Jonathan in turn, and said quite coherently that he was pleased to meet them. Courtney temporarily abandoned Kyle and bounced over to say hello to the famous detective, and Strike looked positively enthusiastic as he took in her looks. Suddenly, very conscious of her own washed-out and puffy-eyed appearance, Robin turned back to the kitchen area to put Courtney's ravioli in a bowl for her. Behind her, she heard Courtney saying, And this is Kyle. Oh, yeah, you're the detective, Kyle said, determinedly unimpressed. Jonathan, Courtney, Kyle and Max already had drinks, so Robin poured herself a large gin and tonic. While she was adding ice, a cheerful Max came back into the kitchen to fetch Strike a beer, then got the casserole out of the oven and onto the table. Wolfgang whined as the object of his devotion was lifted out of his reach. While Max served everyone at the table, Robin set Courtney's ravioli down in front of her. "'Oh, God, no, wait,' said Courtney. "'Is this vegan? Where's the packet?' "'In the bin,' said Courtney, and she got up and walked into the kitchen. Max and Robin were the only two people at the table whose eyes didn't automatically follow Courtney. Robin downed half a gin before picking up her knife and fork. "'No, it's okay,' called Courtney from beside the bin. "'It's vegan!' "'Oh, good,' said Robin. To Robin's left, Max began asking Strike's opinion on various aspects of his character's personality and past. Courtney returned to the table and began to wolf down her pasta, drinking and topping up her wine regularly as she went, while telling Jonathan and Kyle her plans about a protest march at university. Robin joined in neither conversation, but ate and drank in silence, one eye on the mobile beside her plate, in case Ilsa texted or rang back. Couldn't happen, Strike was saying. He wouldn't have been allowed to join up in the first place. Conviction for possession with intent to supply. Total bollocks. Really? The writers did quite a lot of research. Should have known that, then. So, yeah, basically, you dress up in your underwear and short skirts and stuff, Courtney was saying. And when Kyle and John laughed, she said, Don't! It's serious! 
No, this is useful, said Max, scribbling in a notebook. So if he'd been in jail before the army, if he'd done more than thirty months, the army wouldn't have taken him. I'm not wearing suspenders, Kyle. Anyway, Miranda doesn't want... I don't know how long he's supposed to have done, said Max. I'll check. Tell me about drugs in the army. How common? So she says, do you not understand how problematic the word slut is, Courtney? And I'm like, um, what do you think? What do you think a fucking slut walks for? said Kyle, talking over Courtney. He had a deep voice and the air of a young man who was used to being listened to. The screen of Robin's mobile lit up. Ilsa had texted back. Excuse me, she muttered, though nobody was paying her any attention, and she headed into the kitchen area to read what Ilsa had said. Didn't mean to worry you, Nick Holmes shipfaced. He's been in the pub with Corm. We're talking. He says he didn't mean it the way I took it. What other way was there? Kiss. Robin, who felt entirely on Ilsa's side, nevertheless texted back, He's a dickhead, but I know he really loves you. Kiss, kiss, kiss. As she poured herself another double gin and tonic, Max called to her, asking her to bring Strike another beer from the fridge. When Robin set the open bottle down in front of Strike, he didn't thank her, but merely took a long pull on it and raised his voice, because he was having difficulty trying to make himself heard over Kyle and Courtney, whose conversation had now migrated to the unknown Miranda's views on pornography. So, I'm like, you do understand that women can actually choose what to do with their own bodies, Morant? Oh, shit, sorry! Courtney's expansive gesture had knocked over her wine glass. Robin jumped up to get the kitchen roll. By the time she got back, Courtney's glass had been refilled by Kyle. Robin mopped up the wine while the two separate conversations grew steadily louder on either side of her, binned the sodden kitchen roll, then sat back down, wishing she could just go to bed. Trouble background? That's fucking original. Guess what? Plenty of people join the army because they want to serve, not to escape. Pure whorephobia, boomed Kyle. I suppose she thinks waitresses love every fucking minute of their jobs, does she? And he can't have been in one rifles if he's your age. The battalion was only formed. Labour for hire. Where's the fucking difference? I think it was then 2007. And some women enjoy watching porn too. Courtney's words fell loudly into a temporary lull. Everyone looked round at Courtney, who'd blushed and was giggling with her hand over her mouth. It's all right. We're talking feminism, said Kyle, with a smirk. Courtney isn't suggesting, you know, after-dinner entertainment. Kyle! gasped Courtney, slapping his upper arm and dissolving into further giggles. Who wants pudding? Robin asked, standing up to collect the empty plates. Max, too, got to his feet. I'm sorry, strikes all pissed, Robin murmured to Max as she tipped a few uneaten pieces of ravioli into the bin. "'Are you kidding?' said Max, with a slight smile. "'This is pure gold. My character's an alcoholic.' He'd gone, bearing a homemade cheesecake to the table, before Robin could tell him that Strike didn't usually drink this much. Indeed, this was only the second time she'd ever known him drunk. The first time he'd been sad and quite endearing, but tonight there was a definite undercurrent of aggression. She remembered the shouted, Go fuck yourself, she'd heard through the office door that afternoon, and again wondered to whom Strike had been talking. Robin followed Max back to the table, carrying a lemon tart and a third large gin and tonic. Kyle was now treating the entire table to his views on pornography. Robin didn't much like the expression on Strike's face. He'd often displayed an instinctive antipathy towards the kind of young man you could least imagine in the army. She trusted he was going to keep his feelings to himself tonight. Form of entertainment, just like any other, Kyle was saying, with an expansive gesture. Fearful of more accidents, Robin discreetly moved the almost empty wine bottle out of hitting range. When you look at it objectively, strip it from all the puritanical bullshit. Yeah, exactly, said Courtney. Women have got agency over their own movies, gaming. It all stimulates the pleasure centres in your brain, said Kyle, 
now pointing at his own immaculately groomed head. You could make an argument that movies are emotional pornography. All this moralistic, manufactured outrage about porn. I can't eat either of those if they've got dairy in them, Courtney whispered to Robin, who pretended she hadn't heard. Women want to make a living out of their own bodies. That's the literal definition of female empowerment. And you could argue it has more societal benefit than... When I was in Kosovo, said Strike unexpectedly, and all three students turned to look at him with startled expressions. Strike paused, fumbling to get his cigarette out of his pocket. Cormoran, said Robin. You can't smoke. No problem, said Max, getting up. I'll bring an ashtray. It took Strike three attempts to make his lighter work, and in the meantime, everybody watched him in silence. Without raising his voice, he dominated the room. Who'd like cheesecake? Robin said into the silence, her voice artificially cheery. I can't, said Courtney, with a slight pout. But I might be able to have the lemon tart if it's... When I was in Kosovo, Strike repeated, exhaling as Mac returned, placed an ashtray in front of him, and sat back down again. Cheers. I investigated a porn case. Well, human trafficking. A couple of soldiers have paid for sex with underage girls. They were filmed without their knowledge, and the videos ended up on Pornhub. Case ended up part of an international civilian investigation. Whole load of prepubescent boys and girls have been trafficked into porn. The youngest was seven. Strike took a large drag of his cigarette, squinting through the smoke at Kyle. What societal benefit would you say that had? he asked. There was a short, nasty silence in which the three students stared at the detective. Well, obviously, said Kyle, with a small half-laugh. That's, that's a completely different thing. Nobody's talking about kids. That's not, that's illegal, isn't it? I'm talking about porn industries full of trafficking, said Strike, still watching Kyle through his smoke. Women and kids from poor countries. One of the little girls in my case was filmed with a plastic bag over her head while a bloke anally raped her. Out of the corner of her eye, Robin saw Kyle and Courtney throw her darting looks and knew, with an elevator drop in the area of her solar plexus, that her brother must have shared her history with his friends. Max was the only person at the table who seemed entirely relaxed. He was watching Strike with the dispassionate attention of a chemist checking an ongoing experiment. The video of that kid was viewed over a hundred thousand times online, said Strike. Cigarette jammed in his mouth. He now helped himself to a large piece of cheesecake, effectively demolishing it to get a third of it onto his plate. Plenty of pleasure centres stimulated there, eh? He went on, looking up at Kyle. No, but that's completely different, though, said Courtney, rallying to Kyle's defence. We were talking about women who... It's up to women, grown women, to decide what they want to do with their own bod. Did you cook all this? Strike asked Max, through a mouthful of cheesecake. He still had a lit cigarette in his left hand. Yes, said Max. Bloody good, said Strike. He turned back to Kyle. How many waitresses do you know who got trafficked into it? Well, obviously none, but, I mean... You're bound to have seen that bad stuff, aren't you, being police? As long as you don't have to see it, all good, eh? Well, if you feel like that, said Kyle, red in the face now, if you're so against it, you must never have... You've never used porn, then, you don't... If nobody else wants pudding, said Robin loudly, standing up and pointing towards the sofa area, shall we have coffee over there? Without waiting for an answer... She headed for the kitchen area. Behind her, she heard the scraping of a couple of chairs. After switching on the kettle, she headed downstairs to the bathroom, where after she'd peed, she sat for five minutes on the toilet with her face in her hands. Why had Strike turned up drunk? Why did they have to talk about rape and porn? Her attacker had been a voracious consumer of violent pornography, 
with a particular emphasis on choking, but his internet search history had been deemed inadmissible evidence by the judge. Robin didn't want to know whether Strike used porn. She didn't want to think about traffic children being filmed, just as she didn't want to remember Morris's dick pic on her phone or the snuff movie Bill Talbot had stolen. Tired and low, she asked herself why Strike couldn't leave the students alone, if not out of consideration for his host, then for her, his partner. She headed back upstairs. Halfway to the living area, she heard Kyle's heated voice and knew the argument had escalated. Arriving on the top floor, Robin saw the other five sitting around the coffee table, on which stood a cafetiere, a bottle, and the chocolate Jonathan had brought. Strike and Max were both holding glasses of brandy, while Courtney, who was now very obviously drunk, though nowhere near as much as Strike, was nodding along with Kyle's argument, a cup of coffee balanced precariously in her hands. Robin sat back down at the abandoned dining table, away from the rest of the group, took a piece of beef out of the casserole, and fed it to a pathetically grateful Wolfgang. The point is to destigmatize and reclaim derogatory language about women, Kyle was saying to Strike. That's the point. And that'll be achieved by a bunch of fucked noise middle-class girls going for a walk in their underwear, will it? said Strike, his voice thick with alcohol. Well, not necessarily under, began Courtney. It's about ending victim-blaming, said Kyle loudly. Surely you can... And how is it end victim-blaming? Well, obviously, said Courtney loudly, by changing the attitude... The underlying attitudes, you think rapists will see you all marching along and think, better jack in the raping, do you? Courtney and Kyle both began shouting at Strike. Jonathan glanced anxiously at his sister, who felt another of those sickening drops in her stomach. It's about destigmatizing. Oh, don't get me wrong. Plenty of men will enjoy watching you all strut past in your bras, said Strike taking a sloppy gulp of brandy. And I'm sure you'll look great on Instagram. It's not about Instagram, said Courtney, who sounded almost tearful now. We're making a serious point about men who call women sluts. Yeah, you said, said Strike, talking over her again. I'm sure they'll feel properly rebuked watching you prance, prance, boy, in your miniskirt. It's not about rebuking, said Kyle. You're missing the... I'm not missing your super subtle fucking point, snapped Strike. I'm telling you that in the real world, this fucking whore walk... Slut walk, said Kyle and Courtney loudly. It'll make fuck all difference. The kind of man who calls women sluts and look at your fucking sideshow and think, there go a load of sluts, look. Reclaim fucking language all you fucking like. You don't change your real alti at real world attitudes by deciding slurs aren't derog derogatory. Wolfgang, who was still quivering at Robin's ankle in the hope of getting more beef, emitted a loud whimper which made Strike glance around. He saw Robin sitting there, pale and impassive. What do you think about all this? Strike asked her loudly, waving his glass in the direction of the students so that brandy slopped over the rim onto the carpet. I think it would be a good idea to change the subject, said Robin, whose heart was beating so fast it hurt. Would you go on a fucking whore? I don't know, maybe, said Robin, blood thumping in her ears, wanting only for the conversation to end. Her rapist had grunted whore, over and over again during the attack. If her would-be killer had squeezed her neck for another thirty seconds, it would have been the last word she heard on earth. She's being polite, said Strike, turning back to the students. Talking for women now, are you? sneered Kyle. For an actual rape victim, said Courtney. The room seemed to warp. A clammy silence descended. On the edge of Robin's field of vision, she saw Max turn to look at her. Strike got to his feet at the second attempt. Robin knew he was saying something to her, 
but it was all noise. Her ears felt full of cotton wool. Strike lurched off towards the door. He was leaving. He bounced off the doorframe and disappeared from sight. Everyone continued to stare at Robin. Oh, God, I'm really sorry if I shouldn't have said that, whispered Courtney, through the fingers she'd pressed to her mouth. Her eyes were brimming with tears. From downstairs came the sound of the door slamming. It's fine, said a distant voice that sounded quite like Robin's own. Excuse me a moment. She got to her feet and followed Strike. Chapter 41 With that they gan their shivering spears to shake, and deadly points at either's breast to bend, forgetful each to have been ever other's friend. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen The dark, unfamiliar road took the exceptionally drunk strike by surprise. Rain and high winds battered him as he stood, swaying, wondering which direction the tube was. His usually reliable sense of direction was telling him to turn right, so he lurched off that way, searching his pocket for cigarettes as he went, savouring the delicious release of tension and temper he'd just enjoyed. The memory of what had just happened presented itself in a few scattered fragments. Kyle's angry red face. Tosser. Fucking students. Max laughing at something Strike had said. Lots of food. Even more drink. Rain sparkled in the streetlights and blurred Strike's vision. Objects seemed to shrink and enlarge around him, particularly the parked car that suddenly put itself in his path as he attempted to walk in a straight line down the street. His thick fingers fumbled fruitlessly in his pockets. He couldn't find his cigarettes. That last brandy might have been a mistake. He could still taste it. He didn't like brandy, and he'd had a hell of a lot of doom bar with Nick in the pub. It was a mighty effort to walk in these high winds. His glow of well-being was wearing off, but he definitely didn't feel sick, even after all that beef casserole and a sizable bit of cheesecake, though he didn't really want to think about them, nor about the forty or so cigarettes he'd consumed in the past twenty-four hours, nor about the brandy he could still taste. Without warning, his stomach contracted. Strike staggered to a gap between two cars, bent double, and vomited as copiously as he'd done at Christmas, over and over, for several minutes, until he was standing with his hands on his knees, still heaving, but bringing nothing else up. Sweaty-faced, he stood up, wiping his mouth on the back of his hand, pistons banging in his head. It was several seconds before he became aware of the pale figure standing watching him, its fair hair blowing wildly in the wind. What? Oh, he said, as Robin came into focus. It's you. It occurred to him that she might have followed him to bring his forgotten cigarettes, and looked hopefully at her hands, but they were empty. Strike moved away from the puddle of vomit in the gutter, and leaned up against another parked car. I was in the pub with Nick all afternoon, he said thickly under the impression that Robin might be concerned about him. Something hard was pressing into his buttock. Now he realised that he did have his cigarettes on him after all, and he was glad of this, because he'd rather taste tobacco than vomit. He tucked the pack out of his back pocket, and after a few false starts, managed to light up. At last, it penetrated his consciousness that Robin's demeanour was unusual. Focusing on her face, he registered it as white and oddly pinched. What? What? She repeated. Fucking what? Robin swore far less often than Strike did. The damp night air, which felt icy on Strike's sweaty face, was rapidly sobering him up. Robin appeared to be angry. Angrier, in fact, than he'd ever seen her. But drink was still slowing his reactions, and nothing better occurred to him than to repeat. What? You arrive late, she said. Because of course you do. Because when have you ever shown me the common fucking courtesy of turning up on time? 
War, said Strike again, this time less because he was looking for information than in disbelief. She was the unique woman in his life who'd never tried to change him. This wasn't the Robin he knew. You arrive, rat asked, because of course you do, because what do I matter? It's only Robin who'll be embarrassed, and my flatmate, and my fam. He wasn't bothered, Strike managed to say. His memories of the evening weren't particularly distinct, but he was sure of that, at least. Max hadn't minded him being drunk. Max had given him more booze. Max had laughed at a joke he'd made, which he couldn't now remember. He liked Max. And then you launch an attack on my guests. And then, said Robin, you lay me open to having something I wanted to keep private. To keep... Her eyes were suddenly wet. Her fists clenched, her body rigid. To keep private, banded about in a fucking argument in front of strangers. Did it once occur... Hang on, said Strike. I never once occur to you that I might not want rape discussed in front of people I barely know. I never... Why were you asking me whether I think slut walks are a good idea? Well, obviously, because... Did we need to talk about child rape over dinner? I was making up... And then you walk out and leave me to... Well, said Strike, by the sounds of it, the sooner I left, the better. Better for you, she said, advancing on him, her teeth bared. He'd never seen her like this before. Because you got to dump all your aggression at my house, then walk out and let me clean up your fucking mess as per usual. As per fucking usual, said Strike, eyebrows raised. Wait a... Now... I've got to go back in there and make it all right, soothe everyone's feelings. No, you haven't, Strike contradicted her. Go to fucking bed if you... It's what I do, shouted Robin, thumping herself hard on the sternum with each word. Shocked into silence, Strike stared at her. Like I remember to say please and thank you to the secretary when you don't give a toss. Like I excuse your bad moods to other people when they get offended. Like I suck up a ton of shit on your behalf. Whoa, said Strike, pushing himself off the stationary car and looking down at her from his full height. Where is all this? And you can't be fucking bothered with all I do for you to arrive sober for one dinner. If you must know, said Strike, temper rising anew from the ashes of his previous euphoria. I was in the pub with Nick, who, whose wife just lost their baby, I know. And what the fuck was he doing in the pub with you, leaving her to... She threw him out, barked Strike. Did she tell you that, during the great sisterhood grievance meeting? And I'm not going to apologise for wanting some fucking R&R after the week I've just had. Whereas I don't need R&R, do I? I haven't forfeited half me annual leave. How many times have I thanked you for covering for me when I'm in court? So, what was with you being an arsehole to me this morning when I was late for the first fucking time ever? I'd had three and a half hours sleep. You live over the bloody office! Fuck this, said Strike, throwing his cigarette down. He began to walk away from her, certain now of the direction to the tube, thinking of the things he could have said, that it was guilt about the pressure he was putting on Robin that had kept him in London, when he should be in St. Moore's with his dying aunt. Johnny Rokeby on the phone that morning, and Nick's tears in the pub, and the relief it had been to sit with an old mate and drink, and listen to someone else's troubles, instead of fret about his own. "'And don't!' bellowed Robin from behind him. "'Buy me any more fucking flowers!' "'No danger of that!' yelled Strike over his shoulder, as he strode away into the darkness. Chapter 42 His late fight with Britomart So sore did him offend That ride he could not Till his hurts he did amend. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen When Strike woke on Saturday morning With a thumping headache and a foul-tasting mouth It took him a while to piece together Exactly what had happened the previous evening. Aside from the memory of vomiting which he felt he'd done far too much of lately. All he could at first recall were Kyle's bright red face and Robin's pinched white one. But then 
Slowly, he reconstructed Robin's complaints. Arriving late and drunk, being rude to her brother, and upsetting a dinner party by telling a couple of students what he considered home truths about the real world. He also thought there'd been mention of him being insufficiently touchy-feely with staff. Gingerly, he got out of bed and, with the aid of the furniture, hopped his way to the bathroom and then into the shower. A strike washed, two separate impulses did battle within him. One was the urge to self-justify, which patted him on the back and awarded him a win for what he could remember of his argument with the students. The other was an innate honesty about his motives that forced him to recognise that his instant antagonism to Robin's guests had been rooted in their resemblance to the kinds of people towards whom his mother would have instantly gravitated. Later Strike's whole life had been a battle against constraint of any kind. Going for a march in her underwear would have seemed to her just one more fabulous blow against limitations. Strike, who never forgot Leda's generous heart or her ineradicable love of the underdog, was nevertheless clear-eyed about the fact her activism had mostly taken the form of enthusiastic exhibitionism. Not for Leda the tedious toil of door-to-door -door canvassing, the difficult business of compromise, or the painstaking work structural change entailed. Never a deep or critical thinker, she'd been a sucker for what Strike thought of as intellectual charlatans. The basis for her life's philosophy, if such a word could be used for the loose collection of whims and knee-jerk reactions she called beliefs, was that everything, of which the bourgeoisie disapproved, must be good and right. Naturally, she'd have sided with Kyle and Courtney in championing pornography and slut walks, and she'd have seen her son's quibbles as something he must have picked up from her killjoy sister-in-law. While Strike dried himself and put on his prosthesis, moving cautiously in deference to his throbbing head, the idea of phoning Robin occurred, only to be dismissed. His long-established habit, in the aftermath of a row with a woman, was to wait for her to make the next move, which he considered mere common sense. If she apologised, all well and good. If she wanted further discussion, there was a chance she'd be calmer after a spell of reflection. If she was still angry, it was simply masochistic to volunteer for further grief until she came looking for it. While Strike wasn't in principle opposed to offering an unsolicited apology in the event that he felt himself to have been in the wrong, in practice his apologies tended to be delivered late, and only when it became clear that resolution would come no other way. This modus operandi owed much to his experiences with Charlotte. Attempting to make up with Charlotte before every last ounce of her fury had been spent had been like trying to rebuild a house during an earthquake. Sometimes, after he refused to accede to some new demand, usually leaving the army, but sometimes giving up contact with another female friend, or refusing to spend money he didn't have, all of which were seen by Charlotte as proof he didn't love her. Charlotte would walk out, and only after she came back, by which time Strike might well have met or slept with someone else, would the row be discussed. Their arguments had often lasted a week or more. A couple of times, Strike had returned to postings abroad before anything was resolved. Yet, as he ate a much-needed bacon roll, drank coffee, and downed a couple of Nurofen, after he called Ted, heard that Joan was still holding out, and assured him that he and Lucy would be there the following day, while opening a couple of bits of post and ripping up a large gilt-ed invitation to the Deadbeat's fiftieth anniversary party in May, while food shopping in the everlasting wind and rain, stocking up for what might be a journey of many hours, while he packed clothes for the trip, spoke to Lucy, and checked the weather forecast, his thoughts kept returning to Robin. Gradually, he realised that what was bothering him most was the fact that he'd got used to Robin being on his side, which was one of the main reasons he tended to seek reasons to call her if he was at a loose end or feeling low. Over time, they developed a most soothing and satisfying camaraderie, and Strike hadn't imagined it could be disrupted by what he categorised as a dinner-party row. When his phone rang at four o'clock in the afternoon, he surprised himself by snatching it up in hopes that it was his partner, 
only to see yet another unknown number. Wondering whether he was about to hear Rokeby again, or some other unknown blood relative, he answered. Straight. What? said a sharp, middle-class female voice. Cormoran Strike here, who's this? Claire Spencer, the Athorn social worker. You left a message for me. Oh, yes, said Strike, pulling out a kitchen chair and sitting down. Thanks for getting back to me, Mrs. er, uh, Miss Spencer. Mrs., she said, sounding very slightly amused. Can I just ask, are you the Cormoran Strike? I doubt there are many others, said Strike. He reached for his cigarettes, then pushed them away again. He really did need to cut down. I see, said Claire Spencer. Well, it was a bit of a shock to get a message from you. How do you know the Athorns? Their name came up, said Strike, thinking how very inaccurate a statement that was, in the course of a case I'm investigating. Was it you who went into their downstairs neighbour's shop and threatened him? I didn't threaten him, said Strike. But his attitude seemed aggressive, so I pointed out that they had friends who might take it amiss if he bullied them. Ha! Ah, said Claire, sounding warmer. He's a horror, that man. He's been trying to get them out of that flat for ages, wants to buy the whole building. He removed a supporting wall, then tried to blame Deborah and so on for his ceiling sagging. He's caused them a lot of stress. That flat was, Strike almost said, mucked out, but tried to find a politer way of saying it. Thoroughly cleaned recently, he said. Yes. I'm not denying it was pretty messy, but we've sorted that out now. And as for saying they've caused structural damage, we got a surveyor in, who went through the whole place and agreed there's nothing wrong with it. What a chance of a man is. Anyway, you did a good thing there, warning him off. He thinks because they haven't got many close relatives he can get away with browbeating them. So what's this case you're investigating? Briefly, Strike told her about Margot Bambara, her disappearance in 1974, and the information that had led him to the Athorn's door. And so, he concluded, I wanted to talk to someone who could tell me how much reliance I can put on what they've told me. There was a brief silence. I see, said Claire, who sounded a little more guarded now. Well, I'm afraid I've got a duty of confidentiality as their social worker, so could I ask you some questions? And if you can't answer, obviously I'll accept that. All right, she said. He had the impression that his actions with regard to the bullying ironmonger had put her on his side. They're clearly competent to live alone, said Strike. With support, yes, said Claire. They've done very well, actually. They've got a strong mutual bond. It's probably kept both of them out of institutionalised care. And what exactly? Strike wondered how to word the question sensitively. Claire came to his aid. Fragile X syndrome, she said. Deborah's relatively high-functioning, although she's got some social difficulties, but she can read and so forth. Soen copes better socially, but his cognitive impairment's greater than his mother's. And the father, Wilhelm? Claire laughed. <laughs> I've only been their social worker for a couple of years. I never knew Gwilhelm. You can't tell me how sane he was. There was a longer pause. Well, she said, I suppose it seems to be common knowledge that he was very odd. Various family members have spoken to me about him. Apparently he thought he could hex people with black magic, you know. Deborah told me something I found slightly concerning. It involved a doctor called Dr. Brenner, who was a partner of Dr. Bamborough's at the St. John's practice. She might have been referring to a medical examination, but he thought Claire had said something. Sorry? No, nothing. What exactly did she tell you? Well, said Strike, she mentioned having to take her pants off, and not wanting to, but she said Wilhelm told her she had to. I assumed this was a doctor. Yes, said Strike. There was another longer pause. I really don't know what to tell you, said Claire finally. It's possible that was a medical examination, but, well, a lot of men used to visit that flat. Strike said nothing, wondering whether he was being told what he thought he was being told. 
Gwilherm had to get drink and drugs money somewhere, said Clare. From what Deborah's disclosed to social workers over the years, we think he was... Well, not to put too fine a point on it, we think he was pimping her out. Christ, muttered Strike in disgust. I know, said Clare. From bits and pieces she's told caregivers, we think Gwilherm used to take Sowen out whenever she was with a client. It is dreadful, she's so vulnerable. On balance, I can't be sorry Gwilherm died young. But please, don't mention any of this to Deborah's family if you speak to them. I've no idea how much they know, and she's happy and settled these days. There's no need to upset anyone. No, of course not, said Strike. And he remembered Sowen's words, Old Joe Brenner was a dirty old man. How reliable would you say Sowen's memory is? Why? What's he told you? A couple of things his uncle Tudor said. Well, people with fragile X usually have quite good long-term memories, said Clare cautiously. I'd say he'd be more reliable about things his uncle Tudor told him than on many subjects. Apparently Uncle Tudor had a theory about what happened to Margot Bambara. It involves some people called Nico and his boys. Ah, said Clare. Yes. Do you know who that is? Go on. There was an old gangster who used to live in Clerkenwell, said Clare, called Niccolo Ricci. Sowen likes talking about Nico and his boys, like they're folk heroes or something. They talked for a couple more minutes, but Clare had nothing more of interest to tell. Well, thanks very much for getting back to me, said Strike. Social workers work Saturdays as well as detectives, I see. People don't stop needing help at weekends, she said dryly. Good luck. I hope you find out what happened to that poor doctor. But he could tell by her tone, however friendly, that she thought it highly unlikely. Strike's headache had now settled into a dull throb that increased if he bent over or stood up too suddenly. He returned to his methodical arrangements for next day's departure to Cornwall, emptying his fridge of perishables, making sandwiches for the trip, listening to the news which told him that three people had died that day as a result of the adverse weather conditions, packing his kit bag, ensuring his emails were up to date, setting up an out-of-office message redirecting potential clients to Pat, and checking the rotor to make sure it had been altered to accommodate his absence. Through all these tasks he kept an ear out for his mobile, in case a text from Robin arrived, but nothing came. Finally, at eight o'clock, while he was finishing cooking the fry-up he felt he was owed given his hangover and how hard he'd worked all day, his mobile buzzed at last. From across the table he saw that three long consecutive texts had arrived. Knowing that he was leaving the following morning without any clear idea of when he'd be back, Robin appeared to have begun the reconciliation process, as women were wont to do, with an essay on her various grievances. He opened the first message, magnanimously prepared to accept almost any terms for a negotiated peace, and only then realised that it was from an unknown number. I thought today was Valentine's Day, but I've just realised it's the 15th. They've got me on so many drugs in here I can hardly remember my name. I'm in a place again. This isn't my phone. There's another woman here who's allowed one, and she lent it to me. Yours is the only mobile number I know by heart. Why didn't you ever change it? Was it because of me, or is that my vanity? I'm so full of drugs I can't feel anything, but I know I love you. I wonder how much they'd have to give me before that went too. Enough to kill me, I suppose. The next message from the same number read, How did you spend Valentine's Day? Did you have sex? I'm here partly because I don't want sex. I can't stand him touching me, and I know he wants more kids. I'd rather die than have more. Actually, I'd rather die than most things. But you know that about me. Will I ever see you again? You could come and see me here. Today I imagined you walking in, like I did, when your leg. I imagine you telling them to let me go, because you loved me, and you'd look after me. I cried and... The third message continued. 
The psychiatrist was pleased to see me crying, because they like emotion. I don't know what the whole address is, but it's called Simmons House. I love you. Don't forget me, whatever happens to me. I love you. A fourth and final message read, It's Charlotte, in case that isn't obvious. Strike read the entire thread through twice. Then he closed his eyes, and like millions of his fellow humans, wondered why troubles could never come singly but in avalanches, so that you became increasingly destabilized with every blow that hit you. Chapter 43 And you, fair lady knight, my dearest dame, relent the rigour of your wrathful will, whose fire were better turned to other flame, and wiping out remembrance of all ill, grant him your grace. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen To Robin's relief, her three guests got up early the next morning because they wanted to spend a full day in London. All were subdued, after what Robin thought of as the nightmare dinner. She dreaded a tearful plea for forgiveness from Courtney, who seemed especially low, so Robin faked a cheery briskness she certainly didn't feel, making recommendations for cheap places to eat and good things to see before waving the students off. As Robin was due to run surveillance on Eleanor Dean overnight, she'd given Jonathan a spare key and wasn't sorry that she'd probably still be in Stoke Newington when the students returned to Manchester, because they intended to catch a mid-morning Sunday train. Not wanting to be alone with Max, in case he wanted a post-mortem on the previous evening, Robin made herself a voluntary prisoner in her own bedroom all day, where she continued to work on her laptop, attempting to block out waves of anger towards strike, and a tearfulness that kept threatening to overcome her. Hard as she tried to concentrate on finding out who'd been living in Jerusalem Passage when Margot disappeared, however, her thoughts kept returning to her partner. Robin wasn't in the least surprised not to have heard from him, but was damned if she'd initiate contact. She couldn't, in good conscience, retract a word of what she said after watching him vomit in the gutter, because she was tired of being taken for granted in ways Strike didn't recognise. But as the afternoon wore on, and the rain continued to fall outside her window, and while she hadn't been nearly as drunk as Strike, she developed a dull headache. Equal parts of misery and rage dragged at her every time she remembered last night's dinner, and all the things she'd shouted at Strike in the street. She wished she could cry, but the tightness in her chest prevented her doing so. Her anger boiled anew every time she remembered the drunk Strike attacking her guests, but then she found herself rerunning Courtney and Kyle's arguments in her head. She was sure none of the students had ever brushed up against the ugliness Robin had encountered not merely under that dark stare in her hall of residence, but during her work with Strike. Battered women, raped girls, death. They didn't want to hear Strike's stories, because it was so much more comforting to believe that language alone could remake the world. But none of that made her feel more kindly to her partner. On the contrary, she'd resented agreeing with him. He'd been looking for someone or something to attack, and it was she who'd paid the price. Robin forced herself to keep working, because work was her one constant, her salvation. By eight in the evening, Robin was as sure as a thorough perusal of online records could make her that nobody living in Jerusalem Passage had been there for forty years. By this time, she was so hungry that she really did need to eat something, which she feared meant facing Max and discussing Strike. Sure enough, when she reached the living area, she found Max sitting watching TV with Wolfgang on his lap. He muted the news the moment he saw her, and Robin's heart sank. Evening. Hi, said Robin. I'm going to make myself something to eat. Do you want anything? There's still a bit of casserole if you want it. Strike didn't finish it all, then. She mentioned him first, in the spirit of getting it over with. She could tell that Max had things to say. No, said Max. He lifted the sleepy Wolfgang onto the sofa beside him, stood up, and moved to the kitchen. I'll heat it up for you. There's no need, I can't— But Max did so. 
and when Robin was settled at the table with her food and drink, he sat down at the table with her with a beer. This was highly unusual, and Robin felt suddenly nervous. Was she being softened up for some kind of unwelcome announcement? Had Max decided, after all, to sell up? Never told you how I ended up in such a nice flat, did I? he said. No, said Robin cautiously. I had a big payout, five years ago. Medical negligence. Oh, said Robin. There was a pause. Max smiled. People usually say shit won't went wrong. But you never probe, do you? I've noticed that. You don't ask a lot of questions. Well, I have to do a lot of that at work, said Robin. But that wasn't why she hadn't asked Max about his finances, and it wasn't why she didn't ask now what had gone wrong with his body or his treatment either. Robin had too many things in her own past that she didn't want endlessly probed to want to cause other people discomfort. I was having palpitations seven years ago, said Max, examining the label on his beer. Arrhythmia. I got referred to a heart specialist and he operated. Opened me up and ablated my sinus node. You probably don't know what that is, he said, glancing up at Robin, and she shook her head. I didn't either, until they bulged mine up. Basically, they knackered my heart's ability to beat for itself. I ended up having to be fitted with a pacemaker. Oh, no, said Robin, a bit of beef suspended in mid-air on her fork. And the best bit was, said Max, none of it was necessary. There wasn't anything wrong with my sinus node in the first place. Turned out I hadn't been suffering from atrial tachycardia at all. It was stage fright. I... Max, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it wasn't good, said Max, taking a sip of his beer. Two unnecessary open-heart surgeries, endless complications. I lost jobs. I was unemployed for four years, and I'm still on antidepressants. Matthew said I had to pursue a claim against the doctors. I probably wouldn't have done if he hadn't nagged me. Lawyer's fees, ton of stress. But I won in the end, got a big payout. And he persuaded me to sink it all into a decent property. He's a barrister. He earns great money. Anyway, we bought this place. Max pushed his thick blonde hair out of his face and glanced down at Wolfgang, who trotted to the table to savour the smell of casserole once more. A week after we moved in, he sat me down and told me he was leaving. The ink was barely dry on the mortgage. He said he'd struggled against it because he felt a loyalty to me, because of what I'd been through, but he couldn't fight his feelings any longer. He told me, said Max with a hollow smile, he'd realised pity wasn't love. He wanted me to keep the flat, didn't want me to buy him out, as if I could have done. So he signed over his half. That was to make him feel less guilty, obviously. And off he went with Tiago. He's Brazilian, the new guy. Owns a restaurant. That, said Robin quietly, sounds like hell. Yeah, it was. I really need to stop looking at their bloody Instagram accounts. Max heaved a deep sigh and absent-mindedly rubbed the shirt over the scars on his chest. Obviously, I thought of just selling up but we barely lived here together, so it's not as though it's got a ton of memories. I didn't have the energy to go through more house hunting and moving. So here I've stayed, struggling to make the mortgage every month. Robin thought she knew why Max was telling her all this, and her hunch was confirmed when he looked directly at her and said, Anyway, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry about what happened to you. I had no idea. Ilsa only told me you were held at gunpoint. Oh, I didn't get raped then, said Robin. And to Max's evident surprise, she started to laugh. Doubtless it was her tiredness, but it was a relief to find dark comedy in this litany of terrible things humans did to each other, though none of it was really funny at all. His mutilated heart, the gorilla mask in her nightmares. No, the rape happened ten years ago. That's why I dropped out of university. Shit, said Max. Yeah, said Robin. And echoing Max, she said, It wasn't good. So, when did the knifing happen? 
asked Max, eyes on Robin's forearm, and she laughed again. Really, what else was there to do? That was a couple of years ago. Working for Strike? Yes, said Robin, and she stopped laughing now. Listen, about last night. I enjoyed last night, said Max. You can't be serious, said Robin. I'm completely serious. It was really useful for building my character. He's got some proper big man take no bullshit energy about him, hasn't he? You mean he acts like a dick? Max laughed and shrugged. Is he very different sober? Yes, said Robin. Well, I don't know. Less of a dick. And before Max could ask anything else about her partner, she said quickly, He's right about your cooking anyway. That was fantastic. Thanks so much. I really needed that. Having cleared up, Robin returned downstairs, where she showered before changing for the night surveillance. With an hour to go before she needed to take over from Hutchins, she sat back down on her bed and idly typed variations on the name Paul Satchwell into Google. Paul L. Satchwell, L. P. Satchwell, Paul Leonard Satchwell, Leo Paul Satchwell. Her mobile rang. She glanced down. It was strike. After a moment or two, she picked it up, but said nothing. Robin? Yes. Are you okay to talk? Yes, she said again, her heart beating faster than usual as she frowned up at the ceiling. Calling to apologize. Robin was so astonished she said nothing for several seconds. Then she cleared her throat and said, Can you even remember what you're apologizing for? Ah, uh, yeah, I think so, said Strike. I didn't mean that to get dragged up. Should have realized it wasn't a subject you want discussed over dinner. Didn't think. Tears started in Robin's eyes at last. Okay, she said, trying to sound casual. And I'm sorry for being rude to your brother and his friends. Thank you, said Robin. There was a silence. The rain still fell outside. Then Strike said, have you heard from Ilsa? No, said Robin. Have you heard from Nick? No, said Strike. There was another silence. So we're okay, yeah? said Strike. Yes, said Robin, wondering whether it was true. If I've taken you for granted, said Strike, I'm sorry. You're the best I've got. Oh, for fuck's sake, Strike, said Robin abandoning the pretense that she wasn't crying as she snorted back tears. What? You just... you're bloody infuriating. Why? Saying that, now. That's not the first time I've said it. It is, actually. I've told other people. <laughs> yeah, well, said Robin, now laughing and crying simultaneously as she reached for tissues. You see how that isn't the same thing as telling me. Yeah, I suppose, said Strike. Now you mention it. He was smoking at his small Formica kitchen table while the eternal rain fell outside his attic window. Somehow, the text from Charlotte had made him realise he had to call Robin, had to make things right with her before he set off for Cornwall and Joan. Now the sound of her voice and her laughter acted on him as it usually did, by making everything seem fractionally less awful. When are you leaving? Robin asked drying her eyes. Tomorrow at eight. Lucy's meeting me at the car hire. We've got a jeep. Well, be careful, said Robin. She'd heard on the news that day about the three people who died trying to travel through the wind and the floods. Yeah, can't pretend I don't wish you were driving. Lucy's bloody terrible behind the wheel. You can stop flattering me now. I've forgiven you. I'm serious, said Strike, his eyes on the relentless rain. You and your advanced driving course. You're the only person who doesn't scare the shit out of me behind the wheel. Do you think you'll make it? Possibly not all the way in the jeep, but Paul was standing by to rescue us. He's got access to dinghies. We've got to do it. Joan might only have days. Well, I'll be thinking about you, said Robin, keeping everything crossed. Cheers, Robin. Keep in touch. After Strike had hung up, Robin sat for a while, 
savouring the sudden feeling of lightness that had filled her. Then she pulled her laptop towards her, ready to shut it down before she left for her night's surveillance in the Land Rover. Casually, as she might have thrown the dice one last time before turning away from the craps table, she typed, Paul Satchwell Artist, into Google. Artist Paul Satchwell has spent most of his career on the Greek island of... What? said Robin aloud, as though the laptop had spoken to her. She clicked on the result, and the website of the Leamington Spa Museum and Art Gallery filled the screen. She hadn't once seen it in all her hours of searching for Satchwell. This page had either just been created or amended. Temporary Exhibition, March the 3rd to the 7th, 2014. Local Artists. The Leamington Spa Museum and Art Gallery will be hosting a temporary exhibition of artists from the Warwickshire area, entrance free. Robin scrolled down the page past sundry artists' photos until she saw him. It was, without a doubt, the same man. His face might be leathery and cracked, his teeth might have yellowed, his thick curly hair turned whiter and thinner, but it still hung to his shoulders, while his open shirt showed thick white chest hair. Born in Leamington Spa and raised in Warwick, artist Paul Satchwell has spent most of his career on the Greek island of Kos. Working mainly in oils, Paul's Hellenic-influenced exploration of myths challenged the viewer to face primal fears and examine preconceptions through sensual use of line and colour. Robin closed her laptop. Chapter 44 Huge sea of sorrow and tempestuous grief, wherein my feeble bark is tossed long, far from the hoped haven of relief. Why do thy cruel billows beat so strong, and thy moist mountains each on others throng, threatening to swallow up my fearful life? Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen The storm-water, rain and gales they faced were real enough, yet Strike and Lucy's battle to reach St. Moore's had a strange dreamlike quality. Both knew death lay at the end. Both were resolved that if they managed to reach Joan alive, they would stay with her until she died. Trees swayed and creaked as they sped along the motorway. They had to divert around great wide lakes where lately there had been fields, forcing them miles out of their way. Twice they were halted at roadblocks and told, by irate police, to turn back. They pressed on, at one point driving fifty miles to progress fifteen, listening to every weather update on the radio, and becoming progressively more certain that there would come a point where they had to abandon the jeep. Rain lashed the car, high winds lifted the windscreen wipers from the glass, and brother and sister took it in turns to drive, bound by a single objective, and temporarily freed from all other concerns. To Strike's grateful surprise, the crisis had revealed a different Lucy, just as illness had uncovered a different Joan. His sister was focused entirely on what needed to be done. Even her driving was different, without three noisy sons in the back seat, squabbling and thumping each other if the journey lasted longer than twenty minutes. He'd forgotten how efficient and practical Lucy could be, how patient, how resolute. Her calm determination only broke when they reached an impasse thirty miles from St. Moore's, where flooding and fallen trees had rendered the road impassable. While Lucy sat slumped at the steering wheel, sobbing with her face in her arms, Strike left the jeep to stand outside under a tree, where, sheltering from the perennial rain and taking the opportunity to smoke, he called Dave Polworth, who was holding himself ready to assist them. "'Yeah, we thought that's where you'd have to stop,' said Polworth, when Strike had given him their position. "'Who's we?' "'Well, I can't fucking do this alone, can I, Diddy? Should be with you in an hour.' Stay in the car. And an hour later, true to his word, Dave Polworth and five other men, two of them members of the local lifeguard, three old school friends of Strike's, emerged out of the gathering gloom. Dressed in waterproofs and carrying waders ready for the worst passages, the men took charge of Strike and Lucy's bags. Leaving the jeep parked up a side street, the party set off on foot. The end of Strike's stump began to chafe 
long before they had walked for two hours solid over boggy ground and slippery tarmac. Soon, he had to abandon pride and allow two of his old school friends to support him on either side. Darkness fell before they reached the couple of dinghies that Polworth had arranged to carry them over flooded fields. Using oars to alternately row and punt themselves along, they navigated with the aid of torches and compasses. Polworth had called on every friend and acquaintance he knew to arrange Strike and Lucy's passage across the storm-ravaged peninsula. They covered several miles by tractor pulling a trailer, but at some passages were forced to wade through feet of icy flood water, the diminutive Lucy accepting a piggyback from the largest lifeboatman. Four hours after they'd abandoned the jeep, they reached St. Moore's. At the gate of Ted and Joan's house, brother and sister hugged each of their escorts goodbye. Don't start, said Polworth, as the weary and sore strike tried to put into words what he felt to be incommunicable. Get inside, or what the fuck was it all for? Ted, whom they'd updated regularly through their journey, greeted them in pyjamas at the back door, tears running down the deep folds in his craggy face. I never thought you'd get here, he kept saying, as he made them tea. Never thought you'd make it. Oh, is she? asked the shivering Lucy, as the three of them sat in the kitchen, their hands around mugs of tea, eating toast. She managed a bit of soup today, said Ted. She's still, she sleeps a lot. But when she's awake, she likes to talk. Oh, she'll be over the moon to have you two here. And so began days that had the same strange outside time quality of their journey. Initially, Strike, the end of whose stump was rubbed raw after the painful exigencies of their journey, abandoned his prosthesis and navigated the small house by hopping and holding onto chair backs and walls. He read and responded to Robin's emails about the agency's work, but her news seemed to come from a place far more remote than London. Joan was now bird-like in her frailty, her bones visible through the translucent skin. She'd made it clear that she wished to die at home, not in the hospital in Truro. So she lay, tiny and shrunken, in the large double bed that dominated the bedroom, a bed that had been purchased to accommodate Ted's bulk back when he'd been a tall, fit, and muscular man, late of the Royal Military Police, and subsequently a stalwart member of the local lifeguard. By day, Strike, Ted and Lucy took it in turns to sit beside Joan's bed, because awake or asleep, she liked to know that one of them was nearby. Carenza came morning and afternoon, and these were the only times when her family left the room. Joan was no longer able to swallow medication, so Carenza began injecting the morphine through a syringe driver. Strike knew that she washed his aunt, and helped her perform still more private functions. The long convalescence after his amputation had left him under no illusion about what nurses dealt with. Kind, efficient, and humane, Carenza was one of the few people Strike welcomed gladly into the drafty kitchen. And still Joan clung on. Three days after their arrival, four, she slept almost constantly, but still she clung to life. As you two, said Ted. She doesn't want to go while you two are here. Strike was coming to dread silences too large for human voices to fill. His nerves were stretched by the constant clinking of teaspoons in hot drinks, made for something to do, by the tears shed by Uncle Ted when he thought nobody was looking, by the hushed inquiries of well-meaning neighbours. On the fifth day, Lucy's husband Greg arrived with their three boys. Husband and wife had debated how sensible it was to take the boys out of school and risk a journey that remained tricky, though the storms had at last subsided, but Lucy could bear their absence no longer. When Greg arrived, the boys came running out of the car towards their mother, and the whole family clung to each other, while Strike and Ted looked on, united in their aloneness, unmarried man, and soon-to-be widower. The boys were led up to Joan's bedroom to see her, and she managed smiles for all of them. Even Luke was subdued afterwards, and Jack cried. Both spare rooms were now needed to accommodate the new arrivals, so Strike returned 
uncomplaining, to sleep on the sofa. "'You look like shit,' Polworth informed him bluntly on day six. And indeed Strike, who'd woken every hour on the horsehair sofa, felt it. "'Let's get a pint.' "'Can I come?' asked Jack hopefully. He was showing a tendency to hang around Strike rather than his father, while Lucy sat upstairs with Joan. "'You can if your dad says it's okay," said Strike. Greg, who was currently walking around the garden with his phone clamped to his ears, trying to contribute to a conference call with his London office while Luke and Adam played football around him, agreed with a thumbs up. So Strike, Polworth and Jack walked down into St Moors together. Though the sky was dark and the road still wet, the winds had at last dropped. As they reached the seafront, Strike's mobile rang. He answered it, still walking. Strike? It's Shanker. Got your message. I left that ten days ago, said Strike. I've been busy, you ungrateful piece of shit. Sorry, said Strike. He waved the other two on and paused again at the harbour wall, looking out at the green-grey sea and the hazy horizon. I've nosed around a bit, said Shanker, and you're not going to find out who that bimp was, Bunsen, the one on the film. Nobody knows. She'll have done something fucking serious to get that, though. Deserved it, you reckon, said Strike, as he surveyed the flat sea. It didn't look capable now of the violence it had inflicted upon the town. I'm not saying she deserved. I'm saying even Mucky Ricci didn't make an habit of that, said Shanker impatiently. Are you in solitary? What? Where the fuck are you? There's no noise. In Cornwall. For a moment, Strike expected Shanker to ask where that was. Shanker was almost impressively ignorant of the country that lay beyond London. What the fuck are you doing in Cornwall? My aunt's dying. Oh, shit, said Shanker. Sorry. Where is he now? Who? Oh, Ricci. He's in an home, I told you. All right. Thanks for trying, Shanker. Appreciate it. For perhaps the first time ever, it was Shanker who shouted at Strike to stop him hanging up. Oi! Oi! What? said Strike, raising the mobile to his ear again. Why do you want to know where he is? You ain't going to go talking to Ricci. You're done. I'm not done, said Strike. Eyes screwed up against the sea breeze. I haven't found out what happened to the doctor yet. Fuck's sake! Do you want to get shot through the fucking head? See you, Shanker, said Strike. And before his old friend could say anything else, he cut the call and muted his phone. Polworth was already at a table with Jack when Strike reached the victory, two pints and a coke on the table. Just been telling Jack, Polworth told Strike, as the detective sat down. Haven't I, eh? he asked Jack, who nodded beaming. For when he's older, this is his local. A pub three hundred miles from where he lives. He was born in Cornwall. He was just telling me. Oh, yeah, said Strike. I forgot about that. The family had been staying with Ted and Joan when Lucy went into labour a month early. Jack had been born in the same Truro hospital as Strike himself. And you're a Nan Caro on your mum's side, Polworth told Jack, who was greatly enjoying Polworth's approval. So that makes you a Cornishman, born and bred. Polworth turned to Strike. Who was the pearly king on the phone there? We could hear his cockney a mile off. Guy called Shanger, said Strike. I've told you about him. My mum scraped him off the street one night when he'd been stabbed. He adopted us. Strike sipped his pint, wondering how Polworth and Shanker would get on in the unlikely event of them ever meeting. He fancied they might end up punching each other. They seemed to strike like pieces from entirely different jigsaw puzzles. No point of connection. At the mention of stabbing, Polworth had glanced at Jack, but lowering his pint, Strike said, Don't worry about him. He wants to be a red cap, like me and Ted. Jack beamed some more. He was having a great time. Can I try some of that beer? he asked his uncle. Don't push it, said Strike. Look at this, said Polworth, pointing at a page in the newspaper he'd picked up. Westminster trying to bully the Scots, the bast... Strike cleared his throat. Jack giggled. Sorry, said Polworth. But come on, telling them they can't keep the pound if they vote for independence? Course they'll keep the pound. It's in everyone's interests. 
He talked on for the next ten minutes about small nationalism, the obvious arguments for both Scottish and Cornish independence, and the idiocy of those who opposed them, until Jack looked glazed, and Strike, as a last resort, dragged the conversation back to football. Arsenal, as he'd foreseen, had lost to defending champions Bayern Munich, and he didn't doubt the second leg would see them knocked out. He and Ted had watched the game together and done a good job of pretending they cared about the result. Strike permitted Polworth to pass censorious comment on the foul that had seen Chesney sent off, and politics was mercifully dropped. Strike thought about Polworth later that night, as he lay in the dark on the horsehair sofa again, unable to sleep. His tiredness now had a feverishness about it, exacerbated by the aching of his body, the perpetual strain of being here, in this overcrowded house, waiting for the tiny body upstairs to give up. In this near fever state, a jumble of ideas circulated in Strike's mind. He thought of categories and boundaries, of those we want to create and enforce, and those we seek to escape or destroy. He remembered the fanatic glint in Polworth's eye as he argued for a harder boundary between his country and the rest of England. He fell asleep thinking about the spurious groupings of astrology and dreamed of Leda laying out her tarot cards in the Norfolk Commune of long ago. Strike was woken at five by his own aching body. Knowing that Ted would be awake soon, he got up and dressed, ready to take over the bedside vigil while his uncle ate breakfast. Sure enough, hearing Strike's footstep on the upstairs landing, Ted emerged from the bedroom in his dressing gown. Just made you tea, whispered Strike. It's in the pot in the kitchen. I'll sit with her for a bit. You're a good lad, whispered Ted, clapping Strike on the arm. She's asleep now, but I had a little chat with her at four. Most she said for days. The talk with his wife seemed to have cheered him. He set off downstairs for his tea, and Strike let himself quietly into the familiar room, taking up his position on the hard-backed chair beside Joan. The wallpaper hadn't been changed, so far as Strike knew, since Ted and Joan had moved into the house, their only home since he'd left the army, in the town where both had grown up. Ted and Joan seemed not to notice that the house had grown shabby over the decades. For all that Joan was meticulous about cleanliness, she'd equipped and decorated the house once, and seemed never to have seen any need to do so again. The paper was decorated with small bunches of purple flowers, and Strike could remember tracing geometric shapes between them with his forefinger as a small child. When he climbed into bed with Ted and Joan early in the morning, when both were still sleepy and he wanted breakfast and a trip to the beach. Twenty minutes after he'd sat down, Joan opened her eyes and looked at Strike so blankly that he thought she didn't know him. It's me, Joan, he said quietly, moving his chair a little closer to her bed and switching on the lamp with its fringed shade. Coram, Ted's having breakfast. Joan smiled. Her hand was a tiny claw now. The fingers twitched. Strike took it into his own. She said something he couldn't hear, and he lowered his large head to her face. What did you say? You're good man. Oh, I don't know about that, muttered Strike. He held her hand in a light clasp, scared of putting pressure on it. The Arcus Senilus outlining the irises of her pale eyes made the blue seem more faded than ever. He thought of all the times he could have visited and hadn't, all those missed opportunities to call, all those times he'd forgotten her birthday. Help him, people. She peered up at him and then, making a supreme effort, she whispered, I'm proud of you. He wanted to speak, but something was blocking his throat. After a few seconds, he saw her eyelids drooping. I love you, Joe. The words came out so hoarsely, they were almost inaudible. But he thought she smiled as she sank back into a sleep from which she was never to wake.
Chapter 45 Of ancient time there was a springing well, from which fast trickled forth a silver flood, full of great virtues, and for medicine good. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Robin was still at the office when Strike called that evening with the news that Joan had died. I'm sorry about this, but I think I'm going to have to stay down here until we get this funeral sorted, said Strike. There is a lot to do, and Ted's in pieces. He just shared Joan's plans for her funeral with Ted and Lucy, thereby reducing both of them to sobs at the kitchen table. Ted's tears were for the poignancy of his wife making arrangements for his own comfort and relief, as she'd done for the fifty years of their marriage, and for the news that she'd wanted, at the end, to enter the sea and wait for him there. In Lucy's case, the sobs were for the lost possibility of a grave she'd hoped to visit and tend. Lucy filled her days with voluntary obligations. They gave purpose and form to a life she was determined would never be like her flighty biological mother's. No problem, Robin reassured him. We're coping fine. You sure? Completely sure. There's a backlog at the crematorium because of the floods, said Strike. Funerals penciled in for March the 3rd. This was the day Robin was planning to spend in Leamington Spa, so she could attend the opening of Paul Satchwell's exhibition. She didn't tell Strike this. She could tell that he had limited mental capacity right now for anything other than Joan and his life in Cornwall. Don't worry, she repeated. I'm so sorry, Cormoran, she added. Thanks, said Strike. I'd forgotten what it's like, planning a funeral. I've already had to referee one argument. After he shared Joan's plans for her send-off, and Lucy and Ted had mopped up their tears, Ted had suggested they ask mourners for donations to the Macmillan Cancer Support in lieu of flowers. But Lucy says Joan would have wanted flowers, Strike told Robin. I've suggested we say either. Ted says that'll mean people do both and they can't afford it, but fuck it. Lucy's right. Joan would want flowers, and as many as possible. That's how she always judged other people's funerals. After they'd bidden each other goodbye, Robin sat for a while at the partner's desk, wondering whether it would be appropriate for the agency to send flowers to Strike's aunt's funeral. She'd never met Joan. She worried that it would seem odd or intrusive to send condolences. She remembered how, when she'd offered to pick Strike up from Joan's house in St. Moore's the previous summer, he'd quickly cut her off, erecting as ever a firm boundary between Robin and his personal life. Yawning, Robin shut down the computer, closed the completed file on postcard, which she'd been updating, got to her feet, and went to get her coat. At the outer door she stopped, her reflection blank-faced in the dark glass. Then, as though responding to an unheard command, she returned to the inner office, switched the computer back on, and before she could second-guess herself, ordered a sheaf of dark pink roses to be delivered to St. Moore's Church on March the 3rd, with the message, with deepest sympathy from Robin, Sam, Andy, Saul, and Pat. Robin spent the rest of the month working without respite. She conducted a final meeting with the persecuted weatherman and his wife, in which she revealed Postcard's identity, gave them Postcard's real name and address, and took their final payment. She then had Pat contact their waiting list client, the commodities broker, who suspected her husband of sleeping with their nanny, and next day welcomed the woman to the office to take down her details and receive a down payment. The commodities broker didn't bother to hide her disappointment that she was meeting Robin instead of Strike. She was a thin, colourless blonde of forty-two, whose over-highlighted hair had the texture close up of fine wire. Robin found her unlikable until the end of the interview, when she talked about her husband, whose business had gone bankrupt and who now worked from home, giving him many long hours alone with the nanny. Fourteen years, said the broker. Fourteen years, three kids, and now... She hid her eyes behind her shaking hands, and Robin, who'd been with Matthew since she was at school, felt, in spite of the woman's brittle facade, an unexpected glow of sympathy. 
After the new client had left, Robin called Morris into the office and gave him the job of the first day's surveillance of the nanny. Okie dokie, he said. Hey, what do you say we call the client R.B.? What's that stand for? Robin asked. Rich bitch, said Morris, grinning. She's loaded. No, said Robin, unsmiling. Whoops, said Morris, eyebrows raised. Feminist alert? Something like that. OK, how about we'll call her Mrs Smith, after the street they live on, said Robin coldly. Over the next few days, Robin took her turn tailing the nanny, a glossy-haired brunette who somewhat reminded her of Strike's ex-girlfriend, Lorelei. The commodities broker's children certainly seemed to adore their nanny, and so, Robin feared, did their father. While he didn't once touch the nanny in any amorous way, he showed every sign of a man completely smitten, mirroring her body language, laughing excessively at her jokes, and hurrying to open doors and gates for her. A couple of nights later, Robin dozed off at the wheel for a few seconds while driving towards Eleanor Dean's house in Stoke Newington. Jerking awake, she immediately turned on the radio and opened the window so that her eyes streamed with a cold, sooty night air. But the incident scared her. Over the next few days, she increased her caffeine consumption in an effort to keep awake. This made her slightly jittery, and she found it hard to sleep, even on the rare occasions the chance presented itself. Robin had always been as careful with the firm's money as Strike himself, treating every penny spent as though it were to be deducted from her own take-home pay. The habit of parsimony had stayed with her, even though the agency's survival no longer depended on extracting money from clients before the final demands came in. Robin was well aware that Strike took very little money out of the business for his own needs, preferring to plough profits back into the agency. He continued to live a Spartan existence in the two and a half rooms over the office, and there were months when she, the salaried partner, took home more pay than the senior partner and founder of the firm. All of this added to her feeling of guilt at booking herself into a premier inn in Leamington Spa on the Sunday night before Satchwell's art exhibition. The town was only a two-hour drive away. Robin knew she could have got up early on Monday morning instead of sleeping over in the town. However, she was so exhausted, she feared dozing off at the wheel again. She justified the hotel room to herself by leaving twenty-four hours ahead of the exhibition's opening, thus giving herself time to take a look at the church where Margot had allegedly been sighted a week after her disappearance. She also packed photocopies of all the pages of Talbot's horoscope notes that mentioned Paul Satchwell, with the intention of studying them in the quiet of her hotel room. To these, she added a second-hand copy of Evangeline Adams' Your Place in the Sun, a pack of unopened tarot cards, and a copy of The Book of Thoth. She hadn't told Strike she bought any of these items, and didn't intend claiming expenses for them. Much as she loved London, Yorkshire-born Robin sometimes pined for trees, moors, and hills. Her drive up the nondescript M40 passed hamlets and villages with archaic names like Middleton Cheney, Temple Herdwick and Bishop's Itchington gave her glimpses of flat green fields. The cool, damp day bore a welcome whiff of spring in the air, and in the breaks between scudding white clouds, hard, bright sunshine filled the old Land Rover with a light that made a pale grey ghost of Robin's reflection in the dusty window beside her. She really needed to clean the car. In fact, there were sundry small personal chores piling up while she worked non-stop for the agency, such as ringing her mother, whose calls she'd been avoiding, and her lawyer, who'd left a message about the upcoming mediation, not to mention plucking her eyebrows, buying herself a new pair of flat shoes, and sorting out a bank transfer to Max, covering her half of the council tax. As the hedgerows flashed by, Robin consciously turned her thoughts away from these depressing mundanities, to Paul Satchwell. She doubted she'd find him in Leamington Spa, being unable to imagine why the seventy-five-year-old would want to leave his home on Kos merely to visit the provincial art gallery. Satchwell had probably sent his paintings over from Greece, or else given permission for them to be exhibited. 
Why would he leave what Robin imagined as a dazzling white-walled villa, an artist's studio, set among olive groves? Her plan was to pretend an interest in buying or commissioning one of his paintings, so as to get his home address. For a moment or two, she indulged herself in a little fantasy of flying out to Greece with Strike to interrogate the old artist. She imagined the oven blast of heat that would hit them on leaving the plane in Athens, and saw herself in a dress and sandals heading up a dusty track to Satchwell's front door. But when her imagination showed her Strike in shorts, with a metal rod of his prosthetic leg on display, she felt suddenly embarrassed by her own imaginings, and closed the little fantasy down before it took her to the beach or the hotel. On the outskirts of Leamington Spa, Robin followed the sign to All Saints Church, which she knew from her research was the only possible candidate for the place where Charlie Ramage had seen Margot. Janice had mentioned a big church. All Saints was a tourist attraction due to its size. None of the other churches in Leamington Spa had graveyards attached to them. Moreover, All Saints was situated directly on the route of anyone travelling north from London. Although Robin found it hard to understand why Margot would have been browsing headstones in Leamington Spa, while her husband begged for information of her whereabouts in the national press, and her Leamington-born lover remained in London, she had a strange feeling that seeing the church for herself would give her a better idea as to whether Margot had ever been there. The missing doctor was becoming very real to Robin. She managed to secure a parking space in Priory Terrace, right beside the church, and set off on foot around the perimeter, marvelling at the sheer scale of the place. It was a staggering size for a relatively small town. In fact, it looked more like a cathedral with its long arched windows. Turning right into Church Street, she noted the further coincidence of the street name being so similar to Margot's home address. On the right, a low wall topped with railings provided an ideal spot for a motorbike rider to park and enjoy a cup of tea from his thermos looking at the graveyard. Except that there was no graveyard. Robin came to an abrupt standstill. She could see only two tombs, raised stone caskets whose inscriptions had been eroded. Otherwise, there was simply a wide stretch of grass intersected with two footpaths. Bomb fell on it! A cheery-looking mother was walking towards Robin, pushing a double pushchair containing sleeping boy twins. She'd correctly interpreted Robin's sudden halt. "'Yeah, in 1940,' said the woman, slowing down. "'Luftwaffe!' "'Wow! Awful!' said Robin, imagining the smashed earth, the broken tombstones, and perhaps fragments of coffin and bone. "'Yeah, but they missed them too,' said the woman pointing at the aged tomb standing in the shadow of a yew tree. One of the twin toddlers gave a little stretch in his sleep, and his eyelids flickered. With a comical grimace at Robin, the mother took off again at a brisk walk. Robin walked into the enclosed area that had once been a graveyard, looking around and wondering what to make of Ramage's story now. There hadn't been a graveyard here in 1974, when he claimed to have seen Margot browsing among tombstones. Or had an intact cemetery been assumed by Janice Beatty when she heard that Margot was looking at graves? Robin turned to look at the two surviving tombs. Certainly, if Margot had been examining these, she'd have been brought within feet of a motorcyclist parked beside the church. Robin placed her hands on the cold black bars that kept the curious from actually touching the old tombs and examined them. What could have drawn Margot to them? The inscriptions etched on the mossy stone were almost illegible. Robin tilted her head, trying to make them out. Was she seeing things? Did one of the words say Virgo? Or had she spent too much time dwelling on Talbot's horoscope notes? Yet the more she studied it, the more like Virgo the name looked. Robin associated that star sign with two people these days her estranged husband Matthew, and Dorothy Oakden, the widowed practice secretary at Margot's old place of work. Robin had become so adept at reading Talbot's horoscope notes that she routinely heard Dorothy in her head when looking at the glyph for Virgo. Now she took out her phone, looked up the tomb, 
and felt mildly reassured to discover that she wasn't seeing things. This was the last resting place of one James Virgo Dunn. But why should it have been of interest to Margot? Robin scrolled down a genealogy page for the Virgos and the Duns and learned that the man whose bones now lay in dust a few feet from her had been born in Jamaica, where he'd been the owner of forty-six slaves. No need to feel sorry for you, then, Robin muttered, returning her phone to her pocket, and she walked on around the perimeter to the front of the church until she reached the great oak and iron double front doors. As she headed up the stone steps towards them, she heard the low hum of a hymn. Of course, it was Sunday morning. After a moment's hesitation, Robin opened the door as quietly as possible and peered inside. An immense, sombre space was revealed. Chilly parabolas of grey stone, a hundred feet of cold air between congregation and ceiling. Doubtless a church of this gigantic size had been deemed necessary back in Regency times, when people had flocked to the spa town to drink its waters, but the modern congregation didn't come close to filling it. A black-robed verger looked around at her. Robin smiled apologetically, quietly closed the door, and returned to the pavement, where a large modern steel sculpture, part squiggle, part coil, was evidently supposed to represent the medicinal spring around which the town had been built. A pub nearby was just opening its doors, and Robin fancied a coffee, so she crossed the road and entered the old library. The interior was large, but hardly less gloomy than the church, the decor mostly shades of brown. Robin bought herself a coffee, settled herself in a tucked-away corner where she couldn't be observed, and sank into abstraction. Her glimpse of the church's interior had told her nothing. Margot had been an atheist, but churches were some of the few places a person could sit and think, undisturbed. Might Margot have been drawn to all saints out of that unfocused, inchoate need that had once driven Robin herself into an unknown graveyard, there to sit on a wooden bench and contemplate the parlous state of her marriage? Robin set down her coffee cup, opened the messenger bag she'd brought with her, and took out the wad of photocopies of those pages of Talbot's notebook that mentioned Paul Satchwell. Smoothing them flat, she glanced up casually at the two men who just sat down at a nearby table. The one with his back to her was tall and broad, with dark curly hair, and before she could remind herself that he couldn't be strike because her partner was in St. Moore's, a thrill of excitement and happiness passed through her. The stranger seemed to have felt Robin looking at him, because he turned before she could avert her eyes. She caught a glimpse of eyes as blue as Morris's, a weak chin, and a short neck, before she bowed her head to examine the horoscope notes, feeling herself turn red, and suddenly unable to take in the mass of drawings and symbols in front of her. Waves of shame were crashing over her, entirely disproportionate to catching a stranger's eye. In the pit of her stomach, the last sparks of the excitement she'd felt on thinking she was looking at strike glimmered and died. It was a momentary error of perception, she told herself. There's absolutely nothing to worry about. Calm down. But instead of reading the notes, Robin put her face in her hands. In this strange bar, her resistance lowered by exhaustion, Robin knew she'd been avoiding the question of what she really felt about strike for the past year. Busy trying to disentangle herself from Matthew, familiarising herself with a new flat and a new flatmate, managing and deflecting her parents' anxiety and judgement, Fending off Morris's constant badgering, dodging Ilsa's infuriating determination to matchmake, and working twice as hard as ever before, it had been easy not to think about anything else, even a question as fraught as what she really felt for Cormoran Strike. Now, in the corner of this dingy brown pub, with nothing else to distract her, Robin found herself thinking back to those honeymoon nights spent pacing the fine white sand after Matthew had gone to bed when Robin had interrogated herself about whether she was in love with a man who'd then been her boss, not her partner. She'd worn a deep channel on the beach as she walked up and down in the dark, finally deciding that the answer was no, 
that what she felt was a mixture of friendship, admiration and gratitude for the opportunity he'd given her to embark on a once-dreamed-of career which she thought was close to her forever. She liked her partner. She admired him. She was grateful to him. That was it. That was all. Except. She remembered how much pleasure it had given her to see him sitting in Notes Café after a week's absence, and how happy she was, no matter the circumstances, to see Strike's name light up her phone. Almost scared now, she forced herself to think about how bloody aggravating Strike could be, grumpy, taciturn and ungrateful, and nowhere near as handsome with his broken nose and hair he himself described as pube-like as Matthew, or even Morris. But he was her best friend. This admission, held at bay for so long, caused an almost painful twist in Robin's heart, not least because she knew it would be impossible ever to tell Strike so. She could just imagine him lumbering away from her like a startled bison at such a naked statement of affection, redoubling the barriers he liked to erect if ever they got too close to each other. Nevertheless, there was a kind of relief in admitting the painful truth. She cared deeply for her partner. She trusted him on the big things, to do the right thing for the right reasons. She admired his brains and appreciated his doggedness, not to mention the self-discipline, all the more admirable, because many whole-bodied men had never mastered it. She was often astonished by his almost total lack of self-pity. She loved the drive for justice that she shared, that unbreakable determination to settle and to solve. And there was something more, something highly unusual. Strike had never once made her feel physically uncomfortable. Two of them in the office, for a long time the only workers at the agency, and while Robin was a tall woman, he was far bigger, and he'd never made her feel it, as so many men did, not even in an attempt to intimidate, but because they enjoy the parade as a peacock spreads its tail. Matthew hadn't been able to get past the idea of them together all the time, in a small office space, hadn't been able to believe that Strike wasn't capitalising on the situation to make advances, however subtle. But Robin, who'd forever be hypersensitive to the uninvited touch, the sidelong lecherous glance, the invasion of personal space, the testing of conventional limits, had never once experienced with Strike that shrinking sensation within her own skin evoked by attempts to push a relationship into a different space. A deep reserve lay over Strike's private life, and while that sometimes frustrated her, had he, or had he not, called Charlotte Campbell back, his love of privacy extended to a respect for other people's boundaries. Never had there been an ostensibly helpful but unnecessary touch, no hand on the small of the back, no grasping of the arm, no look that made her skin prickle or made her want to cover herself. The legacy of those violent encounters with men that had left her scarred in more ways than the visible. In truth, why not admit everything to herself now, when she was so tired, her defences lowered? She was aware of only two moments in four years where she'd been sure that Strike had seen her as a desirable woman, not as a friend or an apprentice or a younger sister. The first had been when she'd modelled that green Cavalli dress for him, in the course of their first investigation together, when he'd looked away from her as a man would if shunning too bright light. She'd been embarrassed by her own behaviour afterwards. She hadn't meant to make him think she was trying to be seductive or provocative. All she'd been trying to do was get information out of the sales assistant. But when he'd subsequently given her the green dress, thinking he'd never see her again, she wondered whether part of the message Strike had been trying to convey was that he didn't disavow that look, that she had, indeed, looked wonderful in the dress, and this suspicion hadn't made her feel uncomfortable, but happy and flattered. The second moment, far more painful to remember, had been when she'd stood at the top of the stairs at her wedding venue, strike below her, and he turned when she called his name and looked up at her, the new bride. He'd been injured and exhausted, and again she'd seen a flicker of something in his face that wasn't mere friendship, and they'd hugged, and she'd felt best not to think about it, best not to dwell on that hug, 
on how like home it had felt, on how a kind of insanity had gripped her at that moment, that she'd imagined him saying, Come with me, and known she'd have gone if he had. Robin swept the horoscope papers off the pub table, stuffed them back into her messenger bag, and went outside, leaving half her coffee undrunk. Trying to walk off her memories, she crossed a small stone bridge spanning the slow-flowing River Leem, which was spotted with clumps of duckweed, and passed the colonnade of the Royal Pump Rooms, where Satchwell's exhibition would open the following day. Striding briskly, her hands in her pockets, Robin tried to focus on the parade, where shop fronts disfigured what had once been a sweeping white Regency terrace. But Leamington Spa did nothing to raise her spirits. On the contrary, it reminded her too much of another spa town, Bath, where Matthew had gone to university. For Robin, long symmetrical curves of Regency buildings, with their plain classical facades, would forever conjure once fond memories, disfigured by later discoveries. Visions of herself and Matthew strolling hand in hand, overlain by the knowledge that, even then, he'd been sleeping with Sarah. I'll bugger everything, Robin muttered blinking tears out of her eyes. She turned abruptly and headed all the way back to the Land Rover. Having parked the car closer to the hotel, she made a detour into the nearby co-op to buy a small stash of food, then checked in at the self-service machine in her Premier Inn and headed upstairs to her single room. It was small, bare, but perfectly clean and comfortable, and overlooked a spectacularly ugly town hall of red and white brick which was over-embellished with scrolls, pediments, and lions. A couple of sandwiches, a chocolate eclair, a can of Diet Coke and an apple made Robin feel better. As the sun slowly sank behind the buildings on the parade, she slipped off her shoes and reached into her bag for the photocopied pages of Talbot's notebook and her pack of Thoth tarot cards which Alistair Crowley had devised and in which Bill Talbot had sought the solution to Margot's disappearance. Sliding the pack out of the box into her hand, she shuffled through the cards, examining the images. Just as she'd suspected, Talbot had copied many motifs into his notebook, presumably from those cards which had come up during his frequent attempts to solve the case by consulting the tarot. Robin now flattened a photocopy of what she thought of as the horns page, on which Talbot had dwelled on the three horn signs of the zodiac, Capricorn, Aries, and Taurus. This page came in the last quarter of the notebook, in which quotations from Alistair Crowley, astrological symbols, and strange drawings appeared far more often than concrete facts. Here on the horns page was evidence of Talbot's renewed interest in Satchwell, whom he first ruled out on the basis that he was an Aries rather than a Capricorn. Talbot had evidently calculated Satchwell's whole birth horoscope and taken the trouble to note various aspects which he'd noticed were same as AC, same as AC, and don't forget LS connection. To add to the confusion, the mysterious Schmidt kept correcting signs, although he'd allowed Satchwell to keep his original sign of Aries. And then an odd idea came to Robin. The notion of a fourteen-sign zodiac was clearly ludicrous. But why was it more ludicrous than a twelve-sign zodiac? asked a voice in her head which sounded remarkably like strikes. But certainly, if you were going to squeeze in an extra two signs, dates would have to shift, wouldn't they? She picked up her mobile and googled 14 sign Zodiac Schmidt. Oh, my God, said Robin aloud, into her still hotel room. Before she could fully process what she'd read, the mobile in her hand rang. It was strike. Hi, said Robin hastily turning him to speakerphone so she could continue reading what she'd just found. How are you? Knackered, said Strike, who sounded it. What's happened? What do you mean? asked Robin, her eyes rapidly scanning lines of text. You sound like you do when you found something out, Robin laughed. Oh, <laughs> OK, but you won't believe this. But I've just found Schmidt. You what? Schmidt, first name Stephen, he's a real person. He wrote a book in 1970 called Astrology 14, proposing the inclusion of two extra signs in the Zodiac, a Fiacus, 
the serpent bearer, and Cetus, the whale. There was a brief silence, then Strike muttered, How the hell did I miss that? Remember that statue of the man holding the serpent at Margot's old house, said Robin, falling back on her pillows among the scattered tarot cards. Asclepius, said Strike. Ophiacus was the Roman form, god of healing. Well, this explains all the changing dates, doesn't it? said Robin. And why poor Talbot got so confused. He was trying to put everyone into Schmidt's adjusted dates, but they didn't seem to fit, and all the other astrologers he was consulting were still using the twelve sign system, so... Yeah, said Strike, talking over her. That'd make a crazy man crazier, all right. His tone said, this is interesting, but not important. Robin moved the three of discs from beneath her and examined it absent-mindedly. Robin was now so well versed in astrological symbols that she didn't need to look at the glyphs to know that it also represented Mars in Capricorn. How are things with you? she asked. Well, the church isn't going to hold everyone who's coming tomorrow, which Joan would have been thrilled about. I just wanted to let you know I'll be heading back up the road again on Tuesday. Are you sure you don't need to stay longer? The neighbours are all promising they're going to look after Ted. Lucy is trying to get him to come up to London for a bit afterwards. Any other news your end? Uh, let's see. I wrapped up postcard, said Robin. I think our weatherman was quite disappointed when he saw who his stalker was. His wife cheered up no end, though. Strike gave a grunt of laughter. So we've taken on the commodities broker, Robin continued. We haven't got pictures of anything incriminating between the husband and nanny yet, but I don't think it's going to be long. You're owed a long stretch off for all this, Robin, said Strike gruffly. I can't thank you enough. Don't be silly, she said. They hung up shortly afterwards. Robin's room seemed to have become suddenly much darker. The sun had gone down. In silhouette, the town hall resembled a monstrous Gothic palace. She turned on her bedside lamp and looked around at the bed strewn with astrological notes and tarot cards. Seen in the light of Strike's lack of enthusiasm, Talbot's doodles looked like the determinedly weird drawings on the back of a teenager's jotter, leading nowhere, done purely for the love of strangeness. Yawning, she refolded the photocopied notes and put them back in her bag, went for a shower, returned in her pyjamas to the bed, and gathered up the tarot cards, putting them in order as she did so, to make sure none of them were missing. She didn't particularly want the cleaner to think of her as the kind of person who left tarot cards strewn in her wake. On the point of replacing the deck in its box, Robin suddenly sat down on the bed and begun to shuffle it instead. She was too tired to attempt the fifteen-card layout advocated in the little booklet that accompanied the tarot, but she knew from her exhaustive examination of his notes that Talbot had sometimes tried to see his way through the investigation by laying out just three cards the first representing the nature of the problem, the second the cause, and the third the solution. After a minute's shuffling, Robin turned over the top card and laid it down in the pool of light cast by her bedside lamp. The Prince of Cups. A naked bluish-green man rode an eagle, which was diving towards water. He held a goblet containing a snake in one hand and a lotus flower in the other. Robin pulled the Book of Thoth out of her bag and looked up the meaning. The moral characteristics of the person pictured in this card are subtlety, secret violence, and craft. He is intensely secret, an artist in all his ways. She thought immediately of Dennis Creed, a master of murder in his way. She turned over the next card, the Four of Cups, or Luxury. Another lotus was pouring water over four more goblets, golden this time. Robin turned to the book. The card refers to the moon in Cancer, which is her own house. But Cancer itself is so placed that this implies a certain weakness, an abandonment to desire. Was the tarot criticizing of a soft living? Robin glanced around her little box of a room, then turned over the last card. More cups and yet more lotuses and two entwined fish pouring out water into two more golden chalices which stood on a green lake. Love. The card also refers to Venus in Cancer. 
It shows the harmony of the male and the female, interpreted in the largest sense. It is perfect and placid harmony. Robin inspected the card for a few more seconds before laying it down beside the other two. They were all cups. As she knew from her study of the Thoth Tarot, cups meant water. Well, here she was, in a spa town. Robin shook her head, though nobody was there to see her do it, returned the tarot cards to their box, climbed into bed, set her alarm, and turned out the light. Chapter 46 Whereas that pagan proud himself did rest, in secret shadow by a fountain side, even he it was that erst would have suppressed fair Una. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Robin's night was punctuated with sudden wakings from a succession of anxious dreams. That she'd fallen asleep at the wheel again, or had overslept, and arrived at the gallery to find Satchwell's exhibition gone. When the alarm on her mobile rang at 7am, she forced herself immediately out of bed, showered, dressed, and glad to leave the impersonal bedroom, headed downstairs with her packed holdall to eat muesli and drink coffee in the dining room, which was painted an oppressive sludge green. The day outside was fresh but overcast, a cold silver sun trying to penetrate the cloud. Having returned her holdall to the park Land Rover, she headed on foot towards the Royal Pump Rooms, which housed the gallery where Satchwell's exhibition was about to open. To her left lay the ornamental Jefferson Gardens and a fountain of pinkish stone that might have been the model for one of Crowley's tarot cards. Four scallop pattern basins sat at the top. A certain weakness, an abandonment to desire. You get in like Talbot, Robin told herself crossly. Speeding up, she arrived at the pump rooms with time to spare. The building had just been opened. A young woman in black was walking away from the glass doors, holding a bunch of keys. Robin entered, to find little trace of the Regency pump rooms left inside. The floor was covered in modern grey tiles, the ceiling supported by metal columns. A café took up one wing of the open-plan space, a shop another. The gallery, Robin saw, lay across opposite, through more glass doors. It comprised one long room, brick-walled and wooden-floored, which had been temporarily given over to an exhibition of local artists. There were only three people inside, a stocky, grey-bobbed woman in an Alice band, a small man with a hangdog air, whom Robin suspected was her husband, and another young woman in black, who she assumed worked there. The grey-haired woman's voice was echoing around the room, as though it was a gymnasium. I told Shona that Long Itchington needs an accent light. You can barely see it. This corner's so dark. Robin walked slowly around, looking at canvases and sketches. Five local artists had been given space for the temporary exhibition, but she identified Paul Satchwell's work without difficulty. It had been given a prominent position and stood out boldly among the studies of local landmarks, portraits of pallid Britain standing at bus stops and still lifes. Naked figures twisted and cavorted in scenes from Greek mythology. Persephone struggled in the arms of Hades as he carried her down into the underworld. Andromeda strained against chains, binding her to rock as a dragonish creature rose from the waves to devour her. Leda lay supine in bulrushes as Zeus, in the form of a swan, impregnated her. Two lines of Joni Mitchell floated back to Robin as she looked at the paintings. When I first saw your gallery, I liked the ones of ladies. Except that Robin wasn't sure she liked the paintings. The female figures were all black-haired, olive-skinned, heavy-breasted, and partially or entirely naked. The paintings were accomplished, but Robin found them slightly lascivious. Each of the women wore a similar expression of vacant abandon, and Satchwell seemed to have a definite preference for those myths that featured bondage, rape, or abduction. Striking, aren't they? said the meek-faced husband of the angry painter of Long Itchington, appearing at Robin's side to contemplate a picture of a totally naked Io, whose hair streamed behind her and whose breasts gleamed with sweat as she fled a bull with a gargantuan erection. Hmm, said Robin. 
I was wondering whether he was going to come to the exhibition. Paul Satchwell, I mean. I think he said he's going to pop back in, said the man. Back? You mean he's here, in England? Well, yes, said the man, looking somewhat surprised. He was here yesterday, anyway. Came to see them hung. Visiting family, I think he said, said the young woman in black, who seemed glad of a reason to talk to somebody other than the fuming artist in the hairband. You haven't got contact details for him, have you? asked Robin. Maybe the address of where he's staying. No, said the young woman, now looking intrigued. Evidently local artists didn't usually engender this much excitement. You can leave your name and address, though, if you like, and I'll tell him you want to speak to him if he drops by. So Robin accompanied the young woman back to the reception area, where she scribbled her name and phone number onto a piece of paper, and then, her heart still beating fast in excitement, went to the café, bought herself a cappuccino, and positioned herself beside a long window looking out onto the pump-room gardens, where she had a good view of people entering the building. Should she book back into the Premier Inn and wait here in Leamington Spa until Satchwell showed himself? Would Strike think it worth neglecting their other cases to remain here in the hope of Satchwell turning up? It was Joan's funeral today. She couldn't burden him with a question. She wondered what her partner was doing now, perhaps already dressing for the service. Robin had only ever attended two funerals. Her maternal grandfather had died just before she dropped out of university. She'd gone home for the funeral, and never gone back. She remembered very little of the occasion. It had taken everything she'd had to preserve a fragile facade of well-being, and she remembered the strange sense of disembodiment that underlay the eggshell brittleness with which she'd met the half-scared inquiries of family members who knew what had happened to her. She remembered, too, Matthew's hand around hers. He hadn't once dropped it, skipping lectures and an important rugby game to come and be with her. The only other funeral she'd attended had been four years previously, when she and Strike had attended the cremation of a murdered girl in the course of their first murder investigation, standing together at the back of the sparsely populated, impersonal crematorium. That had been before Strike had agreed to take her on permanently, when she'd been nothing but a temp whom Strike had allowed to inveigle her way into his investigation. Thinking back to Rochelle Onifade's funeral, Robin realised that even then the ties binding her to Matthew had been loosening. Robin hadn't yet realised it, but she'd found something she wanted more than she'd wanted to be Matthew's wife. Her coffee finished, Robin made a quick trip to the bathroom, then returned to the gallery in the hope that Satchwell might have entered it while she wasn't watching, but there was no sign of him. A few people had drifted in to wander around the temporary exhibition. Satchwell's paintings were attracting the most interest. Having walked the room once more, Robin pretended an interest in an old water fountain in the corner. Covered in swags and lion's heads with gaping mouths, it had once dispensed the health-giving spa waters. Beyond the font lay another room, which presented a total contrast to the clean, modern space behind her. It was octagonal and made of brick, with a very high ceiling and windows of Bristol blue glass. Robin stepped inside. It was, or had once been, a Turkish hammam, or steam room, and had the appearance of a small temple. At the highest point of the vaulted ceiling was a cupola, decorated with an eight-pointed star in glass, with a lantern hanging from it. Nice to see a bit of pagan influence in it. The voice was a combination of self-conscious cockney, overlain with the merest whiff of a Greek accent. Robin spun around, and there, planted firmly in the middle of the hammam, in jeans and an old denim shirt, was an elderly man with his left eye covered in a surgical dressing, which stood out, stark white against skin as brown as old terracotta. His straggly white hair fell to his stooping shoulders, white chest hair grew in the space left by his undone buttons. A silver chain hung around his crepe-skin throat, and silver and turquoise rings decorated his fingers. "'You the young lady you wanted to talk to me?' asked Paul Satchwell, revealing yellow-brown teeth as he smiled. "'Yes,' said Robin. "'I am. 
Robin Ellicott, she added, holding out her hand. His uncovered eyes swept Robin's face and figure with unconcealed appreciation. He held her hand a little too long after shaking it, but Robin continued to smile as she withdrew it and delved in her handbag for a card, which she gave him. Private detective, said Satchwell, his smile fading a little as he read the card, one-eyed. The hell's all this? Robin explained. Margot, said Satchwell, looking shocked. Christ almighty, that's what, forty years ago? Nearly, said Robin, moving aside to let some tourists claim her spot in the middle of the hammam and read its history off the sign on the wall. I've come up from London in hopes of talking to you about her. It'd mean a lot to the family if you could tell me whatever you remember. Hey, Larray, what do you expect me to remember after all this time? said Satchwell. But Robin was confident he was going to accept. She discovered that people generally wanted to know what you already knew, why you'd come to find them, whether they had any reason to worry. And sometimes they wanted to talk because they were lonely or felt neglected, and it was flattering to have somebody hang on your words. And sometimes, as now, elderly as he was, the single eye, which was a cold pale blue, swept her body and back to her face. They wanted to spend more time with a young woman they found attractive. All right, then, said Satchwell slowly. I don't know what I can tell you, but I'm hungry. Let me take you to lunch. That'll be great, but I'll be taking you, said Robin, smiling. You're doing me the favour. Chapter 47 The sacred ox that careless stands, with gilden horns and flowery girlands crowned, all suddenly with mortal stroke astound, doth grovelling fall. The martial maid stayed not him to lament, but forward rode, and kept her ready way. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Satchwell bade the attendant in the art gallery farewell by clasping her hands in a double handshake and assuring her he'd look in later in the week. He even took fulsome leave of the disgruntled painter of Long Itchington, who scowled after him as he left. Provincial galleries, he said, chuckling, as he and Robin headed out of the pump rooms. Funny seeing my stuff next to that old bat's postcard pictures, though, wasn't it? and a bit of a kick to be exhibited where you were born. I haven't been back here in Christ. Must be fifty odd years. You got a car? Good. We'll get out of here. Go through to Warwick. It's just up the road. Satchwell kept up a steady stream of talk as they walked towards the Land Rover. Never liked Leamington. With only one eye at his service, he had to turn his head in exaggerated fashion to look around. Too genteel for the likes of me. Robin learned that he'd lived in the spa town only until he was six, at which point he and his single mother had moved to Warwick. He had a younger half-sister, the result of his mother's second marriage, with whom he was currently staying, and had decided to have his cataract removed while in England. Still a British citizen, I'm entitled. So when they asked me, he said with a grand wave backwards at the royal pump rooms, if I'd contribute some paintings, I thought, why not? Brought them over with me. They're wonderful, said Robin insincerely. Have you got just the one sister? She had no aim other than making polite conversation, but out of the corner of her eye she saw Satchwell's head turn so that his unbandaged eye could look at her. No, he said, after a moment or two. It was... I had an older sister too, but... She died when we were kids. Oh, I'm sorry, said Robin. One of those things, said Satchwell. Severely disabled. Had fits and stuff. She was older than me. I can't remember much about it. Hit my mum hard, obviously. I can imagine, said Robin. They had reached the Land Rover. Robin, who'd already mentally calculated the risk to herself, should Satchwell prove to be dangerous, was confident that she'd be safe by daylight and given that she had control of the car. She unlocked the doors and climbed into the driver's seat, 
and Satchwell succeeded in hoisting himself into the passenger seat on his second attempt. "'Yeah, we moved fro to Warwick from here after Blanche died,' he said, buckling up his seatbelt. "'Just me and my mum. Not that Warwick's much better, but it's authentic. Authentic medieval buildings, you know.' Given that he was Midlands born and raised, Robin thought his Cockney accent must be a long-standing affectation. It came and went, mingled with an intonation that was slightly foreign after so many years in Greece. Whereas this place, the Victorians had their wicked way with it, he said. And as Robin reversed out of her parking space, he said, looking up at the moss-covered face of a stone Queen Victoria, There she is. Look, miserable old care, and laughed. State of that building, he added, as they passed the town hall. That's something me and Crowley had in common for sure. Born here, hated it here. Robin thought she must have misheard. You and Alistair Crowley. Crowley, she repeated, as they drove up the parade. The occult writer. Yeah, he was born here, said Satchwell. You don't see that in many of the guidebooks because they don't like it. Here, turn left. Go on, it's on our way. Minutes later, he directed her into Clarendon Square, where tall white terraced houses, though now subdivided into flats, retained a vestige of their old grandeur. That's it, where he was born, said Satchwell with satisfaction, pointing up at number thirty. No plaque or nothing. They don't like talking about him, the good people of Lemon and Spa. I had a bit of a crowley phase in me youth, said Satchwell as Robin looked up at the large square windows. You know, he tortured a cat to death when he was a boy, just to see whether it had nine lives. I didn't, said Robin, putting the car into reverse. Probably happened in there, said Satchwell, with morbid satisfaction. Same as A.C., same as A.C. Another moment of enlightenment had hit Robin. Talbot had gone looking for identical components between Satchwell's horoscope and Crowley's the self-proclaimed beast Baphomet, the wickedest man in the West, L.S. Connection. Of course, Lemington Spa. Why had Talbot decided, months into the investigation, that Satchwell deserved a full horoscope, the only one of the suspects to be so honoured? His alibi appeared watertight, after all. Had the return of suspicion been a symptom of Talbot's illness, triggered by the coincidence of Satchwell, and Crowley's place of birth? Or had he uncovered some unrecorded weakness in Satchwell's alibi? Satchwell continued to talk about his life in Greece, his painting, and about his disappointment in how old England was faring, and Robin made appropriate noises at regular intervals while mentally reviewing those features of Satchwell's horoscope that Talbot had found so intriguing. Mars in Capricorn, strong will, determined but prone to accidents. Moon in Pisces, neurosis, personality disorders, dishonesty. Leo rising, no sense of moderation. Resents demands on them. They reached Warwick within half an hour, and, as Satchwell had promised, found themselves in a town that could hardly have presented a greater contrast to the wide, sweeping, white-faced crescents of Leamington. An ancient stone arch reminded Robin of Clerkenwell. They passed timber and beam houses, cobbles, steep sloping streets, and narrow alleyways. We'll go to the Roebuck, said Satchwell, when Robin had parked in the market square. It's been there forever. Oldest pub in town. Wherever you like, said Robin, smiling, as she checked that she had a notebook in her handbag. They walked together through the heart of Warwick, Satchwell pointing out such landmarks as he deemed worth looking at. He was one of those men who felt a need to touch, tapping Robin unnecessarily upon the arm to draw her attention, grasping her elbow as they crossed the street, and generally assuming a proprietorial air over her as they wove their way towards Smith Street. "'Do you mind?' asked Satchwell, as they drew level with picturesque art supplies, and without waiting for an answer, he led her into the shop where, as he selected brushes and oils, he talked with airy self-importance of modern trends in art and the stupidity of critics. Oh, Margot, Robin thought. But then she imagined the Margot Bamber as she carried with her in her head, judging her, in turn, by Matthew, with his endless store of anecdotes of his own sporting achievements 
and his increasingly pompous talk of pay rises and bonuses, and felt humbled and apologetic. At last they made it into the Roebuck Inn, a low-beamed pub with a sign of a deer's head hanging outside, and secured a table for two towards the rear of the pub. Robin couldn't help but notice the coincidence. The wall behind Satchwell was dotted with horned animal heads, including a stuffed deer and bronze-coloured models of an antelope and a ram. Even the menus had silhouettes of antlered stag heads upon them. Robin asked the waitress for a Diet Coke, all the while trying to repress thoughts of the horned signs of the Zodiac. Would it be all right, she asked, smiling, when the waitress had departed for the bar, if I ask a few questions about Margot now? Yeah, of course, said Satchwell, with a smile that revealed his stained teeth again. But he immediately picked up the menu card and studied it. And do you mind if I take notes? Robin asked, pulling out her notebook. Go ahead, he said, still smiling, watching her over the top of his menu with his uncovered eye, which followed her movements as she opened the book and clicked out the nib of her pen. So I apologise if any of these questions— Are you sure you don't want a proper drink? asked Satchwell, who had ordered a beer. I ain't drinking on me own. Well, I'm driving, you see, said Robin. You could stay over. Not with me, don't worry, he said quickly, with a grin that on a man so elderly resembled a satyr's leer. I mean, go to an hotel, file expenses. I expect you're taking a good chunk of money from Margot's family for this, are you? Robin merely smiled and said, I need to get back to London. We're quite busy. It would be really useful to get some background on Margot, she continued. How did you meet? He told her the story she already knew about how he'd been taken to the Playboy Club by a client and seen there the leggy nineteen-year-old in her bunny ears and tail. And you stuck up a friendship. Well, said Satchwell, I don't know that I call it that. With his cold eye upon Robin, he said, We had a very strong sexual connection. She was a virgin when we met, you know. Robin kept smiling formally. He wasn't going to embarrass her. She was nineteen, I was twenty-five. Beautiful girl, he sighed. Wish I kept the pictures I took of her, but after she disappeared, I felt wrong about having them. Robin heard Una again. He took pictures of her, you know, pictures. It must be those revealing or obscene photos Satchel was talking about, because after all, he'd hardly have felt guilty about having a snapshot. The waitress came back with Satchwell's beer and Robin's Diet Coke. They ordered food. After swiftly scanning the menu, Robin asked for a chicken and bacon salad. Satchwell ordered steak and chips. When the waitress had gone, Robin asked, though she knew the answer, How long were you together? A couple of years, all told. We broke up, then got back together. She didn't like me using other models. Jealous. Not cut out for an artist's muse, Margot. Didn't like sitting still and not talking. <laughs> nah, I fell hard for Margot Bamborough. Yeah, there was a damn sight more to her than being a bunny girl. Of course there was, thought Robin, though still smiling politely. She became a bloody doctor. Did you have a painter? Yeah, said Satchwell. Few times. Some sketches and one full-size picture. I sold them. Needed a cash. Wish I hadn't. He fell into a momentary abstraction his uncovered eye surveying the pub, and Robin wondered whether old memories were genuinely resurfacing behind the heavily tanned face, which was so deeply lined and dark it might have been carved from teak, or whether he was playing the part that was expected of him when he said quietly, Hell of a girl, Margot Bamborough. He took a sip of his beer, then said, It's her husband who's hired you, is it? No, said Robin. Her daughter. Oh, said Satchwell, nodding. Yeah, of course, there was a kid. She didn't look as though she'd had a baby when I met her after they got married. Slim as ever. Both my wives put on about a stone with each of our kids. How many children have you got? asked Robin, politely. She wanted the food to hurry up. It was harder to walk out once food was in front of you, and some instinct told her that Paul Satchwell's whimsical mood might not last. Five, 
said Satchwell. Two with me first wife and three with me second. Didn't mean to. We got twins on the last throw. All pretty much grown up now, thank Christ. Kids and art don't mix. I love them, he said roughly. But Cyril Connolly had it right. The enemy of promise is the pram in a bloody hall. He threw her a brief glance out of his one visible eye and said abruptly, So her husband still thinks I had something to do with Margot disappearing, does he? What do you mean by still? inquired Robin. He gave my name to the police, said Satchwell. The night she disappeared, thought she might run off with me. Did you know Margot and I bumped into each other a couple of weeks before she disappeared? I did, yes, said Robin. It put ideas into what's his name's head, he said. I can't blame him. I suppose it did look fishy. I'd have probably thought the same if my bird had met up with an old flame right before they buggered off. Disappeared, I mean. The food arrived. Satchwell's steak and chips looked appetising, but Robin, who'd been too busy concentrating on her questions, hadn't read the small print on the menu. Expecting a plate of salad, she received a wooden platter bearing various ramekins containing hot sausage slices, hummus, and a sticky mess of mayonnaise-coated leaves, a challenging assortment to eat while taking notes. "'Do you want some chips?' offered Satchwell, pushing the small metal bucket that contained them towards her. "'No, thanks,' said Robin, smiling. She took a bite of a breadstick and continued, her pen in her right hand. Did Margot talk about Roy when you bumped into her? A bit, said Satchwell, his mouth full of steak. She put up a good thump. What you do when you meet the ex, isn't it? Pretend you think you did the right thing, no regrets. Did you think she had regrets? asked Robin. She wasn't happy, I could tell. I thought, nobody's paying you attention. She tried to put a brave face on it, but she struck me as miserable, knackered. Did you only see each other the once? Satchwell chewed his steak, looking at Robin thoughtfully. At last he swallowed, then said, "'Have you read my police statement?' "'Yes,' said Robin. "'Then you know perfectly well,' said Satchwell, waggling his fork at her, "'that it was just the once.' "'Don't you?' He was smiling, trying to pass off the implied admonition as waggish, but Robin felt the spindle-thin spike of aggression. So. You went for a drink and talked, said Robin, smiling, as though she hadn't noticed the undertone, daring him to become defensive, and he continued in a milder tone. Yeah, we went to some bar in Camden, not far from my flat. She'd been on an house call to some patient. Robin made a note. And can you remember what you talked about? She told me she'd met her husband at medical school. He was an eye flyer and all that. What was he? said Satchwell, with what seemed to Robin a forced unconcern. A cardiologist or something? Hematologist, said Robin. What's that, blood? Yeah, she was always impressed by clever people, Margot. Didn't occur to her that they can be shits like anyone else. Did you get the impression Dr. Phipps was a shit? asked Robin lightly. Not really, said Satchwell. But I was told he had a stick up his arse and was a bit of a mummy's boy. Who told you that? asked Robin, pausing with her pen suspended over her notebook. Someone who'd met him, he replied with a slight shrug. You not married? he went on, his eyes on Robin's bare left hand. Living with someone, said Robin, with a brief smile. It was the answer she'd learned to give, to shut down flirtation from witnesses and clients, to erect barriers. Satchwell said, Ah! I always know if a bird's living with a bloke without marriage, she must be really keen on him. Nothing but her feelings holding her there, is there? I suppose not, said Robin, with a brief smile. She knew he was trying to disconcert her. Did Margot mention anything that might be worrying her, or causing her problems, at home or at work? Told you, it was all window dressing, said Satchwell, munching on fries. Great job, great husband, nice kid, nice house. She made it, he swallowed. I did the same thing back, told her I was having an exhibition, won an award for one of me paintings, in a band, Serious Girlfriend, which was a lie, he added, with a slight snort. I only remember that bird because we split up later that evening. Don't ask me her name now. We haven't been together long. 
She had long black hair and a massive tattoo of a spider's web round her navel. That's what I mainly remember. Yeah, anyway, I ended it. Seeing Margot again. He hesitated. His uncovered eye unfocused, he said. I was thirty-five. It's a funny age. It starts dawning on you thought is really going to happen to you, not just to other people. What are you, twenty-five? Twenty-nine, said Robin. Happens earlier for women, that worrying about getting old thing, said Satchwell. Got kids yet? No, said Robin. And then, so Margot didn't say anything to you that might suggest a reason for disappearing voluntarily. Margot wouldn't have gone away and left everyone in the lurch, said Satchwell, as positive on the point as Una. Not Margot. Responsibility was her middle name. She was a good girl, you know. School prefect sort. So you didn't make any plans to meet again? No plans, said Satchwell, munching on chips. I mentioned to her my band was playing at the Dublin Castle the following week. Said, drop in if you're passing. But she said she wouldn't be able to. Dublin Castle was a pub in Camden. Satchwell added. Might still be there. Yes, said Robin. It is. I told the investigating officer I'd mentioned the gig to her. Told him I'd have been up for seeing her again if she wanted it. I had nothing to hide. Robin remembered Strike's opinion that Satchwell volunteering this information seemed almost too helpful, and, trying to dissemble her sudden suspicion, asked, Did anyone spot Margot at the pub, the night you were playing? Satchwell took his time before swallowing, then said, Not as far as I know. The little wooden Viking you gave her, said Robin, watching him carefully, the one with Brunhilde written on the foot. The one she had on her desk at work, he said, with what Robin thought might have been a whiff of gratified vanity. Yeah, I gave her that in the old days, when we were dating. Could it be true? Robin wondered. After the acrimonious way Margot and Satchwell had broken up, after he'd locked her in his flat so she couldn't get out to work, after he'd hit her, after she'd married another man, would Margot really have kept Satchwell's silly little gift? Didn't private jokes and nicknames become dead and rotten things after a painful break-up, when the thought of them became almost worse than memories of rows and insults? Robin had given most of Matthew's gifts to charity after she'd found out about his infidelity including the plush elephant that had been his first Valentine's present, and the jewellery box he'd given her for her twenty-first. However, Robin could tell Satchwell was going to stick to his story, so she moved to the next question in her notebook. There was a printer's on Clerkenwell Road I think you had an association with. Come again, said Satchwell, frowning. A printer's. A schoolgirl called Amanda White claimed she saw Margot in an upper window belonging to this printer's on the night. Really? said Satchwell. I never had no association with no printer's. Who says I did? There was a book written in the eighties about Margot's disappearance. Yeah, I miss that. It said the printer's produced flyers for a nightclub you painted a mural for. For crying out loud, said Satchwell, half amused, half exasperated. That's not an association. It'd be a stretch to call it a coincidence. I never heard of the bloody place. Robin made a note and moved to her next question. What did you think of Bill Talbot? Who? The investigating officer, the first one, said Robin. Oh, yeah, said Satchwell, nodding. Very odd bloke. When I heard afterwards he'd had a breakdown or whatever, I wasn't surprised. Kept asking me what I was doing on random dates. Afterwards, I worked out he was trying to decide whether I was the Essex butcher. He wanted to know my time of birth as well, and what the hell that had to do with anything. He was trying to draw up your horoscope, said Robin, and she explained Talbot's preoccupation with astrology. Dento pestevo, said Satchwell, looking annoyed. Astrology? That's not funny. He was in charge of the case. How long? Six months, said Robin. Jesus! said Satchwell, scowling so that the clear tape holding the dressing over his eye crinkled. I don't think the people around him realised how ill he was until it got too obvious to ignore, said Robin, now pulling a few tagged sheets of paper out of her bag, photocopies of Satchwell's statements to both Talbot and Lawson. What's all that? he said sharply. Your statements to the police, said Robin. 
Why are there... What are they, stars? All over the... They're pentagrams, said Robin. This is the statement Talbot took from you. It's just routine, she added, because Satchwell was now looking wary. We've done it with everyone the police interviewed. I know your statements were double-checked at the time, but I wondered if I could run over them again, in case you remember anything useful. Taking his silence for consent, she continued, You were alone in your studio on the afternoon of the 11th of October, but you took a call there at five from a Mr. Hendricks. Hendricks, yeah, said Satchwell. He was my agent at the time. You went out to eat at a local cafe around half-past six, where you had a conversation with a woman behind the till, which she remembered. Then you went back home to change and out again to meet a few friends in a bar called Joe Bloggs around eight o'clock. All three friends you were drinking with confirmed your story. Nothing to add to any of that? Nah, said Satchwell, and Robin thought she detected a slight sense of relief. That all sounds right. Was it one of those friends who'd met Roy Phipps? Robin asked casually. No, said Satchwell, unsmiling, and then, changing the subject, he said, Margot's daughter must be knocking on for forty now, is she? Forty last year, said Robin. <laughs> Ella, said Satchwell, shaking his head. Time just... One of the mahogany brown hands, wrinkled and embellished with heavy silver and turquoise rings, made a smooth motion as of a paper aeroplane in flight. And then one day you rolled and you never saw it sneaking up on you. When did you move abroad? I didn't mean to move, not first. When travelling, late seventy-five, said Satchwell. He'd nearly finished his steak now. What made you... I'd been thinking of travelling for a bit, said Satchwell. But after Creed killed Margot, it was such a bloody horrible thing, such a shock, I don't know. I wanted a change of scene. That's what you think happened to her, do you? Creed killed her. He put the last bit of steak into his mouth, chewed it and swallowed before answering. Well, yeah. Obviously, at first, I hoped she'd just walked out and her husband and was old up somewhere. But then it went on and on and, yeah, everyone thought he was the Essex butcher, including the police. Not just the nutty one, the second one, the one who took over. Lawson, said Robin. Satchwell shrugged, as much as to say the officer's name didn't matter, and asked, "'Are you going to interview Creed?' "'Hopefully. "'Why would he tell the truth now?' "'He likes publicity,' said Robin. "'He might like the idea of making a splash in the newspapers. "'So Margot disappearing was a shock to you?' "'Well, obviously it was,' said Satchwell, "'now probing his teeth with his tongue. "'I'd just seen her again, and I'm not going to pretend "'I was still in love with her or anything like that, but... "'Have you ever been caught up in a police investigation?' he asked her, with a trace of aggression. "'Yes,' said Robin. "'Several. It was stressful and intimidating every time.' "'Well, there you are,' said Satchwell, mollified. "'What made you choose Greece?' "'I didn't, really. I had an inheritance off my grandmother, and I thought, "'I'll take some time off, do Europe, paint. Went through France and Italy, and in 76 I arrived in Kos, worked in a bar, painted in me three hours, sold quite a few pictures to tourists, met me first wife. Never left, said Satchwell with a shrug. Something else I wanted to ask you, said Robin, moving the police statements to the bottom of a small stack. We found out about a possible sighting of Margot a week after she disappeared, a sighting that wasn't ever reported to the police. Yeah? said Satchwell, looking interested. Where? In Leamington Spa, said Robin, in the graveyard of All Saints Church. Satchwell's thick white eyebrows rose, putting strain on the clear tape that was holding the dressing to his eye. In All Saints? he repeated, apparently astonished. Looking at graves, allegedly she had her hair dyed black. Who saw this? A man visiting the area on a motorbike. Two years later, he told a St. John's practice nurse about it. He told a nurse? Satchwell's jaw hardened. And what else has the nurse told you? He said, searching Robin's face. He seemed suddenly and unexpectedly angry. Do you know Janice? asked Robin, wondering why he looked so angry. 
That's her name, is it? said Satchwell. I couldn't remember. You do know her? Satchwell put more chips in his mouth. Robin could see that he was trying to decide what to tell her, and she felt that jolt of excitement that made all the long, tedious hours of the job, the sitting around, the sleeplessness, worthwhile. She's shit-stirring, said Satchwell abruptly. She's a shit-stirrer, that one, that nurse. She and Margot didn't like each other. Margot told me she didn't like her. When was this? When we ran into each other, like I told you, in the street. I thought you said she didn't talk about work. Well, she told me that. They'd had a row or something. I don't know. It was just something she said in passing. She told me she didn't like the nurse, repeated Satchwell. It was as though a hard mask had surfaced under the leather-dark skin. The slightly comical, crepey-faced charmer had been replaced by a mean, old, one-eyed man. Robin remembered how Matthew's lower face had tautened when angry, giving him the look of a muzzled dog, but she wasn't intimidated. She sensed in Satchwell the same wily instinct for self-preservation as in her ex-husband. Whatever Satchwell might have meted out to Margot, or to the wives who'd left him, he'd think better of slapping Robin in a crowded pub, in the town where his sister still lived. "'You seem angry,' Robin said. "'Gear Charlie too. Of course I am. That nurse, what's her name? Trying to implicate me, isn't she? Making up a story to make it look like Margot ran away to be with me. Janice didn't invent the story. We checked with Mr. Ramage's widow, and she confirmed that her late husband told other people he'd met a missing woman. What else has Janice told you? he said again. She never mentioned you, said Robin, now immensely curious. We had no idea you knew each other. But she claims Mark I was seen in Lemon and Spa after she disappeared. Nah, she knows exactly what she's bloody doing. Satchwell took another chip, ate it, then suddenly got to his feet and walked past Robin, who looked over her shoulder to see him striding into the gents. His back view was older than his front. She could see the pink scalp through the thin white hair, and there was no backside filling out his jeans. Robin guessed he considered the interview finished. However, she had something else up her sleeve. A dangerous something, perhaps, but she'd use it rather than let the interview end here, with more questions raised than answered. It was fully five minutes before he reappeared, and she could tell that he'd worked himself up in his absence. Rather than sitting back down, he stood over her as he said, I don't think you're a fucking detective. I think you're press. Seen from below, the tortoise's neck was particularly striking. The chain, the turquoise and the silver rings and the long hair now seemed like fancy dress. You can call Anna Phipps and check if you like, said Robin. I've got a number here. Why do you think the press would be interested in you? I had enough of them last time. I'm off. I don't need this. I'm supposed to be recuperating. One last thing, said Robin, and you're going to want to hear it. She'd learned the trick from Strike. Stay calm, but assertive. Make them worry what else you've got. Satchwell turned back his one uncovered eye hard as flint. No trace of flirtation remained, no attempt to patronise her. She was an equal now, an adversary. "'Why don't you sit down?' said Robin. "'This won't take long.' After a slight hesitation, Satchwell eased himself back into his seat. His hoary head now blocked the stuffed deer head that hung on the brick wall behind him. From Robin's point of view, the horns appeared to rise directly out of the white hair that fell in limp curls to his shoulders. Margot Bamborough knew something about you that you didn't want to get out, said Robin. Didn't she? He glared at her. The pillow dream? said Robin. Every line of his face hardened, turning him vulpine. The sunburned chest, wrinkled beneath its white hair, caved as he exhaled. Told someone, did she? Who? Oh. Before Robin could answer, he said, Her husband, I suppose. Oh, that fucking Irish girl, was it? His jaws worked, chewing nothing. I should never have told her, he said. 
That's what you do when you're drunk and you're in love, or whatever the fuck we were. Then I had it playing on my mind for years that she was gonna... The sentence ended in silence. Did she mention it when you met again? asked Robin, feeling her way, pretending she knew more than she did. She asked after my poor mother, said Satchwell. I thought at the time, are you having a go? But I don't think she was. Maybe she'd learn better being a doctor. Maybe she changed her views. She'll have seen people like Blanche. A life not worth living. Anyway, he said, leaning forward slightly. I still think it was a dream. All right. I was six years old. I dreamed it. And even if it wasn't a dream, they're both dead and gone now, and nobody can say no different. My old mum died in 89. You can't get her for anything now, poor cow. Single mother, trying to cope with us all on her own. It's merciful, said Satchwell, putting someone out of their misery. A mercy. He got up, drained beneath his tan, his face sagging, turned and walked away. But at the moment he was about to disappear, he suddenly turned and tottered back to her, his jaw working. I think, he said, with as much malevolence as he could muster. You're a nasty little bitch. He left for good this time. Robin's heart rate was barely raised. Her dominant emotion was elation. Pushing her unappetizing ramekins aside, she pulled the little metal bucket he'd left behind towards her and finished the artist's chips. Chapter 48 Sir Artigal, long having since taken in hand the exploit, to him assigned, her highest behest to do, to the seashore he gan his way apply. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Joan's funeral service finished with a hymn most beloved of sailors, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. While the congregation sang the familiar words, Ted, Strike, Dave Polworth, and three of Ted's comrades in the lifeboat service, shouldered the coffin back down the aisle of the simple, cream-walled church, with its wooden beams and its stained-glass windows depicting purple-robed St. Mordes, for whom both village and church were named. Flanked by an island tower and a seal on a rock, the saint watched the coffin-bearers pass out of the church. O Saviour, whose almighty word, the winds and waves submissive heard, who walked upon the foaming deep, and calm amidst the rage did sleep. Polworth, by far the shortest of the six men, walked directly behind Strike, doing his best to bear a fair share of the load. The mourners, many of whom had had to stand at the back of the packed church, or else listen as best they could from outside, formed a respectful circle around the hearse outside as the shining oak box was loaded onto it. Barely a murmur was heard as the rear doors slammed shut on Joan's earthly remains. As the straight-backed undertaker in his thick black overcoat climbed back into the driver's seat, Strike put an arm around Ted's shoulders. Together they watched the hearse drive out of sight. Strike could feel Ted trembling. Look at all these flowers, Ted, said Lucy, whose eyes were swollen shut, and the three of them turned back to the church to examine the dense bank of sprays, wreaths, and bunches that created a jubilant blaze against the exterior wall of the tiny church. Beautiful lilies, Ted, look, from Marion and Gary, all the way from Canada. The congregation was still spilling out of the church to join those outside. All kept a distance from the family, while they moved crabwise along the wall of the church. Joan would surely have delighted in the mass of floral tributes, and Strike drew unexpected consolation from messages that Lucy was reading aloud to Ted, whose eyes, like hers, were puffy and red. Ian and Judy, she told her uncle, Terry and Olive. Loads, aren't there? said Ted, marvelling. The now whispering, milling crowd of mourners were doubtless wondering whether it would be heartless to set out immediately for the ship and castle, where the wake was to be held, Strike thought. He couldn't blame them. He, too, was craving a pint, and perhaps a chaser, too. 
with deepest sympathy from Robin, Sam, Andy, Saul, and Pat, Lucy read aloud. She turned to look at Strike, smiling. How lovely. Did you tell Robin pink roses were Joan's favourite? Don't think so, said Strike, who hadn't known himself. The fact that his agency was represented here among the tributes to Joan meant a great deal to him. Unlike Lucy, he'd be travelling back to London alone by train. Even though he'd been craving solitude for the past ten days, the prospect of his silent attic room was cheerless after these long days of dread and loss. The roses, which were for Joan, were also for him. They said, You won't be alone. You have something you've built. And all right, it might not be a family, but there are still people who care about you waiting in London. Strike told himself, people, because there were five names on the card, but he turned away thinking only of Robin. Lucy drove Ted and Strike to the ship and castle in Ted's car, leaving Greg to follow with the boys. None of them talked in the car. A kind of emotional exhaustion had set in. Joan had known what she was doing, Strike thought, as he watched the familiar street slide past. He was grateful they weren't following to the crematorium, that they would reclaim the body in a form that could be clutched to the chest and borne on a boat, in the quiet of a sunny afternoon to come, just the family, to say their last, private farewell. The Ship and Castle's dining room windows looked out over St. Moore's Bay, which was overcast but tranquil. Strike bought Ted and himself pints, saw his uncle safely into a chair among a knot of solicitous friends, returned to the bar for a double famous grouse, which he downed in one, then carried his pint to the window. The sea was Quaker grey, sparkling occasionally where the silvered fringes of the clouds caught it. Viewed from the hotel window, St. Moore's was a study in mouse and slate, but the little rowing boats perched on the mudflats below provided welcome dabs of cheerful colour. You all right, Diddy? He turned. Ilsa was with Polworth, and she reached up and hugged Strike. All three of them had been at St. Moore's Primary School together. In those days, as Strike remembered it, Ilsa hadn't liked Polworth much. He'd always been unpopular with female classmates. Over Dave's shoulder, Strike could see Polworth's wife, Penny, chatting with a group of female friends. Nick really wanted to be here, Corm, but he had to work, said Ilsa. Of course, said Strike. It was really good of you to come, Ilsa. I love Joan she said simply. Mum and Dad are going to have Ted over on Friday night. Dad's taken him for a round of golf on Tuesday. The Polworth's two daughters, who weren't renowned for their good behaviour, were playing tag among the mourners. The smaller of the two, Strike could never remember which was Roz and which Mel, dashed around them and clung momentarily to the back of Strike's legs, as though he were a piece of furniture, looking out at her sister before sprinting off again, giggling. And we're having Ted over Saturday, said Polworth, as though nothing had happened. Neither Polworth ever corrected their children unless they were directly inconveniencing their parents. So don't worry, did he? We'll make sure the old fellow's all right. Cheers, mate, said Strike, with difficulty. He hadn't cried in church, hadn't cried all these last horrible days, because there'd been so much to organise, and he found relief in activity. However, the kindness shown by his old friends was seeping through his defences. He wanted to express his gratitude properly, because Polworth hadn't yet permitted him to say all he wanted about the way he'd enabled Strike and Lucy to reach the dying Joan. Before Strike could make a start, however, Penny Polworth joined their group, followed by two women Strike didn't recognise, but who were both beaming at him. "'Hi, Coram,' said Penny, who was dark-eyed and blunt-nosed, and who'd worn her hair pulled back into a practical ponytail since she was five. Abigail and Lindy really want to meet you. Hello, said Strike, unsmiling. He held out his hand and shook both of theirs, sure that they were about to talk about his detective triumphs and already annoyed. Today, of all days, he wanted to be nothing but Joan's nephew. He assumed that Abigail was Lindy's daughter, because if you remove the younger woman's carefully penciled, geometrically precise eyebrows and fake tan, they had the same round, flat faces. She was ever so proud of you, said Lindy. We follow everything about you in the papers. 
said plump Abigail, who seemed to be on the verge of giggling. "'What are you working on now? I don't suppose you can say, can you?' said Lindy, devouring him with her eyes. "'Do you ever get involved with the royals at all?' asked Abigail. "'Fuck's sake!' "'No,' said Strike. "'Excuse me. Need a smoke.' He knew he'd offended them, but didn't care, though he could imagine Joan's disapproval as he walked away from the group by the window. What would it have hurt him, she'd have said, to entertain her friends by talking about his job? Joan had liked to show him off, the nephew who was the closest thing she'd ever have to a son, and it suddenly came back to him, after these long days of guilt, why he'd avoided coming back to the little town for so long. Because he'd found himself slowly stifling under the weight of teacups and doilies and carefully curated conversations, and Joan's suffocating pride and the neighbour's curiosity, and the sidelong glances at his false leg when nobody thought he could see them looking. As he stumped down the hall, he pulled out his mobile and pressed Robin's number without conscious thought. Hi, she said, sounding mildly surprised to hear from him. Hi, said Strike pausing on the doorstep of the hotel to pull a cigarette out of the packet with his teeth. He crossed the road and lit it, looking out over the mudflats at the sea. Just wanted to check in and to thank you. What for? The flowers from the agency. They meant a lot to the family. Oh, said Robin. I'm glad. How was the funeral? It was, you know, a funeral, said Strike, watching a seagull bobbing on the tranquil sea. Anything new your end? Well, yes, actually, said Robin, after a fractional hesitation. But now's probably not the moment. I'll tell you when you... Now's a great moment, said Strike, who was yearning for normality, for something to think about that wasn't connected to Joan, or Loss, or St. Moore's. So Robin related the story of her interview with Paul Satchwell, and Strike listened in silence. And then he called me a nasty little bitch, Robin concluded, and left. Christ almighty, said Strike, genuinely amazed. Not only that Robin had managed to draw so much information from Satchwell, but at what she'd found out. I've just been sitting here looking at records on my phone. I'm back in the Land Rover, going to head home in a bit. Blanche Doris Satchwell died 1945, aged ten. She's buried in a cemetery outside Leamington Spa. Satchwell called it a mercy killing. Well, Robin corrected herself, he called it a dream, which was his way of telling Margot, while retaining some plausible deniability, wasn't it? It's a traumatic memory to carry around with you from age six, though, isn't it? Certainly is, said Strike. And it gives him a motive of sorts, if he thought Margot might tell the authorities. Exactly. And what do you think about the Janice bit? Why didn't she tell us she knew Satchwell? Very good question, said Strike. Go over it again, what he said about Janice. When I told him Janice was the one who said Margot was spotted in Leamington Spa, he said she was a shit-stirrer and that she was trying to implicate him somehow in Margot's disappearance. Very interesting indeed, said Strike, frowning at the bobbing seagull, which was staring at the horizon with concentrated intent, its cruel, hooked beak pointing towards the horizon. And what was that thing about Roy? He said somebody had told him Roy was a mummy's boy who had a stick up his ass, said Robin. But he wouldn't tell me who'd said it. Doesn't sound much like Janice, but you never know, said Strike. Well, you've done bloody well, Robin. Thanks. We'll have a proper catch-up on Bamborough when I get back, said Strike. Well, we'll need a catch-up on everything. Great. I hope the rest of you stay is okay said Robin, with that note of finality that indicated the call was about to end. Strike wanted to keep her on the line, but she evidently thought she oughtn't monopolise his time in his last afternoon with the grieving family, and he could think of no pretext to keep her talking. They bade each other goodbye, and Strike returned his mobile to his pocket. "'Here you go, did he?' Polworth had emerged from the hotel, carrying a couple of fresh pints. Strike accepted his with thanks, and both turned to face the bay as they drank. "'You back up to London tomorrow, are you?' said Polworth. "'Yeah,' said Strike. "'But not for long. 
Joan wanted us to take her ashes out on Ted's boat and scatter them at sea. Nice idea, said Polworth. Listen, mate, thanks for everything. Shut up, said Polworth. You do it for me. You're right, said Strike. I would. Easy to say, you cunt, said Polworth, without skipping a beat, seeing as my mum's dead and I don't know where the fuck my dad is. Strike laughed. Well, I'm a private detective. Want me to find him for you? Fuck no, said Polworth. Good riddance. They drank their pints. There was a brief break in the cloud, and the sea was suddenly a carpet of diamonds, and the bobbing seagull a paper-white piece of origami. Strike was wondering idly whether Polworth's passionate devotion to Cornwall was a reaction against his absent Birmingham-born father, when Polworth spoke up again. Speaking of fathers, Joan told me yours was looking for a reunion. She did, did she? Don't be narked, said Polworth. You know what she was like. Wanted me to know you were going through a tough time. Nothing doing, I take it? No, said Strike. Nothing doing. The brief silence was broken by the shrieks and yells of Polworth's two daughters sprinting out of the hotel. Ignoring their father and Strike, they wriggled under the chain separating road from damp shingle and ran out to the water's edge, pursued a moment later by Strike's nephew, Luke, who was holding a couple of cream buns in his hand and clearly intent on throwing them at the girls. Oi! bellowed Strike. No! Luke's face fell. They started it, he said, turning to show Strike a white smear down the back of his black suit jacket, newly purchased for his great-aunt's funeral. And I'm finishing it, said Strike, while the Polworth girls giggled, peeking out over the rim of the rowing boat behind which they had taken refuge. Put those back where you got them. Glaring at his uncle, Luke took a defiant bite out of one of the buns, then turned and headed back into the hotel. Little shit, muttered Strike. Polworth watched in a detached way as his girls began to kick cold seawater and sand at each other. Only when the younger girl overbalanced and fell backwards into a foot of icy sea, eliciting a scream of shock, did he react. Fuck's sake! Get inside! Come on, don't bloody whine, it's your own fault! Come on! Inside now! The three Polworths headed back into the ship and castle, leaving Strike alone again. The bobbing seagull, which was doubtless used to a tide of tourists, to the chugging and grinding of the Falmouth ferry and the fishing boats passing in and out of the bay every day, had been unfazed by the shrieks and yells of the Polworth girls. Its sharp eyes were fixed upon something Strike couldn't see, far out at sea. Only when the clouds closed again and the sea darkened to iron did the bird take off at last. Strike's eyes followed it as it soared on wide, curved wings into the distance, away from the shelter of the bay for open sea, ready to resume the hard but necessary business of survival. Part 5 Lusty Spring, All Dight in Leaves of Flowers Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Chapter 49 after long storms and tempests overblown, The sun at length his joyous face doth clear. So when as fortune all her spite hath shown, Some blissful hours at last must needs appear, Else would afflicted whites oft times despair. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen At eight a.m. on the morning she should have been meeting her estranged husband for mediation, Robin emerged from Tottenham Court Road Station, beneath a cerulean sky. The sunshine felt like a minor miracle after the long months of rain and storms, and Robin, who had no surveillance to do today, had put on a dress, glad to be out of her everlasting jeans and sweatshirts. Angry as she felt at Matthew for calling off the session with only twenty-four hours' notice, my client regrets that an urgent matter of a personal nature has arisen. Given my own unavailability for the latter part of March, I suggest we find a mutually convenient date in April. Suspicious as she was that Matthew was dragging out the process merely to demonstrate his power and add pressure to give up her claim on their joint account, her spirits were raised by the dusty glow of the early morning sunshine illuminating the eternal roadworks at the top of Charing Cross Road. The truth, which had been borne forcibly upon Robin during the five days off that Strike had insisted she take, was that she was happier at work. 
With no desire to go home to Yorkshire and face the usual barrage of questions from her mother about the divorce and her job, and insufficient funds to get out of London to take a solitary mini-break, she'd spent most of her time taking care of her backlog of chores or working on the Bambara case. She had, if not precisely leads, then ideas, and was now heading into the office early in the hope of catching strike before the business of the day took over. The pneumatic drills drowned out the shouts of workmen in the road as Robin passed, until she reached the shadowy calm of Denmark Street, where the shops hadn't yet opened. Almost at the top of the metal staircase, Robin heard voices emanating from behind the glass office door. In spite of the fact that it was not quite 8.15, the light was already on. "'Morning,' said Strike, when she opened the door. He was standing beside the kettle, and looked mildly surprised to see her so early. I thought you weren't going to be in until lunchtime. Cancelled, said Robin. She wondered whether Strike had forgotten what she'd had on that morning, or whether he was being discreet because Morris was sitting on the fake leather sofa. Though as handsome as ever, Morris's bright blue eyes were bloodshot, and his jaw dark with stubble. Hello, stranger, he said. Look at you. Proper advert for taking it easy. Robin ignored this comment but as she hung up her jacket, she found herself wishing she hadn't worn the dress. She greatly resented Morris making her feel self-conscious, but it would have been easier just to have worn jeans as usual. "'Morris has caught Mr. Smith at it with a nanny,' said Strike. "'That was quick,' said Robin, trying to be generous, wishing Morris hadn't been the one to do it. "'Red-handed. Ten past one this morning,' said Morris, passing Robin a night-vision digital camera. Hubby was pretending to be out with the boys. Nanny always has a night off on Tuesdays. Silly fuckers said goodbye on the doorstep. Rookie error. Robin scrolled slowly through the pictures. The voluptuous nanny, who so resembled Strike's ex Lorelei, was standing in the doorway of a terraced house, locked in the arms of Mrs. Smith's husband. Morris had captured not only the clinch, but the street name and door number. Where is this place? Robin asked flicking past pictures of the clinch. Shoreditch, Nanny's best mate rents it, said Morris. Always useful to have a friend who'll let you use their place for a sneaky shag, eh? I've got her name and details too, so she's about to get dragged into it all as well. Morris stretched luxuriously on the sofa, arms over his head, and said through a yawn, <sighs> Not often you get a chance to make three women miserable at once, is it? Not to mention the husband, said Robin looking at the handsome profile of the commodity broker's husband, silhouetted against a street lamp as he made his way back to the family car. "'Well, yeah,' said Morris, holding his stretch. "'Him too!' His T-shirt had ridden up, exposing an expanse of toned abdomen, a fact of which Robin thought he was probably well aware. "'Don't fancy a breakfast meeting, do you?' Strike asked Robin. he just opened the biscuit tin and found it empty. We're overdue a Bambara catch-up, and I haven't had breakfast. Great, said Robin, immediately taking down her jacket again. You never take me out for breakfast, Morris told Strike, getting up off the sofa. Ignoring this comment, Strike said, Good going on, Smith, Morris. I'll let the wife know later. See you tomorrow. Terrible, isn't it? said Robin, as she and Strike walked back out of the black street door onto the cool of Denmark Street where sunlight still hadn't penetrated. This missing plane. Eleven days previously, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 had taken off from Kuala Lumpur and disappeared without trace. More than two hundred people were missing. Competing theories about what had happened to the plane had dominated the news for the last week, hijack, crew sabotage, and mechanical failure among them. Robin had been reading about it on the way into work. All those relatives waiting for news. It must surely come soon. An aircraft holding nearly 250 people wasn't as easily lost as a single woman, melting away into the Clerkenwell rain. Nightmare for the families, agreed Strike, as they headed out into the sun on Charing Cross Road. He paused, looking up and down the road. I don't want to go to Starbucks. So they walked to Bar Italia in Frith Street, which lay opposite Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club five minutes from the office. 
The small metal tables and chairs outside on the pavement were all unoccupied. In spite of its sunny promise, the March morning air still carried a chill. Every high stool at the counter inside the café bore a customer gulping down coffee before starting their working day, while reading news off their phones, or else examining the shelves of produce reflected in the mirror that faced them. "'You're going to be warm enough if we sit out here?' asked Strike doubtfully, looking from Robin's dress to the counter inside. She was starting to really wish she'd worn her jeans. "'I'll be fine,' said Robin. "'And I only want a cappuccino. I already ate.' While Strike was buying food and drink, Robin sat down on the cold metal chair, drew her jacket more tightly around her, and opened her bag, with the intention of taking out Talbot's leather notebook, but after a moment's hesitation, she changed her mind and left it where it was. She didn't want Strike to think that she'd been concentrating on Talbot's astrological musings over the last few days, even though she had, in fact, spent many hours poring over the book. Cappuccino, said Strike returning to her and setting the coffee in front of her. He'd bought himself a double espresso and a mozzarella and salami roll. Sitting down next to her, he said, How come mediation was cancelled? Pleased he'd remembered, Robin said. Matthew claims something urgent came up. Believe him? No. I think it's more mind games. I wasn't looking forward to it, but at least it would have been over. So, she said, not wanting to talk about Matthew. Have you got anything new on Bamborough? Not much, said Strike, who'd been working flat out on other cases since his return from Cornwall. We've got forensics back on that blood smear I found in the book in the Athorns flat. And? Type O positive. And did you call Roy to find out? Yeah. Margot was A positive. Oh, said Robin. My hopes weren't high, said Strike with a shrug. It looked like a smear from a paper cut, if anything. I found Mucky Ricci, though. He's in a private nursing home called St. Peter's in Islington. I had to do a fair bit of impersonation on the phone to get confirmation. Great. Do you want me to— No, I told you. Shankar issued stern warnings about upsetting the old bastard, in case his sons got wind of it. And you feel, of the two of us, I'm the one who upsets people, do you? Strike smirks slightly while chewing his roll. There's no point rattling Luca Ricci's cage unless we have to. Shankar told me Mucky was Gaga, which I hoped meant he was a bit less sharp than he used to be. Might even have worked in our favour. Unfortunately, from what I managed to wheedle out of the nurse, he doesn't talk any more. Not at all. Apparently not. She mentioned it in passing. I try to find out whether that's because he's depressed or had a stroke, or whether he's demented, in which case questioning him is obviously pointless, but she didn't say. I went to check out the home. I was hoping for some big institutional place where you might slip in and out unnoticed, but it's more like a B&B. &B. They've only got eighteen residents. I'd say the chances of getting in there undetected or passing yourself off as a distant cousin are close to zero. Irrationally, now that Ricci seemed unreachable, Robin, who hadn't been more interested in him than in any other of the suspects, immediately felt as though something crucial to the investigation had been lost. "'I'm not saying I won't take a bash at him, eventually,' said Strike. "'But right now the possible gains don't justify making a bunch of professional gangsters angry at us. On the other hand, if we've got nothing else come August, I might have to see whether I can get a word or two out of Ricci. From his tone, Robin guessed that Strike too was well aware that more than half their allotted year on the Bamborough case had already elapsed. I've also, he continued, made contact with Margot's biographer, C.B. Oakden, who's playing hard to get. He seems to think he's far more important to the investigation than I do. Is he after money? I'd say he's after anything he can get, said Strike. He seemed as interested in interviewing me as letting me interview him. Maybe, suggested Robin, he's thinking of writing a book about you, like the one he did on Margot. Strike didn't smile. He comes across as equal parts wily and stupid. It doesn't seem to have occurred to him that I must know a lot about his dodgy past, given that I managed to track him down after multiple name changes. But I can see how he conned all those old women. 
he puts up a good show over the phone of knowing and remembering everyone around Margot. There was a real fluency to it. Yes, Dr. Gupta, lovely man. Oh, yes, Irene, bit of a handful. It's convincing until you remember he was fourteen when Margot disappeared, and probably met them all a couple of times tops. But he wouldn't tell me anything about Brenner, which is who I'm really interested in. I'll need to think about that, he said. I'm not sure I want to go into that. I've called him twice so far. Both times he tried to divert the conversation back on to me. I dragged it back to Brenner, and he cut the call short, pretending he had something urgent to take care of. Both times he promised to phone me back, but didn't. You don't think he's recording the calls, do you? asked Robin, trying to get stuff about you we can sell to the papers. It occurred to me, Strike admitted, tipping sugar into his coffee. Maybe I should talk to him next time. Might not be a bad idea, said Strike. Anyway, he took a gulp of coffee. That's all I've done on Bambra since I got back. But I'm planning to drop in on Nurse Janice the moment I've got a couple of clear hours. She'll be back from Dubai by now, and I want to know why she never mentioned she knew Paul Satchwell. Don't think I'll warn her I'm coming this time. There's something to be said for catching people unawares. So, what's new your end? Well, said Robin, Gloria Conti, or Jabert, as she is these days, hasn't answered Anna's email. Pity, said Strike, frowning. I thought she'd be more likely to talk to us if Anna asked. So did I. I think it's worth giving it another week, then getting Anna to prodder. The worst that can happen is another definite no. In slightly better news, I'm supposed to be speaking to Amanda White, who's now Amanda Laws, later today. How much is that costing us? Nothing. I appeal to a better nature, said Robin. And she pretended to be persuaded, but I can tell she's quite enamoured of the idea of publicity. And she likes the idea of you, and of getting a name in the papers again as the plucky schoolgirl who stuck to her woman in the window story, even when the police didn't believe her. That's in spite of the fact that her whole shtick, when I first contacted her, was that she didn't want to go through all the stress of press interest again unless she got money out of it. She's still married, asked Strike, taking his cigarettes out of his pocket, because she and Oakden sound like a good match. Mightn't be a bad sideline for us. Setting grifters up with each other. Robin laughed. <laughs> so, so that they can have dodgy children together, thus keeping us in business forever. Strike lit his cigarette, exhaled, and then said, Not a perfect business plan. There's no guarantee breeding two shits together will produce a third shit. I've known decent people who were raised by complete bastards, and vice versa. Your nature over nurture, are you? asked Robin. Maybe, said Strike. My three nephews were all raised the same, weren't they? And one's lovely, one's a prick, and one's an arsehole, said Robin. Strike's loud burst of laughter seemed to offend the harried-looking suited man who was hurrying past with a mobile pressed to his ear. Well remembered, Strike said, still grinning as he watched the scowling man march out of sight. Lately he too had had moods where the sound of other people's cheerfulness grated. But at this moment, with the sunshine, the good coffee, and Robin beside him. He suddenly realised he was happier than he'd been in months. People are never raised the same way, though, said Robin. Not even in the same house with the same parents. Birth order matters and all kinds of other things. Speaking of which, Wilma Bayliss's daughter, Maya, has definitely agreed to talk to us. We're trying to find a convenient date. I think I told you the youngest sister is recovering from breast cancer, so I don't want to hassle them. And there's something else said Robin, feeling self-conscious. Strike, who'd returned to his sandwich, saw to his surprise Robin drawing from her bag Talbot's leather-bound notebook, which Strike had assumed was still in the locked filing cabinet in the office. I've been looking back through this. Think I missed something, do you? said Strike, through a mouthful of bread. No, I— It's fine, he said. Perfectly possible. Nobody's infallible. Sunshine was slowly making its way into Frith Street now, and the pages of the old notebook glowed yellow as Robin opened it. Well, it's about Scorpio. You remember Scorpio? The person whose death Margot might have been worried about. Exactly. You thought Scorpio might be Steve Douthwaite's married girlfriend, who killed herself. I'm open to other theories, said Strike. 
His sandwich finished, he brushed off his hands and took out his cigarettes. The notes ask whether Aquarius confronted Pisces, don't they? Which I assumed meant Margot confronted Douthwaite. In spite of his neutral tone, Strike resented remembering these star signs. The laborious and ultimately unrewarding task of working out which suspects and witnesses were represented by each astrological glyph had been far from his favourite bit of research. Well, said Robin, taking out two folded photocopies, which she'd been keeping in the notebook, I've been wondering. Look at these. She passed the two documents to Strike, who opened them and saw copies of two birth certificates, one for Olive Satchwell, the other for Blanche Satchwell. Olive was Satchwell's mother, said Robin, as Strike, smoking, examined the documents, and Blanche was his sister, who died aged ten, possibly with a pillow over her face. If you're expecting me to deduce their star signs from these birthdays, said Strike, I haven't memorized the whole zodiac. Blanche was born on the 25th of October, which makes her a Scorpio, said Robin. Olive was born on the 29th of March. Under the traditional system, she'd be Aries, like Satchwell. To strike surprise, Robin now took out a copy of Astrology 14 by Stephen Schmidt. It was quite hard to track this down. It's been out of print for ages. A masterwork like that, you amaze me, said Strike, watching Robin turn to a page listing the dates of revised signs, according to Schmidt. Robin smiled, but refusing to be deflected, said, Look here. By Schmidt's system, Satchwell's mother was a Pisces. We're mixing up the two systems now, are we? asked Strike. Well, Talbot did, Robin pointed out. He decided Irene and Roy should be given their Schmidt signs, but other people were allowed to keep the traditional ones. But, said Strike, well aware that he was trying to impose logic on what was essentially illogical, Talbot made massive sweeping assumptions on the basis of people's original signs. Brenner was ruled out as a suspect solely because he was Libra, yes, said Robin. Well, what happens to Janice being psychic and the Essex butcher being a Capricorn, if all the dates started sliding around? Wherever there was a discrepancy between the traditional sign and Schmidt's sign, he seems to have gone with a sign he thought suited the person best. Which makes a mockery of the whole business. And also, said Strike, calls all my identifications of signs and suspects into question. I know, said Robin. Even Talbot seems to have got very stressed trying to work across both systems, which is when he began concentrating mainly on asteroids in the tarot. OK, said Strike, blowing smoke away from her. Go on with what you were saying. If Satchwell's sister was a Scorpio and her mother was Pisces, remind me, said Strike, exactly what that passage about Scorpio says. Robin flipped backwards through Talbot's notebook until she found the passage decorated with doodles of the crab, the fish, the scorpion, the fish-tailed goat, and the water-bearer's urn. Aquarius worried about how Scorpio died, question mark, she read aloud. And, written in capitals, Schmidt agrees with Adams. Then, did Aquarius challenge Pisces about Scorpio? Was cancer there? Did cancer witness? Cancer is kind, instinct is to protect. Then, in capitals, Interview again. Scorpio and Aquarius connected water, water, also Cancer and Capricorn. In capitals, has a fish's tail. Brow furrowed, Strike said. We're assuming Cancer still means Janice, right? Well, Janice and Cynthia are the only two Cancerians connected with the case, and Janice seems to fit this better, said Robin. Let's say Margot decided she was going to act on her suspicion that Satchwell's mother killed his sister. If she phoned Olive from the surgery, Janice might have overheard a phone call, mightn't she? And if Janice knew the Satchwell family and was involved with them in some way we don't know about, she mightn't have wanted to tell the police what she'd overheard for fear of incriminating Olive. Why would Margot have waited years to check out her suspicions about the pillow dream? asked Strike. But before Robin could supply an answer, he did it himself. Of course, people do sometimes take years to decide what action to take on something like that, or to muster up the courage to do it. He handed Robin back the two photocopies. Well, if that's the story behind the Scorpio business, Satchwell's still a prime suspect. 
I never got his address in Greece, said Robin guiltily. We'll get at him through his surviving sister if we have to. Strike took a swig of coffee, then, slightly against his better judgment, asked, What did you say about asteroids? Robin flicked further on through the notebook to show Strike the page she'd pored over in Leamington Spa, which she thought of as the Horns page. As the case went on, he seemed to give up on normal astrology. I think Schmidt had confused him so much he couldn't work it any more, so he starts inventing his own system. He's calculated the asteroid's position for the evening Margot disappeared. See here. Robin was pointing to the symbol. That symbol stands for the asteroid Pallas Athena. Remember that ugly clock at the Phipps' house? And he's using it to mean Margot. The asteroid Pallas Athena was in the tenth house of the Zodiac on the night Margot disappeared, and the tenth house is ruled by Capricorn. It's also supposed to govern business, upper classes, and upper floors. You think Margot's still in some attic? Robin smiled, but refused to be deflected. And see here. She angled the notebook towards him. Assuming the other asteroids also refer to living people, we've got Ceres, Juno, and Vesta. I think he's using Vesta, Keeper of the Hearth, to represent Cynthia. Vesta was in the seventh house, which is the house of marriage. Talbot's written, Fitz. So I think he's saying Cynthia was in Margot's marital home, Broom House. I think nurturing, protective Ceres sounds like Janice again. She's in the twelfth house, and so's Juno, who's associated with wives and infidelity, which might take us back to Joanna Hammond, Dalthwaite's married girlfriend. What's the twelfth house represent? Enemies, secrets, sorrows and undoing. Strike looked at her, eyebrows raised. He'd indulged Robin because it was sunny and he was enjoying her company, but his tolerance for astrology was now wearing very thin. It's also Pisces' house, said Robin, which is Douthwaite's sign. So maybe you think Janice and Joanna Hammond were both in Douthwaite's flat when Margot was abducted, do you? No, but because that'd be tricky, give that Joanna Hammond died weeks before Margot disappeared. Or are you suggesting her ghost was haunting Douthwaite? All right, I know it might mean nothing, said Robin, half laughing, as she ploughed on. But Talbot's written something else here. Ceres denies contact with Juno. Could Cetus be right? She was pointing at the whale symbol representing Irene. I find it hard to imagine Irene Hickson being right about very much, said Strike. He pulled the leather notebook towards him to look more closely at Talbot's small, obsessive writing, then pushed the notes away again with a slightly impatient shrug. Look, it's easy to get sucked into this stuff. When I was going through the notes, I started making connections while I was trying to follow his train of thought. But he was ill, wasn't he? Nothing leads anywhere concrete. I was just intrigued by that. Could Cetus be right? Because Talbot mistrusted Irene from the start, didn't he? Then he starts wondering whether she could have been right about... about something connected to enemies, secrets and undoing. If we ever find out what happened to Margot Bambra, said Strike, I'll bet you a hundred quid you'll be able to make equally strong cases for Talbot's occult stuff being bang on the money and completely off-beam. You can always stretch this symbolic stuff to fit the facts. One of my mother's friends used to guess every one's star signs, and she was right every single time. She was? Oh, yeah, said Strike. Because even when she was wrong, she was right. Turned out they had a load of planets in that sign, or, I don't know, the midwife who delivered them was that sign, or their dog. All right, said Robin, equably. She'd expected Strike's scepticism after all, and now put both the leather-bound notebook and Astrology 14 back into her bag. I know it might mean nothing at all. I'm only... If you want to go and see Irene Hickson again, be my guest. Tell her Talbot thought she might have had profound insight into something connected to asteroids and... I don't know. Cheese. The twelfth house doesn't govern cheese, said Robin, trying to look severe. What number's the house of dairy? Oh, bugger off, <laughs> she said, laughing against her will. Robin's mobile vibrated in her pocket, and she pulled it out. A text had just arrived. Hi, Robin. If you want, I can talk now. 
I've just agreed to work a later shift, so I'm not needed at work for a few hours. Otherwise, it'll have to be after eight tonight. Amanda. Amanda White, she told Strike. She wants to talk now. Works for me, said Strike, relieved to be back on firm investigative ground. Liar or not, Amanda White would at least be talking about an actual woman at a real window. Robin pressed Amanda's number, switched the mobile to speakerphone, and laid it on the table between her and Strike. Hi, said a confident female voice, with a hint of North London. Is that Robin? Yes, said Robin, and I'm with Cormoran. Morning, said Strike. Oh, it's you, is it? said Amanda, sounding delighted. I am honoured. I've been dealing with your assistant. She's actually my partner said Strike. Really? Business or the other? said Amanda. Business, said Strike, not looking at Robin. I understand Robin's been talking to you about what you saw on the night Margot Bamber had disappeared. That's right, said Amanda. Would you mind if we take a recording of this interview? No, I suppose not, said Amanda. I mean, I want to do the right thing, although I won't pretend it hasn't been a bit of a dilemma, because it was really stressful last time. "'Journalists, two police interviews, and I was only fourteen. "'But I've always been a stubborn girl, <laughs> and I stuck to me guns.' "'So Amanda told the story, with which Strike and Robin were already familiar, "'of the rain and the angry school friend and the upper window "'and the retrospective recognition of Margot when Amanda saw her picture in the paper. "'Strike asked a couple of questions, but he could tell that nothing would ever change Amanda's story.' Whether she truly believed she'd seen Margot Bamborough at the window that night or not, she was evidently determined never to relinquish her association with the forty-year-old mystery. And I suppose I've been haunted ever since by the idea that I didn't do anything, but I was fourteen and it only hit me later I could have been the one to save her. She ended the story. Well, said Robin, as Strike nodded at her, signalling he had everything he wanted, "'Thank you so much for talking to us, Amanda. "'I really—' "'There's something else before you go,' said Amanda. "'Wait until you hear this. "'It's just an amazing coincidence, "'and I don't think even the police know about this, "'because they're both dead.' "'Who are dead?' asked Robin, "'while Strike lit himself another cigarette. "'Well,' said Amanda, "'how's this for strange? "'My last job, this young girl at the office's great aunt "'Strike rolled his eyes, "'was in a hospice with guess who?' "'I don't know,' said Robin, politely. "'Violet Cooper,' said Amanda. "'You probably don't—' "'Dennis Creed's landlady,' said Robin. "'Exactly,' said Amanda, "'sounding pleased that Robin appreciated the significance of her story. "'So anyway, isn't that just weird, "'that I saw Margot at that window, "'and then, all those years later, "'I worked with someone whose relative met Vi Cooper. "'Only she was calling herself something different by then "'because people hated her. That is a coincidence, said Robin, making sure not to look at Strike. Well, thank. <laughs> That's not all, said Amanda, laughing. No, there's more to it than that. So, this girl's great aunt said Vi told her she wrote to Creed once, asking if he'd killed Margot Bambara. Amanda paused, clearly wanting a response. So Robin, who'd already read about this in The Demon of Paradise Park, said, Wow. I know, said Amanda, and apparently Vi said, this is on her deathbed, so, you know, she was telling the truth, because you would, wouldn't you? Vi said the letter she got back said he had killed her. Really? said Robin. I thought the letter... No, but this is direct from Violet, Amanda said, while Strike rolled his eyes again, and she said he definitely did. He as good as told her so. He said it in a way only she'd understand, but she knew exactly what he meant. Crazy, though, isn't it? I see Margot at the window, and then, years later... Amazing, said Robin. Well, thanks very much for your time, Amanda. This has been really... Um... It took Robin another couple of minutes, and much more insincere gratitude, to get Amanda off the line. What do you think? Robin asked Strike, when at last she'd succeeded in getting rid of Amanda. He pointed a finger at the sky. What? said Robin, looking up into the blue haze. If you look carefully, said Strike, you might just see an asteroid passing through the House of Bollocks. Chapter 50
I me, said she, where am I, or with whom? Among the living, or among the dead? Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Agency work unconnected with the Bamborough case consumed Strike for the next few days. His first attempt to surprise Nurse Janice Beatty at home was fruitless. He left Nightingale Grove, a nondescript street that lay hard against the southeastern railway line, without receiving any answer to his knock. His second attempt, on the following Wednesday, was made on a breezy afternoon that kept threatening showers. Strike approached Janice's house from Hither Green Station, along a pavement bordered to the right with railings and hedge, separating the road from the rail tracks. He was thinking about Robin as he trudged along, smoking, because she'd just turned down the opportunity of joining him to interview Janice, saying that there was something else she needed to do, but not specifying what that something was. Strike thought he detected a trace of caginess, almost amounting to defensiveness, in Robin's response to the suggestion of a joint interview, where usually there'd have been only disappointment. Since she'd left Matthew, Strike had become used to more ease and openness between him and Robin, so this refusal, coupled with her tone and lack of an explanation, made him curious. While there were natural matters he might not have expected her to tell him about, trips to the gynaecologist sprang to mind. He would have expected her to say, I've got a doctor's appointment, at least. The sky darkened as Strike approached Janice's house, which was considerably smaller than Irene Hickson's. It stood in a terrace. Net curtains hung at all the windows, and the front door was dark red. Strike didn't immediately register the fact that a light was shining from behind the net curtains at the sitting-room window until he was halfway across the road. When he realised that his quarry must be in, however, he successfully pushed all thoughts about his business partner out of his mind, crossed the road at a quicker pace, and knocked firmly on the front door. As he stood waiting, he heard the muffled sounds of a TV on high volume through the glass of the downstairs window. He was just considering knocking again, in case Janice hadn't heard the first time, when the door opened. In contrast to the last time they'd met, the nurse, who was wearing steel-rimmed spectacles, looked shocked and none too pleased to see Strike. From behind her, two female American voices rang out from the out-of-sight TV. So you love the bling? I love the bling. Er, uh, have I missed a message, or— Sorry for the lack of warning, said Strike, insincerely. But as I was in the area, I wondered whether you could give me a couple of minutes. Janice glanced back over her shoulder. A camp male voice was now saying, The dress that Kelly is in love with is a one-of-a-kind runway sample. Clearly disgruntled, Janice turned back to Strike. Well, all right, she said, but the place is in a mess, and can you please wipe your feet properly, because the last bloke who turned up here unannounced brought dog shit in with him. You can close the door behind you. Strike stepped over the threshold, while Janice strode out of sight into the sitting-room. Strike expected her to turn off the TV, but she didn't. While Strike wiped his feet on the coconut mat inside the door, a male voice said, This one-of-a-kind runway gown might be impossible to find, so Randy's on the search. After hesitating for a moment on the doormat, Strike decided that Janice expected him to follow her, and entered the small sitting-room. Having spent a significant part of his youth in squats with his mother, Strike had a very different idea of mess to Janice's. Although cluttered, with something on almost every surface, the only signs of actual disorder in the room were a copy of the Daily Mirror lying in one armchair, some crumpled packaging lying beside an open packet of dates on the low coffee table, and a hairdryer which was lying incongruously on the floor beside the sofa, and which Janice was currently unplugging. Antonella's pulling the closet gown to Kelly's pick, a blinged-out fifteen-thousand-dollar dress. The mirror down here is better for drying my hair, Janice explained, straightening up, pink in the face, hair dryer in her hand, and looking slightly cross, as though Strike was forcing her to justify herself. I would have appreciated some warning, you know, she added, looking as stern as such a naturally smiley-looking woman could. You caught me on the op. Strike was unexpectedly and poignantly reminded of Joan, who'd always been flustered if guests dropped in while the hoover or the ironing board was still out. Sorry. As I say, I happen to be in the area. 
even as Kelly steps into dress number one, she still can't get her dream dress off her mind, said the narrator loudly. And both Strike and Janice glanced towards the TV, where a young woman was wriggling into a clinging, semi-transparent white dress, covered in silver rhinestones. "'Say yes to the dress,' said Janice, who was wearing the same navy jumper and slacks as the last time Strike had seen her. "'My guilty pleasure. Do you want a cup of tea?' "'Only if it's no trouble,' said Strike. "'Well, it's always some trouble, in it?' Janice said, with her first glimmer of a smile. "'But I was going to make myself some at the first advert break, so you might as well have some.' "'In that case, thanks very much,' said Strike. "'If I don't find this dress,' said the camp male wedding consultant on screen, rifling urgently through the racks of white dresses, his eyebrows so sharply plucked they looked drawn on, "'it's not going to be—' The screen went blank. Janice had turned it off with her remote control. "'Want a date?' she asked Strike, holding out the box. "'No, thanks,' said Strike. "'Got boxes of them in Dubai,' she said. "'I was going to give them as presents, but I just can't stop eating them. "'Have a seat. I won't be two ticks.' "'Strike thought he caught another downward glance towards his lower legs "'as she marched out of the room, hair dryer in one hand, dates in the other, "'leaving Strike to take an armchair, which creaked beneath his weight. "'Strike found the small sitting-room oppressive. "'Predominantly red, the carpet was decorated in a scarlet swirling pattern.' on top of which lay a cheap crimson Turkish rug. Dried flower pictures hung on the red walls between old photographs, some black and white, and the coloured ones faded, displayed in wooden frames. A china cabinet was full of cheap spun glass ornaments. The largest, a Cinderella carriage pulled by six glass horses, stood in pride of place on the mantelpiece over the electric fire. Evidently, beneath Janice's no-nonsense clothing, there beat a romantic heart. She returned a few minutes later, holding a wicker-handled tray, bearing two mugs of tea with the milk already added, and a plate of chocolate hobnobs. The act of making tea seemed to have put her into slightly better humour with her guest. "'That's my Larry,' she said, catching Strike looking towards a double frame on the small side-table beside him. On one side was a sleepy-eyed, overweight man with smoker's teeth. On the other was a blonde woman, heavy but pretty. Ah, and is this? My little sister Claire. She died, ninety-seven. Pancreatic cancer. They got it late. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, said Strike. Yeah, said Janice, with a deep sigh. Lost them both around the same time. To tell you the truth, she said, as she sat down on the sofa and her knees gave audible clicks. I walked back in here after Dubai and I thought, I really need to get some new pictures up. It was depressing, coming back in here, the number of dead people. I got some gorgeous ones of Kev and the grandkids on holiday, but I haven't got them printed out yet. The lad next door's going to do it for me. All my old ones of Kev and the kids are two years out of date. I gave the boy the memory. Board, is it? Card. Card, suggested Strike. That's the one. The kids next door just laugh at me, mind you. Irene's worse than I am. She can hardly change a battery. So, she said, why do you want to see me again? Strike, who had no intention of risking an immediate rebuff, was planning to ask his questions about Satchwell last. Drawing out his notebook and opening it, he said, A couple of things that have come up since I last saw you. I asked Dr. Gupta about this first one, but he couldn't help, so I hoped you might be able to. Would you happen to know anything about a man called Niccolo Ricci? Sometimes nicknamed Mucky. Old gangster, weren't he? said Janice. I knew he lived local in Clerkenwell, but I never met him. Why'd you want... Oh, has Irene been telling you about the foundations thing? The what? said Strike. Oh, it's nothing, really. There was this rumour, back when they were doing a load of redevelopment round Clerkenwell in the early seventies, that some builders had found a body buried in concrete under one of the demolished buildings. The story was that Little Italy gangsters had hidden it there, back in the forties. But Eddie, this is Irene's Eddie, the builder she ended up marrying, that's how they met, local pub, when his firm was doing a lot of the redevelopment. Eddie told us it was all cobblers. I hadn't ever believed it. I think Irene had a bit. 
Janice added, dunking a biscuit in her tea. How does this tie in with Margot? Strike asked. Well, after Margot disappeared, there was a theory her body had been put into one of the open foundations and covered in concrete. They were still doing a bit of building round there in 74, see? Were people suggesting Ricci had killed her? Asked Strike. God, no, said Janice, with a shocked little laugh. What would Mucky Ricci have to do with Margot? It was only because of that old rumour. It put the idea in people's minds, you know, burying bodies in concrete. People can be bloody silly. My Larry said to me, he was a builder, you know. It's not like workmen wouldn't have noticed a load of fresh concrete when they turned up for work. Were you aware that Ricci attended the St. John's practice Christmas party? You what? said Janice, with her mouthful. He and another couple of men arrived towards the end of the party, possibly to escort Gloria home. They? What? Janice said, looking unaffectedly astonished. Mucky Ricci and Gloria? Come off it. Is this because... No, look, you don't want to pay no attention to Irene. Not about Gloria. Irene, she gets carried away. She never much liked Gloria, and she gets the wrong end of the stick sometimes. I never heard Gloria's family had any criminal connections. Irene watched way too many Godfather movies, said Janice. We saw the first one together at the cinema, and I went back and saw it again twice more on my own. James Kahn, you know, she sighed. My dream man. Richie was definitely at the practice party, said Strike. From what I can tell... He turned up right at the end. Well, then, I'd already left. I needed to get home to Kev. Is he still alive, Ricci? Yes, said Strike. Must be really getting on, is he? He is, said Strike. That's odd, though. What on earth would Ricci be doing at St. John's? I'm hoping to find out, said Strike, flipping over a page of his notebook. The next thing I wanted to ask you was about Joseph Brenner. You remember the family you thought might be called Applethorpe? Well, I found... You never tracked them down, said Janice, looking impressed. What was their name? Athorn. Athorn, said Janice, with an air of relief. I knew it wasn't Applethorpe. That bugged me for days after. How are they? It's fragile X they've got, isn't it? They're not in an home or... Still living together in the old flat, said Strike. And getting on reasonably well, I think. I hope they're being well supported, are they? There is a social worker involved, who seems very much on their side, which brings me to what I was going to ask you. The social worker said that since Gwilherm's death, Deborah's disclosed... Strike hesitated. Well, the way the social worker put it was that Gwilherm was, sir, uh, pimping Deborah out. He was what? said Janice the smile sliding off her face. "'It's an unpleasant idea, I know,' said Strike, unemotionally. "'When I was talking to her, Deborah told me about Dr. Brenner visiting her at home. She said he'd, uh, asked her to take her pants off.' "'No,' said Janice, in what seemed instinctive revulsion. "'No, I'm sure. No, that's not right.' That's not how it would have happened, if she needed an intimate examination. It would have happened at the surgery. You said she was agoraphobic. Well, yeah, but... So and the son said something about Dr. Brenner being a dirty old man. He... but no, it, it must have been an examination. Maybe after the baby was born. But that should have been me, the nurse. That's upset me now, said Janice, looking distressed. You think you've heard everything, but... No, that's really upset me. I mean, I was in the house that one time to see the kid, and she never said a word to me. But, of course, he was there, the father, telling me all about his bloody magic powers. She was probably too scared to... No, that's really upset me, that has. I'm sorry, said Strike, but I have to ask. Did you ever hear that Brenner used prostitutes? Ever hear any rumours about him locally? Not a word said Janice. I'd have told someone if I'd heard that. It wouldn't be ethical, not in our catchment area. All the women there were registered to our practice. She'd have been a patient. According to Talbot's notes, said Strike, 
Somebody claimed they saw Brenner in Michael Cliff House on the evening Margot disappeared. The story Brenner gave the police was that he went straight home. Michael Cliff House? That's the tower block on Skinner Street, innit? said Janice. We have patients in there, but otherwise... Janice appeared sickened. You've upset me, she said again. Him and that poor Athorn woman. And there's me defending him to all and sundry because of his experiences in the war. Not two weeks back I had Dorothy's son sitting exactly where you are now. Carl Alton was here, said Strike sharply. Yeah, said Janice. And he didn't wipe his feet, neither. Dog shit all up my old carpet. What did he want? asked Strike. Well, he pretended it was a nice catch-up, said Janice. You'd think I might not recognise him after all this time, but actually, he don't look that much different. Not really. Anyway, he sat in that chair where you are, spouting all sorts of rubbish about old times and his mum remembering me fondly. Ha! Dorothy Oakden remember me fondly. Dorothy thought Irene and me were a pair of hussies, skirts above our knees, going out to the pub together. He mentioned you, said Janice, with a beady look. Wanted to know if I'd met you yet. He wrote a book about Margot, you know, but he never made it into the shops, which he's angry about. He told me all about it when he was here. He's thinking of writing another one, and it's you what's got him interested in it. The famous detective solving a case, or the famous detective not solving a case. Either one will do for Carl. What was he saying about Brenner? asked Strike. There would be time enough later to consider the implications of an amateur biographer tramping all over the case. Said Dr. Brenner was a sadistic old man, and there I was, sort of sticking up for Dr. Brenner. But now you're telling me this about Deborah Athorn. Oakden said Brenner was sadistic, did he? That's a strong word. I thought so, too. Carl said he'd never liked him. Said Dr. Brenner used to go round Dorothy's house a lot which I never realised, for Sunday lunch and that. I always thought they were just workmates. You know, Dr Brenner probably told Carl off, that's all. He was an holy terror when he was a kid, Carl, and he comes across as the kind of man who holds a grudge. If Oakton comes round here again, said Strike, I'd advise you not to let him in. He'd done time, you know, for cunning. He just stopped himself saying old. Single women out of their money. Oh, said Janice, taken aback. Blimey, I better warn Irene. He said he was going to try her next. And he seemed primarily interested in Brenner, did he, when he came round here? Well, no, said Janice. He seemed mostly interested in you, but yeah, we talked about Brenner more than anyone else at the practice. Mrs Beatty, you wouldn't happen to still have that newspaper obituary of Brenner you mentioned. I think you said you kept it. Oh, said Janice, glancing towards the drawer at the base of her china cabinet. Yeah, Carl wanted to see that too when he heard I had it. She pushed herself out of the sofa and crossed the china cabinet. Gripping the mantelpiece to steady herself, she knelt down, opened the drawer, and began rummaging. They're all in a bit of a state, my clippings. Irene thinks I'm bonkers, me and my newspapers, she added, wrist deep in the contents of the drawer. She's never been much for the news or politics or any of that. But I've always saved interest in bits and pieces, you know. Medical things. And I won't lie, I do like a story on the royals and... She began tugging on what looked like the corner of a cardboard folder. And Irene can think it's strange all she likes, but I don't see what's wrong with saving. The story of... The folder came free. A life, said Janice, walking on her knees to the coffee table. Why is that morbid? No worse than keeping a photo? She flipped open the folder and began looking through the clippings, some of them yellow with age. See? I saved that for her, for Irene, said Janice, holding up an article about Holy Basil. Supposed to help with digestive problems. I thought Eddie could plant some in the garden for her. She takes too many pills for her bowels. They do as much harm as good. But Irene's one of those who, if it doesn't come in a tablet, she don't want to know. Princess Diana, said Janice with a sigh, flashing a commemorative front page at Strike. I was a fan. May I? asked Strike, 
reaching for a couple of pieces of newsprint. Help yourself, said Janice, looking over her spectacles at the pieces of paper in Strike's hand. That article on diabetes is very interesting. Care's changed so much since I retired. My godson's type one. I like to keep up with it all. And that'll be the thing about the kid who died of peritonitis in your other hand, is it? Yes, said Strike, looking at the clipping, which was brown with age. Yeah, said Janice darkly, still turning over bits of newspaper. He's the reason I'm a nurse. That's what put the idea in me head. He lived two doors down from me when I was a kid. I cut that out and kept it. Only photo I was ever going to have. Bored me bloody eyes out. The doctor, said Janice, with a hint of steel, was called out and he never bloody turned up. He would have come out for a middle-class kid, we all knew that. But little Johnny Marks from Bethnal Green, who cared? And the doctor was criticised but never struck off. If there's one thing I hate, it's treating people different because of where they were born. With no apparent sense of irony, she shifted more pictures of the royals out of the way, looking puzzled. Where's Dr. Brenner's thing? she muttered. Still clutching several clippings, she walked on her knees back towards the open drawer and rummaged in there again. No, it really isn't here, said Janice, returning to the coffee table. That's very odd. You don't think Oakden took it, do you? Strike suggested. Janice looked up. That cheeky sod, she said slowly. He could have bloody asked. She swept her clippings back into their folder, returned it to her drawer, used the mantelpiece to pull herself back up, knees clicking loudly again, then sat back down on the sofa with a sigh of relief and said, You know, he was always light-fingered, that boy. What makes you say that? Money went missing back at the practice. Really? said Strike. Yeah. It all come to an head after Margot disappeared. Little bits of money kept going missing and they thought it was Wilma, the cleaner. Everyone except me. I always thought it was Carl. He used to drop in after school and in the school holidays. I dropped a word in Dr. Gupta's ear, but I don't know. Probably he didn't want to upset Dorothy. And it was easier to push Wilma out. True, there were other issues with Wilma. She drank, said Janice, and her cleaning wasn't the best. She couldn't prove she never nicked it, and after there was a staff meeting about it, she resigned. She could see the way it was going. And did the theft stop? Yeah, said Janice. But so what? Carl might have thought he'd better give it a rest after nearly being found out. Strike, who tended to agree, said, Just a couple more questions. The first's about a woman called Joanna Hammond. I should know who that is, should I? She was Steve Douthwaite's girlfriend who killed herself, said Janice. Oh, yeah. Can you remember whether she was registered with the St. John's practice? No, she weren't. I think they lived over in Hoxton. So Margot wouldn't have been involved with the coroner or had any other professional connection with her death? No, she'll have been the same as me. Never knew the woman existed till she was already dead, and Steve come looking for help. I bet I know why you're asking, though, said Janice. Talbot was dead set on Steve being the Essex butcher, wasn't he? On and on about Steve and all those interviews I had with him. But honestly, Steve Douthwaite was a gentle soul. I grew up with a couple of proper violent men. Me father was one. I know the type. And Steve definitely weren't it. Remembering how endearing some women had found the apparent vulnerability of Dennis Creed, Strike merely nodded. Talbot asked whether I'd ever visited that Joanna as a nurse. I told him she wasn't a St. John's patient, but that didn't put him off. Did I think there was anything fishy about her death even so? I kept saying, I never met the woman. How do I know? I was getting worn down with it all by then, honestly, being treated like I was Gypsy Bloody Rose Lee. I told Talbot, go see what the coroner said. And you don't know whether there was a death Margot worried about, Strike asked. A death that was maybe categorised as natural or accidental, but where she thought there might have been foul play. What makes you ask that? said Janice. Just trying to clear up something Talbot left in his notes. He seemed to think Margot might have had suspicions about the way somebody died. 
You were mentioned in connection with the death. Janice's round blue eyes widened behind her glasses. Mentioned as having witnessed something or perhaps been present, Strike elaborated. There was no hint of accusation. I should bloody well hope not said Janice. No, I never witnessed nothing. I'd have said if I had, wouldn't I? There was a short pause, which Strike judged it prudent not to break, and sure enough, Janice piped up again. Look, I can't speak for Margot forty years on. She's gone, isn't she? It isn't fair on either of us. I don't want to be cast in suspicion round all these years later. I'm just trying to eliminate possible lines of inquiry, said Strike. There was a longer pause. Janice's eyes drifted over the tea tray and onto the picture of her late partner, with his stained teeth and his kind, sleepy eyes. Finally, she sighed and said, All right, but I want you to write down that this was Margot's idea, not mine, all right? I'm not accusing no one. Fair enough, said Strike, pen poised over his notebook. All right, then, well... It was very sensitive because of us working with her. Uh, Dorothy, I mean. Dorothy and Carl live with Dorothy's mother. Her name was Maud, though I wouldn't remember that if Carl hadn't been here the other day. We were talking and I mentioned his gran and he called her Bloody Maud, not Grandma or nothing. Anyway, Maud had an infection on her leg, a sore that was taking its time healing. It needed dressing and looking after. So I was visiting the house a lot. Every time I was in there, she told me she owned the house, not Dorothy. She was letting her daughter and grandson live with her. She liked saying it, you know, feeling the power. I wouldn't say she'd be much fun to live with. Sour old lady. Nothing ever right for her. She moaned a lot about her grandson being spoiled. But like I said, he was an only terror when he was younger, so I can't blame her there. Anyway said Janice. Before the sore on her leg was healed, she died after falling downstairs. Now, her walking wasn't great because she'd been laid up for a bit with this sore leg and she needed a stick. People do fall downstairs, and if you're elderly, obviously that can have serious consequences, but... Well, a week afterwards, Margot asked me into her consulting room for a word, and... Well, yeah, I got the impression Margot was maybe a bit uneasy about it. She never said anything outright, just asked me what I thought. I knew what she was saying, but what could we do? We weren't there when she fell, and the family said they was downstairs and just heard her take the tumble. And there she was at the bottom of the stairs, knocked out cold, and she died two nights later in hospital. Dorothy never showed no emotion about it. But Dorothy never did show much emotion about anything. What could we do? Janice repeated, her palms turned upwards. Obviously, I could see the way Margot's mind was working, because she knew Maud owned the house, and now Dorothy and Carl were sitting pretty and... Well, it's the kind of thing doctors consider, of course they do. It will come back on them if they've missed anything. But in the end, Margot never done nothing about it, and as far as I know, there was never any bother. There, Janice concluded, with a slight air of relief at having got this off her chest. Now you know. Thank you, said Strike, making a note. That's very helpful. Tell me, did you ever mention this to Talbot? No, said Janice, but someone else might have done. Everyone knew Maud had died and how she died, because Dorothy took a day off for the funeral. I'll be honest, by the end of all my interviews with Talbot, I just wanted to get out of there. Mostly, he wanted me to talk about me dreams. It was creepy, honestly. Weird, the old thing. I'm sure it was, said Strike. Well, there's just one more thing I wanted to ask, and then I'm done. My partner managed to track down Paul Satchwell. Oh? said Janice, with no sign of embarrassment or discomfort. Right. That was Margot's old boyfriend, wasn't it? Yes. Well, we were surprised to find out you knew each other. Janice looked at him blankly. What? That you knew each other, Strike repeated. <laughs> Me and Paul Satchwell, <laughs> said Janice with a little laugh. I've never even met the man. Really? said Strike, watching her closely, 
When he heard you told us about the sighting of Margot in Leamington's spar, he got quite angry. He said words to the effect, strike read off his notebook, that you were trying to cause trouble for him. There was a long silence. A frown line appeared between Janice's round blue eyes. At last she said, Did he mention me by name? No, said Strike. As a matter of fact, he seemed to have forgotten it. He just remembered you as the nurse. He also told Robin that you and Margot didn't like each other. He said Margot didn't like me, said Janice, with the emphasis on the last word. I'm afraid so, said Strike, watching her. But, no, sorry, that's not right, said Janice. We used to get on great. Other than that one time with Kev in his tummy. All right, I did get shirty with her then, but I knew she meant it kindly. She thought she was doing me a favour, examining him. I took offence because, well, you do get a bit defensive as a mother if you think another woman's judging you for not taking care of your kids properly. I was on my own with Kev and... You just feel it more when you're on your own. So why, Strike asked, would Satchwell say he knew you and that you wanted to get him into trouble? The silence that followed was broken by the sound of a train passing beyond the hedge. A great rushing rumble built and subsided, and the quiet of the sitting room closed like a bubble in its wake, holding the detective and the nurse in suspension as they looked at each other. I think you already know, said Janice at last. No what? Don't give me that. All them things you've solved. You're not a stupid man. I think you already know, and all this is to try and scare me into telling you. I'm certainly not trying to scare... I know you didn't like her, said Janice abruptly. Irene, don't bother pretending. I know she annoyed you. If I couldn't read people, I wouldn't have been any good at my job, going in and out of strangers' houses all the time, would I? And I was very good at my job, said Janice and somehow the remark didn't seem arrogant. Listen, you saw Irene in one of her show-off moods. She was so excited to meet you, she put on a big act. It's not easy for women living alone when they're used to company, you know. Even me coming back from Dubai, it's been a readjustment. You get used to having family around you, and then you're back in the empty house again, alone. Me, I don't mind me own company, but Irene hates it. She's been a very good friend to me, Irene, said Janice, with a kind of quiet ferocity. Very kind. She helped me out financially after Larry died, back when I had nothing. I've always been welcome in her house. We're company for each other. We go back a long way. So she might have a few airs and graces. So what? So have plenty of people. There was another brief pause. Wait there, said Janice firmly. I need to make a phone call. She got up and left the room. Strike waited. Beyond the neck curtains, the sun suddenly slid out from behind a bullet-coloured cloud and turned the glass Cinderella coach on the mantelpiece neon bright. Janice reappeared with a mobile in her hand. She's not picking up, she said, looking perturbed. She sat back down on the sofa. There was another pause. Fine, said Janice at last as though Strike had harangued her into speech. It wasn't me who knew Satchwell. It was Irene. But don't you go thinking she's done anything she shouldn't have. I mean, not in a criminal sense. It worried her like hell after. I was worried for her. Oh, God, said Janice. She took a deep breath, then said, All right, well, she was engaged to Eddie at the time. Eddie was a lot older than Irene. He worshipped the ground she walked on, and she loved him too. She did, said Janice, though Strike hadn't contradicted her. And she was really jealous if Eddie so much as looked at anyone else. But she always liked to drink in a flirt, Irene. It was harmless, mostly harmless. That bloke Satchwell had a band, didn't he? That's right, said Strike. Yeah, well, Irene saw him play at some pub. I wasn't with her the night she met Satchwell. I never knew a thing about it till after Margot had gone missing. So, she watched Satchwell and, well, she fancied him. And after the band had finished, she sees Satchwell come into the bar and he goes right to the back of the room to Margot, who's standing there in the corner in her raincoat. Irene thought Satchwell must have seen her from the stage. 
Irene hadn't spotted Margot before, because she was up the front with her friends. Anyway, she watched them, and Satchwo and Margot had a short chat. Really short, Irene said, and it looked like it turned into an argument. And then Irene reckoned Margot spotted her, and that's when Margot walked out. So then Irene goes up to that Satchwo and tells him she loved the band and everything, and, well, one thing led to another, and... Yeah. Why would Satchwo think she was a nurse? asked Strike. Janice grimaced. Well, to tell you the truth, that's what the silly girl used to tell blokes she was when they was chatting her up. She used to pretend to be a nurse because the fellas liked it. As long as they knew naff all about medical stuff, she managed to fool them because she'd heard the names of drugs and all that at work. Though she got most of them wrong. Gold lover, said Janice, with a small eye roll. So this was a one-night stand, or... No. It was a two-, three-week thing, but it didn't last. Margot disappearing, well, that put the kibosh on it, you can imagine. But for a couple of weeks there, Irene was infatuated, I suppose you'd say. She did love Eddie, you know. It was a bit of a feather in her cap to have this older man, Eddie, successful business and everything, wanting to marry her, but... It's funny, isn't it? said Janice quietly. We're all animals when you take everything else away. She totally lost her head over Paul Satchwell, just for a few weeks, trying to see him as much as she could, sneaking around. I bet she scared the life out of him, actually, said Janice soberly, because from what she told me later, I think he only took her to bed to spite Margot. Margot was who he really wanted, and Irene realised that too late. She'd been used. So the story of Irene's sore tooth said Strike, which then became the story of a shopping trip. Yeah, said Janice quietly. She was with Satchwell that afternoon. She took the receipt off her sister to use with the police. I never knew till afterwards. I had her in floods of tears in my flat, pouring her heart out. Well, who else could she tell? Not Eddie or her parents. She was terrified of it coming out and losing Eddie. She'd woken up by then. All she wanted was Eddie, and she was scared he'd drop her if he found out about Satchwell. See, Satchwell as good as told Irene the last time they met. He was using her to get back at Margot. He'd been angry at Margot for saying she'd only come to watch the band out of curiosity, and for getting shirty when he tried to persuade her to go back to his flat. He gave her that little wooden Viking thing, you know. He had it on him, hoping she'd turn up, and I think he thought she'd just melt or something when he did that, and that'd be the end of Roy. Like that's all it takes to walk out on a kid in a marriage, a little wooden doll. He said some nasty stuff about Margot to Irene. Prick tease was the least of it. Anyway, after Margot went missing and the police got called in, Satchwell rings Irene up and says not to mention anything he'd said about being angry at Margot. And she begged him never to tell anyone about the both of them. And that's how they left it. And I was the only one who knew. And I kept me mouth shut too, because, well, that's what you do when it's a friend, isn't it? So when Charlie Ramage said he'd seen Margot in Leamington Spar, said Strike, were you aware? That that's where Satchwell came from. Not then I wasn't. Not when Charlie first told me. But not long after, there was a news story about some old geezer in Leamington Spa what had put up a sign in his front garden. Whites united against coloured invasion, or some such horrible thing. Me and Larry was out for dinner with Eddie and Irene, and Eddie's talking about this old racist in the news. And then, when Irene and I went to the loo, she says to me, Leamington Spa, that's where Paul Satchwell was from. She hadn't mentioned him to me in ages. I won't lie, it gave me a proper uncomfortable feeling, her uh, telling me that, because I thought, oh my God, what if Charlie really did see Margot? What if Margot ran off to be with her ex? But then I thought, hang on, no. If Margot only went as far as Leamington Spa, how come she hasn't never been seen since? I mean, it's hardly Timbuktu, is it? No, said Strike, it isn't. And is all that Irene's ever told you about Margot and Satchwell? It's enough, innit? said Janice. 
Her pink and white complexion seemed more faded than when Strike had arrived, the veins beneath her eyes darker. Look, don't give Irene our time, please. She don't seem it, but she's soft under all that silly stuff. She worries, you know. I can't see why I'd have to give her a hard time, said Strike. Well, you've been very helpful, Mrs. Beatty, thank you. That clears up quite a few points for me. Janice slumped backwards on the sofa, frowning at Strike. You smoke, don't you? she said abruptly. I can smell it off you. Didn't they stop you smoking after you had that amputation? They tried, said Strike. Very bad for you, she said. Won't help with your mobility, either, as you get older. Bad for your circulation and your skin. You should quit. I know I should, said Strike, smiling at her as he returned his notebook to his pocket. Hmm, said Janice, her eyes narrowed. Happened to be in the area. My Aunt Fanny. Chapter 51 Never think that so that monster can be mastered or destroyed. He is not, ah, he is not such a foe as steel can wound or strength can overthrow. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen The domed turret of the Tower of London rose behind the wall of dirty yellow brick, but Robin had no attention to spare for ancient landmarks. Not only was the meeting she'd set up without Strike's knowledge supposed to start in thirty minutes' time, she was miles from where she'd expected to be at one o'clock, and completely unfamiliar with this part of London. She ran with her mobile in her hand, glancing intermittently at the map on its screen. Within a few paces, the phone rang. Seeing that it was Strike, she answered the call. Oi, just seen Janice. Oh, good, said Robin trying not to pant as she scanned her surroundings for either a tube sign or a taxi. Anything interesting? Plenty, said Strike, who was strolling back along Nightingale Grove. Notwithstanding his recent exchange with the nurse, he just lit a Benson and Hedges. As he walked into the cool breeze, the smoke was snatched from his lips every time he exhaled. Where are you at the moment? Tower Bridge Road, said Robin, still running, still looking around in vain for a tube sign. Thought you were on shift as boss this morning. I was, said Robin. It was probably best that Strike knew immediately what had just happened. I've just left him on Tower Bridge with Barclay. When you say with Barclay, they might be talking by now, I don't know, said Robin. Unable to talk normally while jogging, she slowed to a fast walk. Cormoran, S.B. looked as though he was thinking of jumping. Off Tower Bridge? asked Strike, surprised. Why not Tower Bridge? said Robin, as she rounded a corner onto a busy junction. It was the nearest accessible high structure. But his office isn't anywhere near. He got off at Monument as usual, but he didn't go into work. He looked up at the office for a bit, then walked away. I thought he was just stretching his legs. But then he headed out onto Tower Bridge and stood there, staring down at the water. Robin had spent forty anxious minutes watching S.B. stare down at the cement-coloured river below, his briefcase hanging limply by his side, while traffic rumbled along the bridge behind him. She doubted that Strike could imagine how nerve-wracking she'd found the wait for Barclay to come and relieve her. There was still no sign of a tube station. Robin broke into a jog again. I thought of approaching him, she said, but I was worried I'd startle him into jumping. You know how big he is. I couldn't have held him back. You really think he was— Yes, said Robin, trying not to sound triumphant. She just caught sight of a circular red tube sign through a break in the traffic and started running. He looked utterly hopeless. Are you running? asked Strike, who could now hear her feet hitting the ground, even over the growl of traffic. Yes, said Robin, and then, I'm late for a dental appointment. She'd regretted not coming up with a solid reason earlier for not being able to interview Janice Beatty, and had decided on this story, should Strike ask again. Ah, said Strike, right. Anyway, Robin said, weaving around passers-by, Barclay arrived to take over. He agreed S.B. looked like he was thinking of jumping, and he said— She was developing a stitch in her side now. Said he'd go and try and talk to him, and that's when I left. At least Barclay's big enough to hold him back if he tries anything, she finished breathlessly. But it also means S.B. will recognise Barclay in future, 
Strike pointed out. Well, yeah, I know that, said Robin, slowing to a walk again as she was almost at the underground steps, and massaging the stitch in her side. But given that we thought he might be about to kill himself— Understood, said Strike, who had paused in the shadow of Hithergreen Station to finish his cigarette. Just thinking logistics. Of course, if we're lucky, he might spill the beans to Barclay about what shift he's got on him. Desperate men are sometimes willing to— Cormoran, I'm going to have to go, said Robin, who'd reached the underground entrance. I'll see you back at the office after my appointment, and you can fill me in about Janice. Right you are, said Strike. Hope it doesn't hurt. What doesn't hurt? Oh, the dentist knows just to check up, said Robin. Really convincing, Robin, she thought, angry at herself, as she shoved her mobile back into her pocket and ran down the steps into the underground. Once on the train, she stripped off her jacket because she was sweating from running and neatened her hair with the aid of her reflection in the dirty dark window opposite her. Between S.B. and his possible suicidal ideation, lying to strike, a feeble cover story, and the potential risks of the meeting she was about to have, she felt jittery. There'd been another occasion, a couple of years previously, when Robin had chosen to pursue a line of inquiry while keeping it secret from Strike. It had resulted in Strike sacking her. This is different, she tried to reassure herself, smoothing sweaty strands of hair off her forehead. He won't mind, as long as it works. It's what he wants, too. She emerged at Tottenham Court Road Station twenty minutes later, and hurried with her jacket over her shoulder into the heart of Soho. Only when she was approaching the Star Café and saw the sign over the door did she register the coincidence of the name. Trying not to think about asteroids, horoscopes, or omens, Robin entered the café where round wooden tables stood on a red brick floor. The walls were decorated with old-fashioned tin signs, one of which was advertising Robin cigarettes. Directly beneath this, perhaps deliberately, sat an old man wearing a black windsheeter, his face ruddy with broken veins, and his thick grey hair oiled into a quiff that had the appearance of not having changed since the fifties. A walking stick was propped against the wall beside him. On his other side sat a teenage girl with long neon yellow hair who was texting on her phone and didn't look up until Robin had approached their table. "'Mr. Tucker,' said Robin. "'Yeah?' said the man hoarsely, revealing crooked brown teeth. "'Miss Ellicott?' "'Robin,' she said, smiling as they shook hands. "'This is my granddaughter, Lauren,' said Tucker. "Aya," said Lauren, glancing up from her phone, then back down again. "'I'll just get myself a coffee,' said Robin. Can I buy either of you anything? They declined. While Robin bought herself a flat white, she sensed the eyes of the old man on her. During their only previous conversation, which had been by phone, Brian Tucker had talked for a quarter of an hour without pause about the disappearance of his eldest daughter Louise in 1972 and his lifelong quest to prove that Dennis Creed had murdered her. Roy Phipps had called Tucker half insane. While Robin wouldn't have gone that far on the evidence to date, there was no doubt that he seemed utterly consumed by Creed, and with his quest for justice. When Robin returned to the Tucker's table and sat down with her coffee, Lauren put her phone away. Her long neon extensions, the unicorn tattoo on her forearm, her blatantly false eyelashes and her chipped nail varnish, all stood in contrast to the innocent, dimpled face, just discernible beneath her aggressively applied contouring. I came to help Grandad, she told Robin. He doesn't walk so well these days. She's a good girl, said Tucker. Very good girl. Well, thanks very much for meeting me, Robin told both of them. I really appreciate it. Close to, Tucker's swollen nose had a strawberry-like appearance, flecked as it was with blackheads. No, I appreciate it, Miss Ellicott, he said in his low, hoarse voice. I think they're really going to let it happen this time, I do. And like I said on the phone, if they don't, I'm ready to break into the television studio. Well, said Robin, hopefully we won't need to do anything that dress. And I've told them that, and it's shaking them up. Well, that and your contact nudge in the Ministry of Justice, he conceded, gazing at Robin through small bloodshot eyes. Mind you, I'm starting to think I should have threatened them with a press years ago. 
You don't get anywhere with these people playing by the rules. They just fob you off with their bureaucracy and their so-called expert opinions. I can only imagine how difficult it's been for you, said Robin. But given that we might be in with a chance to interview him, we don't want to do anything. I'll have justice for Louise if it kills me, said Tucker. Let them arrest me. It will just mean more publicity. But we wouldn't want... She don't want you to do nothing silly, Grandad, said Laura. She don't want you to mess things up. No, I won't, I won't, said Tucker. His eyes were small, flecked and almost colourless, set in pouches of purple. But this might be our one and only chance, so it must be done in the right way, and by the right interrogator. Is he not coming? said Lauren. Cormor and Strike. Grandad said he might be coming. No, said Robin. And seeing the Tucker's face fall, she added quickly, He's on another case just now, but anything you'd say to Cormoran you can say to me as his part. It's got to be him who interviews Creed, Tucker said. Not you. I under... No, love, you don't, said Tucker firmly. This has been my whole life. I understand Creed better than any of the morons who've written books about him. I've studied him. He's been cut off from any kind of attention for years now. Your boss is a famous man. Creed'll want to meet him. Creed'll think he's clever, of course he will. He'll want to beat your boss. Want to come out of it on top. But the temptation of seeing his name in the papers again. He's always thrived on the publicity. I think he'll be ready to talk, as long as your boss can make him believe it's worth his while. He's kosher, your boss, is he? Under almost any other circumstances, Robin would have said, He's actually my partner. But today, understanding what she was being asked, she said, Yes, he's kosher. Yeah, I thought he seemed it. I thought so, said Brian Tucker. When your contact got in touch, I went online. I looked it all up. Impressive, what he's done. He doesn't give interviews, does he? No, said Robin. I like that, said Tucker, nodding. In it for the right reasons. But the name's known now. And that'll appeal to Creed, and so will the fact your boss has had contact with famous people. Creed likes all that. I've told the Ministry of Justice, and I told your contact, I want this strike to do it. I don't want the police interviewing him. They've had their go, and we all know how well that went. And no more bloody psychiatrists, thinking they're so smart and they can't even agree on whether the bastard's sane or not. I know Creed. I understand Creed. I've made a lifelong study of his psychology. I was there every day in court during the trial. They didn't ask him about Lou in court. Not by name. But he made eye contact with me. Plenty of times. He'll have recognised me. He'll have known who I was because Lou was my spitting image. When they asked him in court about the jewellery, you know, about the pendant, Lou's pendant, Yes, said Robin. She got it a couple of days before she disappeared. Showed it to her sister, Liz, Lauren's mother, didn't she? He asked Lauren, who nodded. A butterfly on a chain, nothing expensive. And because it was mass-produced, the police said it could have been anyone's. Liz remembered the pendant differently. That's what threw the police off. She wasn't sure at first that it was Lou's. But she admitted she only saw it briefly. And when they mentioned the jewellery, Creed looked straight at me. He knew who I was. Lou was my spit image, repeated Tucker. You know his explanation for having a stash of jewellery under the floorboards? Yes, said Robin. He said he'd bought it because he liked to cross-dress. That he bought it, said Tucker, talking over Robin, to dress up in. Mr. Tucker, you said on the phone... Lou nicked it from that shop they all used to go to. What was it? Bieber, said Lauren. Bieber, said Tucker. Two days before she disappeared, she played truant, and that evening she showed Lauren's mum, Liz, what she'd stolen. She was a handful, Lou. Didn't get on with my second wife. The girl's mum died when Lou was ten. It affected Lou the worst, more than the other two. She never liked my second wife. He told Robin all of this on the phone, but still she nodded sympathetically. My wife had a row with Lou the morning before she disappeared. 
and Lou bunked off school again. We didn't realise until she didn't come home that night. Rang round all her friends. None of them had seen her, so we called the cops. We found out later one of her friends had lied. She'd smuggled Lou upstairs and not told her parents. Lou was spotted three times next day, still in her school uniform. Last known sighting was outside a laundrette in Kentish Town. She asked some geezer for a light. We knew she'd started smoking. That was partly what she railed with my wife about. Creed picked up Vera Kenny in Kentish Town too, said Tucker hoarsely. In 1970, right after he'd moved into the place by Paradise Park. Vera was the first woman he took back to that basement. He chained them up, you know, and kept them alive while he... Grandad, said Lauren plaintively. Don't. No, Tucker muttered, dipping his head. Sorry, love. Mr. Tucker, said Robin, seizing her chance. You said on the phone you had information about Margot Bamber and nobody else knows. Yeah, said Tucker, groping inside his windcheater for a wad of folded papers, which he unfolded with shaking hands. This top one I got through a walder at Wakefield back in 79. I used to hang around there every weekend in the late seventies, watch them all coming in and out, found out where they liked to drink and everything. Anyway, this particular walder, I won't say his name, but we got chummy. Creed was on a high security wing in a single cell, because all the other cons wanted to take a pop at him. One geezer nearly took out Creed's eye in 82, stole a spoon from the canteen and sharpened the handle to a point in his cell, tried to stab Creed through the eyeball, just missed because Creed dodged. My mate told me he'd screamed like a little girl, said Tucker, with relish. Anyway, I sent to my mate. I said, anything you can find out, anything you can tell me. Things Creed saying, hints he gives, you know. I paid him for it. He could have lost his job if anyone had found out. And my mate got hold of this and smuggled it out to me. I've never been able to admit to having it because both of us would be in trouble if it got out. But I called up Margot Bamber's husband. What was his name? Roy Phipps. Roy Phipps, yeah. I said, I've got a bit of Creed's writing here you're going to want to see. It proves he killed your wife. A contemptuous smile revealed Tucker's toffee brown teeth again. But he didn't want to know, said Tucker. Phipps thought I was a crank. A year after I called him, I read in a paper he'd married the nanny. Creed did Dr. Phipps a good turn, it seems. Grandad, said Lauren, shocked. All right, all right, muttered Tucker. I never liked that doctor. He could have done us a lot of good if he wanted to. Hospital consultant. He was the kind of man the Home Secretary would have listened to. We could have kept up the pressure if he'd helped us, but he wasn't interested. And when I saw he was off with a nanny, I thought, oh, right, everything's explained. Could I? Robin began, gesturing towards the paper Tucker was still holding flat to the table, but he ignored her. So it was just me and Jerry for years, said Tucker. Jerry Wolfson, Cara's brother. You know who that is. He shot at Robin. Yes, the nightclub hostess. Nightclub hostess, hooker on the side, and a drug habit as well. Jerry had no illusions about her. He wasn't naive. But it was still his sister. She raised him after their mother left. Kara was all the family he had. February 1973, three months after my Lou, Kara disappeared as well. Left her club in Soho in the early hours of the morning. Another girl left at exactly the same time. It wasn't far from here, as a matter of fact, said Tucker, pointing out of the door. The two girls go different ways up the street. The friend looks back and sees Kara bending down and talking to a van driver at the end of the road. The friend assumed that Kara knew the driver. She walks off. Kara's never seen again. Jerry spoke to all Kara's friends at the club after, but nobody knew anything. There was a rumour going round after Kara disappeared that she'd been a police informer. That club was run by a couple of gangland figures. Suited them to say she was an informer, see? Scared the other girls into keeping stum about anything they'd seen or heard in the club. But Jerry never believed Kara was a snitch. He thought it was the Essex Butcher from the start. The van was the giveaway. So we joined forces. 
He tried to get permission to visit Creed, same as me, but the authorities wouldn't let us. Jerry gave up in the end, drank himself to death. Something like this happens to someone you love, it marks you. You can't get out from under it. The weight of it crushes some people. My marriage broke up. My other two daughters didn't speak to me for years. Wanted me to stop going on about Lou. Stop talking about Creed. Pretend it never. That's not fair, Grandad, said Lauren sternly. Yeah, all right, mumbled Tucker. All right, I grant you. Lauren's mum. She's come round lately. I said to Liz, think of all the time I should have spent with Lou, like I've spent with you and Lisa. Add it all up. Family meals and holidays. Helping her with her own work. Telling her to clean her room. Arguing with her. My God, she could be bolshy. Watching her graduate, I expect, because she was clever, Lou, even if she did get in trouble at school with all the bunking off. I said to Liz, I never got to walk her up the aisle, did I? Never got to visit her in hospital when her kids were born. Add up all the time I would have given her if she'd lived. Tucker faltered. Lauren put a plump hand over her grandfather's, which had swollen purple joints. At all that time together, Tucker croaked, his eyes filled me with tears. And that's what I owe her, to find out what happened to her. That's all I'm doing, giving her a due. Robin felt tears prickle behind her own eyelids. I'm so sorry, she said quietly. Yeah, well, said Tucker, wiping his eyes and nose roughly on the sleeve of his windcheater. He now took the top sheet of writing and thrust it at Robin. There you are. That shows you what we're up against. Robin took the paper, on which was written two short paragraphs, in clear, slanting writing, every letter separate and distinct, and began to read. She attempts to control through words and sometimes with flattery. Tells me how clever I am, then talks about treatment. The strategy is laughably transparent. Her qualifications and her training are, compared to my self-knowledge, my self-awareness, the flicker of a damp match beside the light of the sun. She promises a diagnosis of madness will mean gentler treatment for me. This she tells me between screams as I whip her face and breasts. Bleeding, she begs me to see that she could be of use to me, would testify for me. Her arrogance and her thirst for dominance have been fanned by the societal approval she gained from the position of doctor. Even chained, she believes herself superior. This belief will be corrected. You see, said Tucker in a fierce whisper, he had Margot Bamber chained in his basement. He's enjoying writing about it, reliving it. But the psychiatrists didn't think it was an admission. They reckon Creed was just turning out these bits of writing to try and draw more attention to himself. They said it was all a game to try and get more interviews, because he liked pitting his wits against the police and reading about himself in the press, seeing himself on the news. They said that was just a bit of fantasy, and that taking it seriously would give Creed what he wanted, because talking about it would turn him on. Gross, said Lauren, under her breath. But my Walder mate said, because, you know, there was three women they thought Creed had done whose bodies were never found. My Lou, Cara Wolfson and Margot Bamborough. And my Walder mate said, it was the doctor he really liked being asked about. Creed likes high status people, see. He thinks he could have been the boss of some multinational or some professor or something if he hadn't have turned to kill him. My mate told me all this. He said... Creed sees himself on that sort of level, you know, just in a different field. Robin said nothing. The impact of what she'd just read wasn't easily dispelled. Margot Bambara had become real to Robin, and she'd just been forced to imagine her, brutalised and bleeding, attempting to persuade a psychopath to spare her life. Creed got transferred to Belmarsh in 83, Tucker continued patting the papers still laid in front of him, and Robin forced herself to concentrate. And they started drugging him so he couldn't get a... you know, couldn't maintain. And that's when I got permission to write to him, and have him write back to me. 
Ever since he was convicted, I've been lobbying the authorities to let me question him directly and let him write back. I wore them down in the end. I had to swear I'd never publicise what he wrote me or give the letters to the press. But I'm the only member of a victim's family he's ever been allowed direct contact with. And there, he said, turning the next two sheets of paper towards Robin, that's what I got back. The letter was written on prison writing paper. There was no, dear Mr. Tucker. Your letter reached me three weeks ago, but I was placed in solitary confinement shortly afterwards and deprived of writing materials, so have been unable to answer. Ordinarily I'm not permitted to respond to inquiries like yours, but I gather your persistence has worn the authorities down. Unlikely as it may seem, I admire you for this, Mr. Tucker. Resilience in the face of adversity is one of my own defining characteristics. During my three weeks of enforced solitude, I've wondered how I could possibly explain to you what not one man in ten thousand might hope to understand. Although you think I must be able to recall the names, faces, and personalities of my various victims, my memory shows me only the many-limbed, many-breasted monster with whom I cavorted, a foul-smelling thing that gave tongue to pain and misery. Ultimately, my monster was never much of a companion, though there was a fascination in its contortions. Given sufficient stimulus, it could be raised to an ecstasy of pain, and then it knew it lived, and stood tremulously on the edge of the abyss, begging, screaming, pleading for mercy. How many times did the monster die, then live again? Too few to satisfy me. Even though its face and voice mutated, its reactions never varied. Richard Meriden, my old psychiatrist, gave what possessed me other names, but the truth is that I was in the grip of a divine frenzy. Colleagues of Meriden's disputed his conclusion that I'm sane. Regrettably, their opinions were dismissed by the judge. In conclusion, I might have killed your daughter, or I might not. Either I did so in the grip of some madness which still occludes my memory, and which a more skilful doctor might yet penetrate, or I never met her, and little Louise is out there somewhere, laughing at her daddy's attempts to find her, or perhaps enduring a different hell to the one in which my monster lived. Doubtless the additional psychiatric support available at Broadmoor would help me recover as much memory as possible. For their own inscrutable reasons, however, the authorities prefer to keep me here at Belmarsh. Only this morning I was threatened under the noses of warders. Regardless of the obvious fact that a cachet attaches to anyone who attacks me, I'm exposed, daily, to intimidation and physical danger. How anyone expects me to regain sufficient mental health to assist please further is a mystery. Exceptional people ought to be studied only by those who can appreciate them. Rudimentary analysis, such as I've been subjected to thus far, merely entrenches my inability to recollect all that I did. Maybe you, Mr. Tucker, can help me. Until I'm in a hospital environment where I can be given the assistance I require, what incentive do I have to dredge my fragmented memory for details that may help you discover what happened to your daughter? My safety is being compromised on a daily basis. My mental faculties are being degraded. You will naturally be disappointed not to receive confirmation of what happened to Louise. Be assured that, when the frenzy is not upon me, I am not devoid of human sympathy. Even my worst critics concede that I actually understand others much more easily than they understand me. For instance, I can appreciate what it would mean to you to recover Louise's body and give her the funeral you so desire. On the other hand, my small store of human empathy is being rapidly depleted by the conditions in which I am currently living. Recovery from the last attack upon me, which nearly removed my eye, was delayed due to the refusal of the authorities to let me attend a civilian hospital. Evil men forfeit the right to fair treatment. Such seems to be the public's view. However, brutality breeds brutality. Even the most dim-witted psychiatrists agree there. Do you have a merciful soul, Mr. Tucker? If so, the first letter you'll write upon receiving this will be to the authorities, requesting that the remainder of my sentence will be served in Broadmoor, 
where the secrets my unruly memory still holds may be coaxed to the surface at last. Ever yours, Dennis. Robin finished reading and looked up. You can't see it, can you? said Tucker, with an oddly hungry expression. No, of course you can't. It isn't obvious. I didn't see it myself at first. Nor did the prison authorities. They were too busy warning me they weren't going to transfer him to Broadmoor, so I needn't ask. He jabbed the bottom of the letter with a yellow-nailed finger. The clues there. Last line. First letter. My sentence. Put together the first letter of every sentence and see what you get. Robin did as she was bidden. Y O U R D A U G H T E R. Robin read out loud, until fearing where the message was going to end, she fell silent until she reached the last sentence, when the taste of milky coffee seemed to turn rancid in her mouth. And she said, Oh, God. The message in full read, Your daughter cried for her mummy before she died. What's it say? asked Lauren, frowning and straining to see. Never you mind, said Tucker shortly, taking the letter back. There you are, he told Robin, folding up the papers and shoving them back into his inside pocket. Now you see what he is. He killed Lou like he killed your doctor, and he's gloating about it. Before Robin could say anything, Tucker spun his next piece of paper to face her, and she saw a photocopied map of Islington, with a circle inked around what looked like a large house. Now, he said, there are two places nobody's ever looked, where I think he might have hid bodies. I've been back over everywhere what had a connection with him, kid or adult. Police checked all the obvious, flats he'd lived in and that, but never bothered with these. When Lou disappeared in November 72, he wouldn't have been able to bury her in Epping Forest because... They just found Vera Kenny's body there, said Robin. Tucker looked grudgingly impressed. You do your own work at the agency, don't you? Yeah, exactly. There was still a police presence in the forest at the time. But see that there, said Tucker tapping on the marked building. That's a private house now, but in the seventies it was the Archer Hotel. And guess who used to do their laundry? Creed's dry cleaners. He used to pick up stuff from them once a week in his van and bring it back again, sheets and bedspreads and what have you. Anyway, after he was arrested, the woman who owned the Archer Hotel gave a quote to the mail, saying he always seemed so nice and polite, always chatty when he saw her. That isn't marked on modern maps, said Tucker, now moving his finger to a cross marked in the grounds of the property. But it's on the old deeds. There's a well at the back of that property, just a shaft into the ground that collects rainwater, predated the current building. I tracked down the owner in 89 after she'd sold up. She told me the well was boarded up in her time and she planted bushes round it because she didn't want no kid going down it accidental. But Creed used to go through that garden to deliver laundry, right past the place where the well was. He'll have known it was there. She couldn't remember telling him, said Tucker quickly, forestalling Robin's question, but that's neither here nor there, is it? She wasn't going to remember every word they said to her, was she, after all that time? Dead or night, Creed could have pulled up a van by the rear entrance, gone in through the back gate, and by the time I realised all this, said Tucker, gritting his brown teeth in frustration, the archer had gone back to being a private property, and now there's been a bloody conservatory built over the old well. Don't you think, said Robin cautiously, when they built over it they might have noticed. Why would they? said Tucker aggressively. I never knew a builder who went looking for work when he could just slap concrete over it. Anyway, Creed's not stupid. He'd have thrown rubbish down there on top of the body, wouldn't he? Cover it up. So that's a possibility, he said firmly. And then you got this. Tucker's last piece of paper was a second map. That there, he said, tapping his swollen knuckled finger on another circled building. 
is Dennis Creed's great-grandmother's house. It's mentioned in The Demon of Paradise Park. Creed said in one of his interviews, the only time he ever saw countryside when he was a kid was when he got taken there. Then look here, said Tucker, pointing on a large patch of green. The house backs right onto Great Church Wood. Acres of woodland, acres and acres. Creed knew the way there. He had a van. He'd played in those woods as a child. We know he chose Epping Forest for most of the bodies, because he had no known connection with the place. But by 75, police were regularly checking Epping Forest by night, weren't they? But here's a different wood he knows, and it's not so far away from London, and Creed's got his van and his spades ready in the back. My best guess, said Tucker, is my Lou and your dock are in the well or in the woods, and they've got different technology now to what they had in the 70s, ground-penetrating radar and what have you. It wouldn't be difficult to see if there was a body in either of those places, not if the will was there. But, said Tucker, sweeping the two maps off the table and folding them up with his shaking hands, there's no will. Or well, there hasn't been, not for years. Nobody in authority cares. They think it's all over. They think Creed will never talk. So that's why it's got to be your boss who interviews him. I wish it could be me, said Tucker. But you've seen what Creed thought I was worth. As Tucker slid his papers back inside his windsheeter, Robin became aware that the cafe around them had filled up during their conversation. At the nearest table sat three young men, all with amusingly Edwardian beards. So long attuned only to Tucker's low, hoarse voice, Robin's ears seemed suddenly full of noise. She felt as though she'd suddenly been transported from the distant past into a brash and indifferent present. What would Margot Bamborough, Louise Tucker, and Cara Wolfson make of the mobile phones in almost every hand, or the sound of Pharrell Williams's happy now playing somewhere nearby, or the young woman carrying a coffee back from the counter, her hair in high bunches, wearing a T-shirt that read, Go fuck your selfie. Don't cry, Grandad, said yellow-haired Lauren softly, putting her arm around her grandfather as a fat tear rolled down his swollen nose and fell upon the wooden table. Now that he'd stopped talking about Louise and Creed, he seemed to have become smaller. It's affected our whole family. Lauren told Robin. Mum and Auntie Lisa are always scared if me and my cousins go out after dark. Quite right, said Tucker, who was now mopping his eyes on his sleeve again. And all us grew up knowing it's something that can really happen, you know, said the innocent-faced Lauren. People really do disappear. They really do get murdered. Yes, said Robin. I know. She reached across the table and briefly gripped the old man's forearm. We'll do everything we can, Mr. Tucker. I promise. I'll be in touch. As she left the cafe, Robin was aware that she'd just spoken for Strike, who knew absolutely nothing of the plan to interview Creed, let alone to try and find out what had happened to Louise Tucker. But she had no energy left to worry about that just now. Robin drew her jacket more closely around her and walked back to the office, her thoughts consumed by the terrible vacuum left in the wake of the vanished. Chapter 52 Oft fire is without smoke. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen It was one o'clock in the morning, and Strike was driving towards Stoke Newington to relieve Robin, who was currently keeping watch over the terraced house that Shifter's boss was again visiting, and where he was almost certainly indulging in another bout of the blackmailable behaviour Shifty had somehow found out about. Even though Shifty's hold on his boss had driven the latter onto Tower Bridge, S.B. didn't appear able or willing to give up whatever it was he was doing inside the house of Eleanor Dean. The night was crisp and clear, although the stars overhead were only dimly visible from brightly lit Essex Road, and Barclay's voice was currently issuing from the speaker of the BMW. A week had passed since a Scot had managed to persuade S.B. to leave Tower Bridge and get a coffee with him. He cannot help himself, the poor bastard. Clearly, said Strike. This is his third visit in ten days. 
He said to me, I can't stop. Says it relieves his stress. How does he square that with the fact he's suicidal? It's a blackmail that's making him suicidal strike, not whatever he gets up to in Stoughton Newington. And he didn't give any indication what he does in there. I told you. He said he doesn't he shagger, but that his wife will leave him if he gets out. Could be rubber, added Barclay, thoughtfully. What? Rubber, repeated Barclay. Like that guy we had who liked wearing latex to work under his suit. Oh, yeah, said Strike. I forgot about him. The various sexual predilections of their clients often blurred in Strike's memory. He could hear the hum of the casino in the background. Shifter had been in there for hours, and Barclay had been keeping him company, unnoticed, from across the floor. Anyway, said Barclay, you want me to stay here, do you, because it's costing a small fortune, and you say the client's getting pissy about how much we're charging? I could watch when the slimy bastard leaves from outside on the street. No, stay on him, keep photographing him, and try and get something incriminating, said Strike. Shift his coke out of his head, said Barclay. Half his colleagues will be cokeheads as well. We're going to need something worse than that to nail the bastard for blackmailing people onto high bridges. You're going soft, Strike. Just try and get something on the fucker and don't place large bets. It's not the gambling that'll bankrupt us, said Barclay. It's the drinks. He hung up, and Strike wound down the window and lit a cigarette, trying to ignore the pain in his stiff neck and shoulders. Like S.B., Strike could have used a respite from life's problems and challenges, but such outlets were currently non-existent. Over the past year, Joan's illness had taken from him that small sliver of time that wasn't given over to work. Since his amputation, he no longer played any kind of sport. He saw friends infrequently due to the demands of the agency and derived many more headaches than pleasures from his relatives, who were being particularly troublesome just now. Tomorrow was Easter Sunday, meaning that Joan's family would be gathering together in St. Moore's to scatter her ashes at sea. Quite apart from the mournful event itself, Strike wasn't looking forward to yet another long journey to Cornwall, or to further enforced contact with Lucy, who'd made it clear over the course of several phone calls that she was dreading this final farewell. Again and again she returned to her sadness at not having a grave to visit, and Strike detected an undertone of blame as though she thought Strike ought to have overruled Joan's dying wishes. Lucy had also expressed disappointment that Strike wasn't coming down for the whole weekend, as she and Greg were, and added bluntly that he'd better remember to bring Easter eggs for all three of his nephews, not just Jack. Strike could have done without transporting three fragile chocolate eggs all the way to Truro on the train, with a hold all to manage and his leg sore from days and weeks of non-stop work. To compound his stress, both his unknown half-sister Prudence and his half-brother Al had started texting him again. His half-sibling seemed to imagine that Strike, having enjoyed a moment of necessary catharsis by shouting at Ropey over the phone, was probably regretting his outburst and more amenable to attending his father's party to make up. Strike hadn't answered any of their texts, but he'd experienced them as insect bites, determined not to scratch they were nevertheless the source of a niggling aggravation. Overhanging every other worry was the Bamborough case, which, for all the hours he and Robin were putting into it, was proving as opaque as it had when they'd first agreed to tackle the forty-year-old mystery. The year's deadline was coming ever closer, and nothing resembling a breakthrough had yet occurred. If he was honest, Strike had low hopes of the interview with Wilma Bayliss's daughters, which he and Robin would be conducting later that morning, before Strike boarded the train to Truro. All in all, as he drove towards the house of the middle-aged woman for whom S.B. seemed to feel such an attraction, Strike had to admit he felt a glimmer of sympathy for any man in desperate search of what the detective was certain was some form of sexual release. Recently it had been brought home to Strike that the relationships he'd had since leaving Charlotte, casual though they'd been, had been his only unalloyed refuge from the job. His sex life had been moribund since Joan's diagnosis of cancer. All those lengthy trips to Cornwall had eaten up time that might have been given to dates. Which wasn't to say he hadn't had opportunities. Ever since the agency had become successful, 
A few of the rich and unhappy women who'd formed a staple of the agency's work had shown a tendency to size up strike as a potential palliative for their own emotional pain or emptiness. Strike had taken on a new client of exactly this type the previous day, Good Friday, as she'd replaced Mrs. Smith, who'd already initiated divorce proceedings against her husband on the basis of Morris's pictures of him with their nanny, they'd nicknamed the 32-year-old brunette Miss Jones. She was undeniably beautiful, with long legs, full lips, and skin of expensive smoothness. She was of interest to the gossip columns partly because she was an heiress and partly because she was involved in a bitter custody battle with her estranged boyfriend on whom she was seeking dirt to use in court. Miss Jones had crossed and recrossed her long legs while she told Strike about her hypocritical ex-partner's drug use and the fact that he was feeding stories about her to the papers and that he had no interest in his six-month-old daughter other than as a means to make Miss Jones unhappy. While he was seeing her to the door, their interview concluded, she'd repeatedly touched his arm and laughed longer than necessary at his mild pleasantries. Trying to usher her politely out of the door under Pat's censorious eye, Strike had had the sensation of trying to prise chewing gum off his fingers. Strike could well imagine Dave Polworth's comments had he been privy to the scene, because Polworth had trenchant theories about the sort of women who found his oldest friend attractive, and of whom Charlotte was the purest example of the type. The women most readily drawn to Strike were, in Polworth's view, neurotic, chaotic, and occasionally dangerous, and their fondness for the bent-nosed ex-boxer indicated a subconscious desire for something rock-like to which they could attach themselves like limpets. Driving through the deserted streets of Stoke Newington, Strike's thoughts turned naturally to his ex fiance He hadn't responded to the desperate text messages she'd sent him from what he knew, having googled the place, to be a private psychiatric clinic. Not only had they arrived on the eve of his departure for Joan's deathbed, he hadn't wanted to fuel her vain hopes that he would appear to rescue her. Was she still there? If so, it would be her longest ever period of hospitalization. Her one-year-old twins were doubtless in the care of a nanny, or the mother-in-law Charlotte had once assured him was ready and willing to take over maternal duties. A short distance away from Eleanor Dean Street, Strike called Robin. Is he still inside? Yes, you'll be able to park right behind me. There's a space. I think number 14 must have gone away for Easter with the kids. Both cars are gone. See you in five. When Strike turned into the street, he saw the old Land Rover parked a few houses down from Eleanor's front door and was able to park without difficulty in the space directly behind it. As he turned off his engine, Robin jumped down out of her Land Rover closed the door quietly and walked around the BMW to the passenger's side, a messenger bag over her shoulder. "'Morning,' she said, sliding into the seat beside him. "'Morning. Aren't you keen to get away?' As he said it, the screen of the mobile in her hand lit up. Somebody had texted her. Robin didn't even look at the message, but turned the phone over on her knee to hide its light. "'Got a few things to tell you.' I've spoken to C.B. Oakden. Ah, said Strike. Given that Oakden seemed primarily interested in Strike, and that Strike suspected Oakden was recording his calls, the two detectives had agreed that it should be Robin who warned him away from the case. He didn't like it, said Robin. There was a lot of it's a free country and I'm entitled to talk to anyone I like. I said to him, trying to get in ahead of us and talk to witnesses could hamper our investigation. He said as an experienced biographer, Oh, fuck off, said Strike under his breath. He knows how to question people to get information out of them, and it might be a good idea for the three of us to pool our resources. Yeah, said Strike. That's exactly what this agency needs, a convicted con man on the payroll. How did you leave it? Well, I can tell he really wants to meet you, and I think he's determined to withhold everything he knows about Brenner until he comes face to face with you. He wants to keep Brenner as bait. Strike reached for another cigarette. I'm not sure Brenner's worth C.B. Ogden. Even after what Janice said. Strike took a drag on the cigarette, then blew smoke out of the window, away from Robin. I grant you, Brenner looks a lot fishier now than he did when we started digging. But what are the odds Ogden's actually got useful information? 
He was a kid when all this happened, and nicking that obituary smacks of a man trying to scrape up things to say rather than... He heard a rustling beside him, and turned to see Robin opening her messenger bag. Slightly to his surprise, Robin was pulling out Talbot's notebook again. "'Still carrying that around with you, are you?' said Strike, trying not to sound exasperated. "'Apparently I am,' she said, moving her mobile onto the dashboard so that she could open the book in her lap. Watching the phone, Strike saw a second text arrive, lighting up the screen, and this time he caught sight of the name. Morris. "'What's Morris texting you about?' Strike said, and even to his ears the question sounded critical. "'Nothing. He's just bored sitting outside Miss Jones's boyfriend's house,' said Robin, who was flicking through Talbot's notebook. "'I want to show you something. There. Look at that.' She passed him the book, open to a page Strike remembered from his own perusal of the notes. It was close to the end of the notebook, where the pages were most heavily embellished with strange drawings. In the middle of this page danced a black skeleton holding a scythe. "'Ignore all the weird tarot drawings,' said Robin. "'Look there, though. That sentence between the skeleton's legs. The little symbol, the circle with the cross in it, stands for the part of fortune.' "'What's that?' asked Strike. "'It's a point in the horoscope that's supposed to be about worldly success. "'Part of fortune in second, money and possessions, "'and mother's house, underlined. "'The Orkdens lived on Fortune Street, remember, "'and the part of fortune was in the house of money and possessions "'when Margot disappeared. "'And he's connecting that with the fact "'that Dorothy inherited her mother's house "'and saying that wasn't a tragedy, "'but a stroke of luck for Dorothy. "'You think?' said Strike, rubbing his tired eyes. Yes, because look, he then starts rambling about Virgo, which is Dorothy's sign under both systems, being petty and having an axe to grind, which, from what we know about, her fits. Anyway, said Robin, I've been looking at dates of birth, and guess what? Under both the traditional and Schmidt systems, Dorothy's mother was a Scorpio. Christ's sake, how many more Scorpios are we going to find? I know what you mean, said Robin, unfazed. But from what I've read, Scorpio is one of the most common birth signs. Anyway, this is the important bit. Carl Orkden was born on the 6th of April. That means he's Aries under the traditional system, but Pisces under Schmitz. A short silence followed. How old was Oakden when his grandmother fell downstairs? asked Strike. Fourteen, said Robin. Strike turned his face away from Robin to blow smoke out of the window again. You think he pushed his grandmother, do you? It might not have been deliberate, said Robin. He could have pushed past her and she lost her balance. Margot confronted Pisces. It'd be hell of a thing to accuse a child of. Maybe she never confronted him at all. The confrontation might have been something Talbot suspected or imagined. Either way, it's suggestive, yeah. It is suggestive. Strike let out a slight groan. We're going to have to interview Bloody Oakden, aren't we? There's a bit of a hot spot developing around that little grouping, isn't there? Brenner and the Oaktons, outward respectability, inward poison, remember? That's what Una Kennedy said about Dorothy. The detective sat for a moment or two, watching Eleanor Dean's front door, which remained closed, her dark garden silent and still. How many murders, Robin asked, do you think go undetected? Clues in the question, isn't it? Undetected. Impossible to know. But yeah, it's those quiet domestic deaths you wonder about. Vulnerable people picked off by their own families, and everyone thinking it was ill health. Or a mercy that they've gone, said Robin. Some deaths are a mercy, said Strike. And with these words, in both of their minds' eyes rose an image of horror. Strike was remembering the corpse of Sergeant Gary Topley, lying on the dusty road in Afghanistan, eyes wide open, his body missing from the waist down. The vision had recurred in Strike's nightmares ever since he'd seen it, and occasionally, in these dreams, Gary talked to him, lying in the dust. It was always a comfort to remember, on waking, that Gary's consciousness had been snuffed out instantly, that his wide-open eyes and puzzled expression showed that death had claimed him before his brain could register agony or terror. 
but in Robin's mind there was a picture of something she wasn't sure had ever happened. She was imagining Margot Bamborough chained to a radiator. I whip her face and breasts, pleading for her life. The strategy is laughably transparent. And suffering torments, it could be raised to an ecstasy of pain, and then it knew it lived, and stood tremulously on the edge of the abyss, begging, screaming, begging for mercy. You know, said Robin, talking partly to break the silence and to spell that mental image, I quite like to find a picture of Dorothy's mother, Maud. Why? For confirmation, because I don't think I told you. Look. She flipped backwards in the notebook to the page littered with water signs. In small writing beneath a picture of a scorpion were the words, Mole, brackets, Adams. Is that a new sign? asked Strike. The Mole? No, said Robin, smiling. Talbot's alluding to the fact that the astrologer, Evangeline Adams, said the true Scorpio often has a birthmark or a prominent mole. I've read a book, got it second hand. There was a pause. What? said Strike, because Robin was looking at him expectantly. I was waiting for you to jeer. I lost the will to jeer some way back, said Strike. You realise we're supposed to have solved this case in approximately fourteen weeks' time? I know, sighed Robin. She picked up her mobile to check the time, and out of the corner of his eye, Strike saw yet another text from Morris. Well, we're meeting the Bailey sisters later. Maybe they'll have something useful to tell us. Are you sure you want to interview them with me? I'd be fine to do it alone. You're going to be really tired after sitting here all night. I'll sleep on the train to Truro afterwards, said Strike. You got any plans for Easter Sunday? No, said Robin. Mum wanted me to go home, but... Strike wondered what the silent sequel to the sentence was, and whether she'd made plans with someone else and didn't want to tell him about it. Morris, for instance. OK, I swear this is the last thing I'm going to bring up from Tolbert's notebook, Robin said. But I want to flag something up before we meet the Baylisses. Go on. You said yourself he seemed racist from his notes. Black Phantom, Strike quoted. Yeah. And Black Moon Lilith, and wondering whether she was a witch. Exactly. I think he really harassed her, and probably the family too, Robin said. The language he uses for Wilma, crude, dishonest. Robin flicked back to the page featuring the three horn signs, and Woman as she is now in his eon, armed and militant. A radical feminist witch. Which sounds quite cool when you say it said Robin, but I don't think Talbot meant it that way. You think this is why the daughters didn't want to talk to us? Maybe, said Robin, so I think we need to be, you know, sensitive to what might have gone on. Definitely not go in there looking as though we suspect Wilma of anything. Point well made and taken, said Strike. Right then, said Robin with a sigh, as she put the notebook back into a messenger bag. I'd better get going. What is he doing in there? Robin asked quietly, looking at Eleanor Dean's front door. Barclay thinks it might be a rubber fetish. He'd need a lot of talcum powder to wriggle himself into anything made of rubber the size of that belly. Strike laughed. Well, I'll see you in... Robin checked the time on her mobile. Seven hours, forty-five minutes. Sleep well, said Strike. As she walked away from the BMW... Strike saw her looking at her mobile again, doubtless reading Morris's texts. He watched as she got into the ancient Land Rover, then turned the tank-like vehicle in a three-point turn, raising a hand in farewell as she passed him, heading back to Earl's Court. As Strike reached for the thermos of tea under his seat, he remembered the supposed dental appointment of the other day, about which Robin had sounded strangely flustered, and which had taken place, though Strike hadn't previously made the connection on Morris's afternoon off. A most unwelcome possibility crossed his mind. Had Robin lied like Irene Hickson, and for the same reason? His mind darted to what Robin had said a few months previously, when she'd mentioned her ex-husband having a new partner. Oh, I didn't tell you, did I? I told Morris. As he unscrewed his thermos, Strike mentally reviewed Robin's behaviour around Morris in the last few months. 
she'd never seemed to particularly like him. But might that have been an act designed to deflect attention? Were his partner and his subcontractor actually in a relationship which he, busy with his own troubles, had failed to spot? Strike poured himself tea, settled back in his seat, and glowered at Eleanor Dean's closed door through the steam rising from plastic-tasting tea the colour of mud. He was angry, he told himself, because he should have established a work rule that partners weren't allowed to date subcontractors, and for another reason which he preferred not to examine, because he knew perfectly well what it was, and no good could come of brooding upon it. Chapter 53 Like three fair branches budding far and wide, that from one root derive their vital sap, and like that root that doth her life divide, their mother was. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Seven hours later, in the cool, flat daylight of an overcast morning, Robin, who was back in her Land Rover, took a detour on her way to the café where she and Strike would be meeting the three Bayless sisters. When Maya, the middle sister, had suggested meeting in Belgique in Wanstead, Robin had realised how close she'd have to drive to the flats where Dennis Creed had disposed of his second-to-last known victim, 27-year-old hairdresser Susan Mayer. Half an hour ahead of the planned interview, Robin parked the Land Rover beside a stretch of shops on Aldersbrook Road, then crossed the street and headed up a short footpath which led her to the reedy bank of the man-made Alexandra Lake, a wide stretch of water on which various wildfowl were bobbing. A couple of ducks came paddling hopefully towards Robin, but when she failed to produce bread or other treats, they glided away again, compact, self-sufficient, their onyx eyes scanning both water and bank for other possibilities. Thirty-nine years ago, Dennis Creed had driven to this lake under cover of night and rolled the headless, handless corpse of Susan Mayer into it, bound up in black plastic and rope. Susan Mayer's distinctive wedge-cut and shy smile had earned her a prominent place on the cover of the Demon of Paradise Park. The milky sky looked as opaque as the shallow lake, which resembled jade silk in which the gliding wildfowl made rippling creases. Hands in her pockets, Robin looked out over the water and the rustling weeds, trying to imagine the scene when a park worker had spotted the black object in the water, which he'd assumed initially was a tarpaulin swollen with air, until he hooked it with a long pole, felt the grisly weight, and made an instant connection. Or so he told the television crew, who arrived shortly after the police and ambulance, with the bodies that kept turning up in Epping Forest, barely ten miles away. Creed had abducted Susan exactly a month before Margot disappeared. Had they overlapped in Creed's basement? If so, had Creed, for a brief period, held three women there simultaneously? Robin preferred not to think about what Andrea, or Margot, if she'd been there, must have felt on being dragged into Creed's basement, seeing a fellow woman chained there, and knowing that she, too, would be reduced to that emaciated and broken-boned state before she died. Andrea Hooten was the last woman Creed was known to have killed, and he'd varied the pattern when it came to disposing of her body, driving eighty miles from his house in Liverpool Road to throw the corpse off Beachy Head. Both Epping Forest and Wanstead Flats had become too heavily patrolled by then, and in spite of Creed's evident wish to make sure the Essex Butcher was credited with every kill, as evidenced by the secret store of press clippings he kept beneath the floorboards in his basement flat, he'd never wanted to be caught. Robin checked her watch. It was time to head to the interview with the Bayless sisters. Walking back to the Land Rover, she pondered the divide between normalcy and insanity. On the surface, Creed had been far saner than Bill Talbot. Creed had left no half-crazed scribblings behind him to explain his thought processes. He'd never plotted the course of asteroids to guide him. His interviews with psychiatrists and police had been entirely lucid. Not for Creed the belief in signs and symbols, a secret language decipherable only by initiates, a refuge in mystery or magic. Dennis Creed had been a meticulous planner, a genius of misdirection in his neat little white van, dressed in the pink coat he'd stolen from Vi Cooper, 
and sometimes wearing a wig that from a distance to a drunk victim gave his hazy form a feminine appearance just long enough for his large hands to close over a gasping mouth. When Robin arrived in the street where the café stood, she spotted Strike getting out of his BMW a short distance away from the entrance. Noticing the Land Rover in turn, Strike raised a hand in greeting and headed up the street towards her, while finishing what looked like a bacon and egg McMuffin, his chin stubbly, the shadows beneath his eyes purple. Have I got time for a fag? were the first words he spoke, checking his watch as Robin got down out of the car and slammed the door. No, he answered himself with a sigh. Oh, well, you can take the lead on this interview, he told Robin, as they headed together towards the café. You've done all the legwork, I'll take notes. Remind me what their names are. Eden's the eldest, she's a Labour councillor from Lewisham. Maya's the middle one, and she's deputy headmistress of a primary school. The youngest is Portia Dagley, and she's a social worker. Like her mother. Exactly. And she lives just up the road from here. I think we've come to her neck of the woods because she's been ill, so the others didn't want her to have to travel. Robin pushed open the door of the café and led the way inside. The interior was sleekly modern, with a curved counter, a wooden floor, and a bright orange feature wall. Close to the door at a table for six sat three black women. Robin found it easy to identify which sister was which because of the photographs she'd seen on the family's Facebook pages and on the Lewisham Council website. Eden, the councillor, sat with her arms folded, a wavy bob casting a shadow over most of her face, so that only a carefully lipsticked, unsmiling plum mouth was clearly visible. She wore a well-tailored black jacket, and her demeanour was suggestive of a businesswoman who'd been interrupted during an important meeting. Maya, the deputy headmistress, wore a cornflower blue sweater and jeans. A small silver cross hung around her neck. She was smaller in build than Eden, the darkest skinned, and, in Robin's opinion, the prettiest of the sisters. Her long braided hair was tied back in a thick ponytail. She wore square framed glasses over her large, wide set eyes, and her full mouth, with its naturally up tilted corners, conveyed warmth. A leather handbag sat in Maya's lap, and she was gripping it with both hands, as though afraid it might otherwise escape. Portia, the youngest sister and the social worker, was also the heaviest. Her hair had been cropped almost to her skull, doubtless because of her recent chemotherapy. She penciled in the eyebrows that were just beginning to grow back. They arched over hazel eyes that shone gold against her skin. Portia was wearing a purple smock top with jeans and long beaded earrings, which swung like miniature chandeliers as she looked around at Strike and Robin. As they approached the table, Robin spotted a small tattoo on the back of Portia's neck, the trident from the Barbadian flag. Robin knew that Eden and Maya were both well into their fifties, and that Portia was forty-nine, but all three sisters could have passed for at least ten years younger than their real ages. Robin introduced herself and Strike. Hands were shaken, Eden unsmiling throughout, and the detective sat down, Strike at the head of the table, Robin between him and Portia, facing Maya and Eden. Everyone but Eden made laboured small talk about the local area and the weather, until the waiter came to take their order. Once he'd left, Robin said, Thanks very much for meeting us. We really do appreciate it. Would you mind if Cormoran takes notes? Maya and Portia shook their heads. Strike tugged his notebook out of his coat pocket and opened it. As I said on the phone, Robin began, we're really after background, building up a complete picture of Margot Bambera's life in the months. Could I ask a couple of questions? interrupted Eden. Of course, said Robin politely, though expecting trouble. Eden swept her hair back out of her face, revealing ebony dark eyes. Did you two know there's a guy phoning around everyone who was connected to St. John's, saying he's going to write a book about you investigating Bambera's disappearance? Shit, thought Robin. Would this be a man called Oakden? asked Strike. No, Carl Bryce. It's the same bloke, said Strike. Are you connected to him or— No, said Strike, and I'd strongly advise you not to talk to him. 
Yeah, we worked that one out for ourselves, said Eden coolly. But this means there'll be publicity, won't there? Robin looked at Strike, who said, If we solve the case, there'll be publicity even without Oakden, or Bryce, or whatever he's calling himself these days. But that's a big if. To be frank, the odds are we're not going to solve it, in which case I think Oakden's going to find it very hard to sell any books, and whatever else you tell us will never go any further. What if we know something that might help you solve the case, though? asked Portia, leaning forwards so that she could look past Robin at Strike. There was an infinitesimal pause in which Robin could almost feel Strike's interest sharpening along with her own. Depends what that information is, Strike answered slowly. It might be possible not to divulge where we got it, but if the source is important to get in a conviction... There was a long pause. The air between the sisters seemed charged with silent communications. Well, said Porter at last, on an interrogative note. We did decide to, Maya mumbled to Eden, who continued to sit in silence, arms folded. OK, fine, said Eden, with a don't blame me later inflection. The deputy headmistress reached absently for a little silver cross around her neck and held it as she began to talk. I need to explain a bit of background first, she said. When we were kids, Eden and I were already teenagers, but Portia was only nine. Eight, Portia corrected her. Eight, Maya said obediently. Our dad was convicted of, of rape and sent to prison. He didn't do it, though, said Eden. Robin reached automatically for her coffee cup and took a sip, so as to hide her face. He didn't, OK? said Eden, watching Robin. He had a white girlfriend for a couple of months. The whole of Clerkenwell knew. They'd been seen together in bars all over the place. He tried to end it and she cried rape. Robin's stomach lurched as though the floor had tilted. She very much wanted this story to be untrue. The idea of any woman lying about rape was repugnant to her. She'd had to talk through every moment of her own assault in court. Her soft-spoken fifty-three-year-old rapist and would-be murderer had taken the stand afterwards to explain to the jury how the twenty-year-old Robin had invited him into the stairwell of a hall of residence for sex. In his account, everything had been consensual. She'd whispered that she liked it rough, which had accounted for the heavy bruising around her neck. She'd enjoyed it so much she'd asked him back the following night, and yes, with a little laugh in the dock. Of course he'd been surprised. Nicely spoken young girl like her, coming on to him like that, out of nowhere. Easy thing for a white woman to do to a black man, said Eden, especially in 1972. Dad already had a record because he got into a fight a few years before that. He went down for five years. Must have been hard on the family, said Strike, not looking at Robin. It was, said Maya. Very hard. The other kids at school, well, you know what kids are like. Dad had been bringing in most of the money, said Portia. There were five of us, and Mum had never had much schooling. Before Dad got arrested, she'd been studying, trying to pass some exams, better herself. We were just about making ends meet while Dad was bringing in a wage. But once he was gone, we struggled. Our mum and her sister married two brothers, said Maya. Nine children between them. The families were really close, right up until Dad got arrested. But then everything changed. My Uncle Marcus went to court every day while Dad was on trial, but Mum wouldn't go, and Uncle Marcus was really angry with her. Well, he knew it would have made a big difference if the judge had seen Dad had the family united behind him, snapped Eden. I went. I bunked off school to go. I knew he was innocent. Well, good for you, said Portia, though her tone was far from congratulatory. But Mum didn't want to sit in open court listening to her husband talk about how often he had sex with his girlfriend. That woman was trash, said Eden curtly. Dirty water does cool hot iron, said Portia, with a Bajan inflection. His choice. So, anyway, said Maya hastily. The judge believed the woman, and Dad got put away. Mum never went to visit him inside, and she wouldn't take me or Portia or our brothers either. I went piped up Eden again. I got Uncle Marcus to take me. He was still our dad. Mum had no right to stop us seeing him. 
Yeah, so, continued Maya, before Portia could say anything. Mum wanted a divorce, but she had no money for legal advice. So Dr. Bambara put her in touch with this feminist lawyer, who'd give legal help to women in difficult circumstances for a reduced fee. When Uncle Marcus told Dad that Mum had managed to get herself a lawyer, Dad wrote to her from prison, begging her to change her mind. He said he'd found God, that he loved her, and he'd learned his lesson, and all he wanted was his family. Maya took a sip of her coffee. About a week after Mum got Dad's letter, she was cleaning Dr. Bambra's consulting room one evening after everyone had left, and she noticed something in the bin. Maya unfastened the handbag she'd been holding on her lap and took out a pale blue piece of heavily creased paper which had clearly been crumpled up into a ball at some point in the past. She held it out to Robin, who laid it flat on the table so that Strike could read it too. The faded handwriting was a distinctive mix of capitals and lowercase letters. Leave my girl alone, you cunt, or I'll make sure you go to hell. Slow and painful. Robin glanced sideways at Strike and saw her own barely disguised astonishment mirrored there. Before either of them could say anything, a group of young women passed their table, forcing Strike to push his chair in. Chatting and giggling, the women sat down at the table behind Maya and Eden. When Mum read that, said Maya, speaking more quietly so that the newcomers couldn't hear her, she thought Dad had sent it. Not literally, because the prison censor would never have let that go out. She thought someone had done it for him. Specifically, Uncle Marcus, said Eden, arms folded, an expression pinched. Uncle Marcus who was a lay preacher and never used the C-word in his life. Mum took the note over to Uncle Marcus and Auntie Carmen's, said Maya, ignoring this interjection, and asked Marcus straight out if he was behind it. He denied it, but Mum didn't believe him. It was the mention of hell. Marcus was a fire and brimstone kind of preacher back then, and he didn't believe Mum really wanted a divorce said Portia. He blamed Dr. Bambara for persuading Mum to leave Dad, because, you know, Mum really needed a white woman to point out her life was shit. She'd never have noticed otherwise. Going for a cigarette, OK? said Eden abruptly. She pushed herself up and walked out, her heels rapping on the wooden floorboards. Both younger sisters seemed to exhale in relief with her departure. She was Dad's favourite, Maya told Strike and Robin quietly. Watching through the window, as Eden took out a packet of silk cut, shook her hair out of her face, and lit herself a cigarette. She really loved him, even if he was a womanizer. And she never got on with Mum, said Portia. Their rows would have woken the dead. In fairness, said Maya, them splitting up hit Eden hardest. She left school at sixteen, got herself a job at Marks and Spencer to help support. Mum never wanted her to drop out of school, said Portia. That was Eden's choice. Eden likes to claim it was a sacrifice she made for the family, but come on, she couldn't wait to get out of school, because Mum put so much pressure on her to get good grades. She likes to claim she was a second mother to all of us, but that's not how I remember it. I mostly remember her whacking merry hell out of me if I so much as looked at her wrong. On the other side of the window, Eden stood smoking with her back to them. The whole situation was a nightmare, said Maya sadly. Mum and Uncle Marcus never made it up and with Mum and Carmen being sisters. Let's just tell them now, while she can't stick her oar in, Portia urged Maya. And turning to Strike and Robin, she said, Auntie Carmen was helping Mum get the divorce behind Uncle Marcus's back. How? asked Robin, as a waiter passed their table on the way to the group of women at the next table. See, when the lawyer Dr. Bambara had recommended told Mum what she charged, Mum knew she'd never be able to afford her, not even at the reduced rates, said Portia. Mum came home afterwards and cried, said Maya, because she was desperate to have the divorce done and dusted before Dad got out of jail. She knew otherwise he'd just move right back in and she'd be trapped. Anyway, a few days later Dr. Bambara asked her how things had gone with the lawyer, and Mum admitted she wasn't going to go through with the divorce for lack of funds, so... Maya sighed. Dr. Bambara offered to pay the lawyer in exchange for Mum doing a few hours a week cleaning the house out in Ham. The woman at the table behind theirs were now flirting with the young waiter, wondering whether it was too early for a cream cake, 
giggling about breaking their diets. Mum didn't feel she could refuse, said Maya. But what were the costs of getting all the way out to Ham, and the time it would take her to get out there when she already had two other jobs and exams coming up? Your Aunt Carmen agreed to do the cleaning for her, guessed Robin. And out of the corner of her eye, she saw Strike glance at her. Yeah, said Maya, eyes widening in surprise. Exactly. It seemed like a good solution. Auntie Carmen was a housewife, and Uncle Marcus and Dr. Bamborough were both out at work all day, so Mum thought neither of them would ever know the wrong woman was turning up. There was one sticky moment, said Portia. Remember him? When Dr. Bamborough asked us all over to a barbecue at her house. She turned to Robin. We couldn't go because Dr. Bamborough's nanny would have realised Mum wasn't the woman turning up once a week to clean. My Auntie Carmen didn't like that nanny, Portia added. Didn't like her at all. Why was that? asked Strike. She thought the girl was after Dr. Bamborough's husband. Went red every time she said his name, apparently. The door of the cafe opened, and Eden walked back inside. As she sat down, Robin caught a whiff of smoke mingling with her perfume. Where have you got to? she asked, looking cold. Auntie Carmen cleaning instead of Mum, said Maya. Eden refolded her arms, ignoring her coffee. So, the statement your mother gave to the police about the blood and Dr. Phipps walking across the garden, said Strike, was really her telling him everything Carmen had told her? Yeah, said Maya, feeling again for the cross around her neck. She couldn't own up that her sister had been going there instead of her, because my Uncle Marcus would have gone crazy if he'd found out. Auntie Carmen begged Mum not to tell the police, and Mum agreed. So she had to pretend she was the one who'd seen the blood on the carpet and Dr. Phipps walking across the lawn. Only, interrupted Portia, with a humorless laugh, Carmen changed her mind about Dr. Phipps after. Mum went back to her after her first police interview and said, They're asking whether I couldn't have got confused and mistaken one of the workmen for Dr. Phipps, Carmen said. Oh, yeah, I forgot there were workmen round the back. Maybe I did. Portia let out a short laugh, but Robin knew she wasn't truly amused. It was the same kind of laughter Robin had taken refuge in the night she discussed rape with Max over the kitchen table. I know it isn't funny, said Portia, catching Maya's eye. But come on, Carmen was always ditzy as hell, but you'd think she might have made sure of her facts then, wouldn't you? Mum was literally sick with stress, like retching if she ate anything. And then that old bitch of a secretary at work found her having a dizzy spell. Yeah, said Eden, suddenly coming to life. Next thing was, Mum was accused of being a thief and a drunk and the practice fired her. The old secretary claimed she'd had a secret sniff of Mum's thermos and smelled booze in it. Total fabrication. That was a few months after Margot Bamber had disappeared, wasn't it? Asked Strike, his pen poised over his notebook. Oh, I'm sorry, Eden said with icy sarcasm. Did I go off topic? Back to the missing white lady, everyone. Never mind what the black woman went through. Who gives a shit? Sorry, I didn't, began Strike. Do you know who Tiana Madani is? Eden shot at him. No, he admitted. No, said Eden. Of course you bloody don't. Forty years after Margot Bamborough went missing, here we all are fussing over her and where she went. Tiana Madani's a black teenager from Lewisham. She went missing last year. How many front pages has Tiana been on? Why wasn't she top of the news like Bambera was? Because we're not worth the same, are we, to the press or to the bloody police? Strike appeared unable to find an adequate response. Doubtless, Robin thought, because Eden's point was unarguable. The picture of Dennis Creed's only black victim, Jackie Eilert, a secretary and mother of one, was the smallest and the least distinct of the glossy black-and-white images of Creed's victims on the cover of The Demon of Paradise Park. Jackie's dark skin showed up worst on the gloomy cover. The greatest prominence had been given to 16-year-old Geraldine Christie and 27-year-old Susan Meyer, both of them pale and blonde. When Margot Bambara went missing, Eden said fiercely, the white women at her practice were treated like bone china by the police, OK? Practically mopping their bloody tears for them, but not our mum. They treated her like a hardened con. That policeman in charge, what was his name? Talbot, suggested Robin. 
What are you hiding? Come on, I know you're hiding something. The mysterious figure of the Hierophant rose up in Robin's mind. The keeper of secrets and mysteries in the Thoth Tarot wore saffron robes and sat upon a bull. The Cardus referred to Taurus, and in front of him, half his size, stood a black priestess, her hair braided like Maya's. Before him is the woman girt with a sword. She represents the Scarlet Woman. Which had come first, the laying out of tarot cards signifying secrecy and concealment, or the policeman's instinct that the terrified Wilma was lying to him? When he interviewed me, began Eden. Talbot interviewed you, asked Strike sharply. Yeah, he came to Marks and Spencer unannounced to my work, said Eden. And Robin realised that Eden's eyes were suddenly bright with tears. Someone else at the practice had seen that anonymous note Bamborough got. Talbot found out Dad was inside, and he'd heard Mum was cleaning for the doctor. He went to every man in our family, accusing them of writing the threatening letters, and then he came to me, asking me really strange questions about all my male relatives, wanting to know what they'd been up to on different dates, asking whether Uncle Marcus often stayed out overnight. He even asked me about Dad and Uncle Marcus's star signs. Asked Robin. Eden looked astounded. The hell did you know that? Talbot left a notebook. It's full of occult writing. He was trying to solve the case using tarot cards and astrology. Astrology, repeated Eden. Effing astrology. Talbot shouldn't have been interviewing you without an adult present. Strike told Eden. What were you? Sixteen. Eden laughed in the detective's face. That might be how it works for white girls, but we're different, aren't you? Listening, we're hardy, we're tough. That occult stuff, Eden said, turning back to Robin. Yeah, that makes sense because he asked me about a bear. You know what that is? Robin shook her head. Kind of magic they used to practice in the Caribbean, originated in West Africa. We were all born in Southwark, but you know, we were all black pagans to Inspector Talbot. He had me alone in the back room, and he was asking me stuff about rituals using blood, about black magic. I was terrified. I didn't know what he was on about. I thought he meant mum and the blood on the carpet, hinting she'd done away with Doctor Bamborough. He was having a psychotic breakdown," said Robin. "That's why they took him off the case. He thought he was hunting a devil. Your mum wasn't the only woman he thought might have supernatural power, but he was definitely racist," Robin added quietly. That's clear from his notes. You never told us about the police coming to Marks and Spencer," said Portia. "Why didn't you tell us? Why would I?" said Eden, angrily blotting her damp eyes. "Mum was already ill with the stress of it all. I had Uncle Marcus shouting at me that Mum had put the police onto him and his boys, and I was really scared. If Uncle Marcus found out about the officer coming to my work, he'd report him, which was the last thing we needed. God, it was a mess," said Eden. Pressing her hands briefly against her wet eyes, such a bloody mess. Portia looked as though she'd like to say something comforting to her elder sister, but Robin had the impression that this would be such a departure from their usual relationship, she didn't know quite how to set about it. After a moment or two, Portia muttered, "Need the loo," pushed her chair away from the table, and disappeared into the bathroom. I didn't want Portia to come today. Said Maya, as soon as the bathroom door swung shut behind her younger sister. She was tactfully not looking at her elder sister, who was trying to pretend she wasn't crying, while surreptitiously wiping more tears from her eyes. She doesn't need this stress. She's only just finished chemo. How's she doing? Asked Strike. She was given the all clear last week, thank God. She's talking about going back to work on reduced hours. I think it's too early. She's a social worker, isn't she? Asked Robin. Yeah, sighed Maya. A backlog of a hundred desperate messages every morning, and you know you're in for the firing line if anything goes wrong with a family you haven't been able to reach. I don't know how she does it, but she's like Mum, two peas in a pod. She was always Mum's baby, and Mum was her hero. Eden let out a soft, huh, which might have been agreement or disparagement. Maya ignored it. There was a short pause in which Robin reflected on the tangled ties of family. A proxy war between Jules and Wilma Bayless seemed still to be playing out in the next generation. The bathroom door swung open again, and Portia reappeared. 
Instead of taking her seat beside Robin, she swiveled her wide hips around Strike at the end of the table and edged in behind a startled Maya, who pulled her chair in hastily until she reached Eden. After thrusting a handful of toilet roll into her elder sister's hand, Portia slid her plump arms around Eden's neck and dropped a kiss on the top of her head. "'What are you doing?' said Eden huskily, reaching up to clasp her younger sister's arms, not to remove them, but to hold them there. Strike, Robin saw out of the corner of her eye, was pretending to examine his notebook. "'Thanking you,' said Portia softly, dropping another kiss on the top of her eldest sister's head before letting her go. "'For agreeing to do this. I know you didn't want to.' Everyone sat in slightly startled silence while Portia squeezed her way back around the table and resumed her seat next to Robin. "'Have you told them the last bit?' Portia asked Maya, while Eden blew her nose. "'About Mum and Betty Fuller?' "'No,' said Maya, who appeared shell-shocked by the act of reconciliation she'd just witnessed. "'You're the one Mum told it to. I think you should.' "'Right,' said Portia, turning to look at Strike and Robin. This really is the last thing we know, and there might be nothing in it, but you might as well have it, now you know the other stuff. Strike waited, Pen paused. Mum told me this not long after she retired. She shouldn't have, really, because it was about a client. But when you hear what it was, you'll understand. Mum kept working in Clerkenwell after she qualified as a social worker. It was where all her friends were. She didn't want to move. So she really got to know the local community. One of the families she was working with lived in Skinner Street, not that far from the St. John's practice. Skinner Street, repeated Strike. The name rang a bell, but, exhausted as he was, he couldn't immediately remember why that was. Robin, on the other hand, knew immediately why Skinner Street sounded familiar. Yeah, the family was called Fuller. They had just about every problem you can think of, Mum said. Addiction, domestic abuse, criminality, the lot. The sort of head of the family was a grandmother who was only in her forties, and this woman's main source of income was prostitution. Betty was her name, and Mum said she was like a local news service, if you wanted to know about the underworld anyway. The family had been in the area for generations. Anyway, one day Betty says to Mum bit sly, to see her reaction, Marcus never sent no threatening notes to that doctor, you know. Mum was gobsmacked, said Portia. Her first thought was that Marcus was visiting the woman, you know, as a client. I know he wasn't, said Portia quickly, holding up a hand to forestall Eden, who'd opened her mouth. Mum and Marcus hadn't spoken for years at this point. Anyway, it was all innocent. Betty had met Marcus because the church was doing a bit of outreach in the local area. He'd brought round some harvest festival stuff for the family and tried to persuade Betty to come along to a church service. Betty had worked out Marcus's connection with Mum because Mum was still going by Bayliss, and Betty claimed she knew who really wrote the threatening notes to Margot Bamborough, and that the person who wrote the notes was the same person who killed her. Mum said, who was it? And Betty said, if she ever told, Margot's killer would kill her too. There was a short silence. The café clattered around them, and one of the women at the next table, who was eating a cream slice, said loudly, with unctuous pleasure, God, that's good! Did your mother believe Betty? asked Robin. She didn't know what to think, said Portia. Betty knew some very rough people, so it was possible she'd heard something on the grapevine, but who knows? People talk, don't they? And they like making themselves important. And Robin remembered Janice Beatty saying exactly this, as she passed on the rumour of Margot Bambra appearing in the graveyard. But if there was anything in it, a woman like Betty, she'd go to the moon before she went to the cops. She might well be dead by now, said Portia given her lifestyle, but for what it's worth, there it is. Shouldn't be hard to find out whether she's still alive. Thanks very much for telling us, said Strike. That's definitely worth following up. Having told all they knew, the three sisters now lapsed into a pained silence. It wasn't the first time that Robin had had cause to consider how much collateral damage each act of violence left in its wake. The disappearance of Margot Bamborough had evidently wreaked havoc in the lives of the Bayliss girls, and now she knew the full extent of the grief it had brought them, and the painful nature of the memories associated with it, 
she perfectly understood Eden's initial refusal to talk to detectives. If anything, she had to ask herself why the sisters had changed their minds. Thank you so much for this, she said sincerely. I know Margot's daughter will be incredibly grateful that you agreed to talk to us. Oh, it's the daughter who's hired you, is it? said Maya. Well, you can tell her from me. Mum felt guilty all her life that she didn't come clean with the police. She liked Dr. Bamborough, you know. I mean, they weren't close friends or anything, but she thought she was a decent person. It weighed on her, said Portia. Right up until her death, it weighed on her. That's why she kept that note. She'd have wanted us to do this. There's always handwriting analysis and stuff, isn't there? Strike agreed that there was. He went to pay the bill, and Robin waited at the table with the sisters, who she could tell wanted the detectives gone and as quickly as possible. They disclosed their personal trauma and their family's secrets, and now a thin layer of polite small talk was too onerous to sustain, and any other form of conversation impossible. Robin was relieved when Strike rejoined her, and after brief farewells, the two of them left the café. The moment he hit clean air, Strike paused to pull his Benson and Hedges out of his pocket and lit one. Needed that, he muttered as they walked on. So, Skinner Street is where Joseph Brenner was seen on the night Margot Bamborough disappeared, said Robin. Ah, muttered Strike, briefly closing his eyes. I knew there was something. I'll look into Betty Fuller as soon as I get home, said Robin. What did you think of the rest of it? The Bayless family really went through it, didn't they? said Strike, pausing beside the Land Rover and glancing back at the café. His BMW lay another fifty yards ahead. He took another drag on his cigarette, frowning. You know, it gives us another angle on Talbot's bloody notebook, he admitted. Strip away all the occult shit, and he was right, wasn't he? Wilma was hiding stuff from him. A lot of stuff, actually. I thought that too, said Robin. You realise that threatening note's the first piece of physical evidence we found? Yes, said Robin, checking her watch. What time are you heading to Truro? Strike didn't answer. Looking up, Robin saw that he was staring so fixedly across the open park on the other side of the road that she turned too, to see what had captured his attention, but saw nothing except a couple of gambling West Highland terriers and their male owner, who was walking along, swinging a pair of leads. Cormoran. Strike appeared to recall his attention from a long way away. What? he said, and then, yeah. No, I was just... He turned to look back at the café, frowning. I was just thinking. But it's nothing I think I'm doing at all, but seeing meaning in total coincidence. What coincidence? But Strike didn't answer until the café doors opened and the three Bayless sisters emerged in their coats. We should get going, he said. They must be sick of the sight of us by now. I'll see you Monday. Let me know if you find out anything interesting on Betty Fuller. Chapter 54 But nothing new to him was that same pain, nor pain at all, for he so oft had tried to power thereof, and loved so oft in vain. Edmund Spencer the Fairy Queen. The train gave a lurch. The sleeping strike's head rolled sideways and hit the cold window. He woke, feeling drool on his chin. Wiping it on his coat sleeve, he peered around. The elderly couple opposite him were politely immersed in their reading material, but across the aisle four teenagers were enjoying paroxysms of silent laughter, carefully not looking at him their shoulders shaking as they feigned interest in the fields out of the window. Apparently he'd been snoring with his mouth wide open, because it was now unpleasantly dry. Checking his watch, he saw that he'd been asleep at least two hours. Strike reached for the tartan thermos sitting on the table in front of him, which he'd rinsed out and refilled at McDonald's earlier, and poured himself a black coffee while the teenagers continued to gasp and snort with laughter. Doubtless they thought him comically odd and old, with his snores and his tartan thermos. But a year of navigating swaying train carriages 
had taught him that his prosthetic leg appreciated as few trips to the catering car as possible. He drank a cup of plastic-tainted coffee, then resettled himself comfortably, arms folded, looking out at the fields gliding past, bestridden with power pylons, the flat white cloud given a glaucous glow by the dust on the glass. The landscape registered only incidentally. Strike's attention was focused inwards on the odd idea that had occurred to him after the interview with the Bayless sisters. Of course, the idea might be nothing but the product of an overburdened mind making spurious connections between simple coincidences. He mentally turned it this way and that, examining it from different angles, until finally, yawning, he inched sideways over into the empty seat beside him and laboriously pulled himself up into a standing position in the aisle so he could access the holdall in the luggage rack overhead. Beside his holdall sat a waitrose bag, because he'd made a detour into the supermarket on the way to Paddington Station, where he'd grabbed three Easter eggs for his nephews, or rather three chocolate hedgehogs. friends, because they were relatively compact. Now, groping in his holdall for the demon of Paradise Park, he accidentally knocked over the carrier bag containing the chocolate. The uppermost hedgehog fell out. In his attempt to catch it, he accidentally batted it up into the air. The box bounced off the back of the elderly woman's seat, causing her to squeak in surprise, and the box hit the floor. The teenagers for whom Strike was unintentionally mounting a one-man comedy show were now openly gasping and crying with laughter. Only when Strike bent down awkwardly to pick up the now cracked chocolate hedgehog, one hand on the teenager's table to steady himself, did one of the young women spot the metal rod that served as his right ankle. He knew what she'd seen by the abrupt cessation of her laughter and the frantic whispered shushing of her friends. Panting, sweating, and now aware of half the carriage's eyes on him, he shoved the damaged hedgehog back into its bag, found the demon of Paradise Park in his holdall, and then, sweating slightly, but taking malicious pleasure in the po face shock of the teenagers beside him, sidled back into his window seat. After flicking through the book in search of the part he wanted to reread, Strike finally found the chapter two-thirds of the way through the book, entitled Capture. Thus far, Creed's relationship with landlady Violet Cooper had been key to his continuing safety. Violet herself admits that for the first five years of his tenancy she'd never have believed harm of Den, who she saw as a lonely and gentle soul, fond of their sing-along evenings, and probably gay. However, 
The pains he'd once taken to keep Violet happy had begun to irk Creed. Where once he'd drugged her because he was planning to pound bones to dust in the basement or needed to load a corpse into the van by night, he now began lacing her gin and oranges with barbiturates purely to avoid the tedium of her company. Creed's manner towards Violet also changed. He became mean to her, taking the mickey when there was no need, saying nasty things, laughing at me for using the wrong words and stuff, treating me like I was stupid, which he'd never done before. I remember one time I was telling him about the place my brother bought when he retired, cottage in the country, everything lovely, and I said, You should have seen the garden, his roses and a gazebo. And he laughed at me, Dennis. Well, jeered, really, because I'd said it wrong. Gazebo, I'd said, and I've never forgotten it. He said, Don't use words if you can't say them. You just look thick. It hurt my feelings. I hadn't seen that nasty side of him. I knew he was clever. He used to do the Times crossword every day. Knew all the answers on Mastermind when we watched it together. But he'd never put me down before. Then, one night, he starts going on about my will. He wants to know who I'm going to leave the house to. He as good as asked me to leave it to him. I didn't like that. I wasn't an old woman. I wasn't planning to die any time soon. I changed the subject, but he started on it again a few nights later. I said, Look, how do you think that makes me feel, Dennis, you going on like this, like I'm on my last legs? You're making me feel like you're going to do away with me. He got uppity and said it was all right for me, but he had nothing, no security or nothing. And what if he got turfed out on the streets by whoever I left the house to? And he flounced out. We made it up later, but it left a nasty taste. It would seem the height of foolhardiness for Creed to persuade Violet into changing her will and then kill her. Quite apart from having an obvious motive, he'd be risking the ingression of police into the basement where he was concealing the remains and belongings of at least five women. However, Creed's arrogance and sense of inviolability seemed to have known no bounds by this time. He was also stockpiling pills in larger quantities than ever, which brought him into contact with more than one street dealer. This made him more widely recognisable. One of his new drugs contacts was Michael Cleet, who sold barbiturates stolen from a contact at a pharmaceutical company. Cleet would later cut a deal with the police in exchange for his testimony at the killer's trial. Creed, he testified, had asked Cleet whether he or his contact could procure a doctor's prescription pad. Police suspected that Creed was hoping to fake a prescription for Violet to explain her possession of the means to overdose. In spite of the coffee, Strike's eyelids began to droop again. After another couple of minutes, his head sank sideways and the book slipped out of his slack grasp. When he woke up again, the sky outside had turned coral pink, the laughing teenagers were gone, and he found himself ten minutes from Truro Station. Stiffer than ever, and in no mood for the family reunion, he wished he was heading back to his attic flat for a shower and some peace. Nevertheless, his heart lifted slightly when he saw Dave Polworth waiting for him on the platform. The bag of chocolate hedgehogs rattled slightly as Strike clambered laboriously off the train. He'd have to remember to give the broken one to Luke. "'All right, did he?' said Polworth, as they shook hands and patted each other on the back, Strike's Waitrose bag impeding a hug. "'Thanks for picking me up, chum. Really appreciate it.' They drove to St. Moore's in Polworth's Dacia Duster, discussing plans for the following day. Polworth and his family had been invited to the scattering of the ashes, along with Carenza, the Macmillan nurse. "'Except it's not going to be a scattering,' said Polworth, driving through country lanes, as the sun turned into a burning coal on the horizon. More like a floatin'. How's that? Lucy's got an urn, said Polworth. Water-soluble, cotton and clay. She was showing me last night. It's supposed to look like a flower. You put the ashes inside and the whole thing bobs away and dissolves. Nice idea, said Strike. Prevent stupid accidents, said Polworth, pragmatically. Remember Ian Resterick from school? His granddad wanted his ashes thrown off Land's End. The dozy fuckers chucked them off in a high wind and ended up with their mouths full of the old boy. Resterick told me he was blowing ash out of his nose for a week after. Laughing, 
Strike felt his phone buzz in his pocket and pulled it out. He was hoping the text might be Robin, perhaps telling him she'd already located Betty Fuller. Instead, he saw an unknown number. I hated you as much as I did, because I loved you so much. My love never ended, but yours did. It wore out. I wore it out. Polworth was still talking, but Strike was no longer listening. He read the text through several times, frowning slightly, then put the phone back in his pocket and tried to concentrate on his old friend's anecdotes. At Ted's house, there were cries of welcome and hugs from his uncle, Lucy, and Jack. Strike tried to look delighted to be there, in spite of his fatigue, and knowing he'd have to wait to sleep until everyone else had gone to bed. Lucy had made pasta for everyone, and when she wasn't tending to everybody else's needs, telling Luke off for kicking Adam or picking at her own plate, she teetered on the verge of tears. "'It's so strange, isn't it?' she whispered to her brother after dinner, while Greg and the boys, at Greg's insistence, were clearing the table. "'Being here without her?' And without a pause, she hurried on. We've decided we're going to do the ashes in the morning, because the weather looks good, and then come back here for Easter lunch. Sounds great, said Strike. He knew how much importance Lucy placed on arrangements and plans, on having everything done in the right way. She fetched the urn and admired the stylized white lily. Ted had already placed Joan's ashes inside. That's great. Joan would have loved it, he said with no idea whether that was true or not. "'And I bought pink roses for all of us to throw into the water with it,' said Lucy, tears welling again. "'Nice touch,' said Strike, suppressing a yawn. He really did just want to shower, then lie down and sleep. "'Thanks for sorting all this out, Luce. Oh, and I brought Easter eggs for the boys. Where'd you want them? "'We can put them in the kitchen. Did you remember to get some for Ros and Mel, too?' Who? Oh? Dave and Penny's girls. They'll be coming tomorrow, too. Fuck's sake. I didn't think. Oh, stick, said Lucy. Aren't you their godfather? No, I'm not, said Strike, doing his very best not to sound short-tempered. But fine, yeah. I'll nip down the shops tomorrow morning and buy some more. Later, when he was at last alone in the dark sitting-room, lying on the sofa with which he'd become so unwillingly familiar over the past year, his prosthetic leg propped against the coffee table, he checked his phone again. There were, he was pleased to see, no more messages from the unknown number, and, exhausted as he was, he managed to fall asleep quickly. However, at shortly before four in the morning, the phone rang. Jerked out of a profound sleep, Strike groped for it, registered the time, then raised it to his ear. Hello? There was a long silence although he could hear breathing on the end of the line. "'Who is this?' he said, suspecting the answer. "'Bluey,' came a tiny whisper. "'It's me. "'It's four in the morning, Charlotte.' "'I know,' she whispered, and gave what might have been a giggle or a sob. She sounded strange, possibly manic. Strike stared up at the dark ceiling, his aunt's ashes a mere twelve feet away. Where are you? In hell. Charlotte. She hung up. Strike could hear his own heart beating with ominous force, like a kettle drum deep inside a cave. Red-hot threads of panic and dread darted through him. How many more burdens was he supposed to bear? Had he not paid enough, given enough, sacrificed enough, loved enough? Joan seemed very close just now in the darkness of her own sitting-room, with her ornamental plates and her dried flowers, closer even than her dusty remains, in that vaguely ludicrous white lily, which would look so puny and insignificant, bobbing away on the wide sea, like a discarded paper plate. He seemed to hear her last words as he lay there. You're a good man, helping people. I'm proud of you. Charlotte had called him from the same unknown number she texted from earlier. Strike's exhausted mind now eddied around the known facts, which were that Charlotte had suicide attempts in her past, that she was married with children, and that she'd recently been committed to a mental facility. He remembered his resolution of weeks ago, to phone her husband if she sent him any more self-destructive messages, 
but Jago Ross wouldn't be at his merchant bank at 4 a.m. on an Easter weekend. He wondered whether it would be cruelty or kindness to ignore the call, and how he'd bear the knowledge that she'd overdosed if he didn't respond. After a very long ten minutes, during which he half expected her to call him back, Strike sat up to compose a text. I'm in Cornwall. My aunt's just died. I think you need help, but I'm the wrong person to give it to you. If you're alone, you need to get hold of someone and tell them how you're feeling. The terrible thing was how well he and Charlotte knew each other. Strike knew just how pusillanimous, how disingenuous Charlotte would find this bland response. She'd know that some small part of him, shrunken by determined abstinence, though never eradicated, felt a pullback towards her, especially in this extremity, not only because he'd assumed responsibility for her happiness for years, but because he could never forget that she'd come to him when he was at his lowest ebb, lying in a hospital bed with a freshly amputated leg, wondering what possible life there was for him now. He could still remember her appearing in the doorway, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, and how she'd walked down the ward towards him and kissed him wordlessly on the mouth, and that moment, more than any other, had told him that life would continue, would contain glorious moments of beauty and pleasure, that he wasn't alone any more, and that his missing leg didn't matter to the woman he couldn't forget. Sitting in the darkness, atypically cold because of his exhaustion, Strike typed four more words. It will get better. And sent the message. Then he lay back down and waited for the phone to vibrate again, but it remained silent. And eventually, he fell asleep. He was woken inevitably by Luke bursting into the sitting room. While he listened to Luke clattering around the kitchen, Strike reached for his phone and looked at it. Charlotte had sent two more texts, one an hour previously, the next half an hour later. Bluey, I'm sorry about your aunt. Is it the one I met? And then, when Strike hadn't answered, Am I evil? Jago says I am. I used to think I couldn't be, because you loved me. At least she wasn't dead. With a vice-like sensation in his belly, Strike sat up, put on his prosthesis, and attempted to shut Charlotte out of his mind. Breakfast wasn't a particularly relaxing affair. The table was so crowded with Easter eggs, it was like being in some cartoonish nest. Strike ate off a plate on his lap. Lucy had bought Strike and Ted an egg each, and the detective now gathered that he should have bought his sister one as well. All three boys had tottering piles. "'What's a hedgehog got to do with Easter?' Adam asked Strike, holding up his uncle's offering. "'Easter time's spring, isn't it?' said Ted, from the end of the table. "'It's when hibernating animals wake up.' "'Mine's all broken,' said Luke, shaking the box. "'That's a shame,' said Strike, and Lucy shot him a sharp look. She was tense, telling off her sons for looking at their phones during the meal, glaring at Strike when he checked his own, constantly glancing out of the window to check the state of the weather. The detective was glad of an excuse to get out of the house to buy Polworth's daughter's Easter eggs, but he'd walked barely ten yards down the sloping road, cigarette in hand, when the family pulled up in their Dacia. When Strike confided his errand in an undertone, Polworth said, "'Fuck that! They got enough chocolate for a year at home. Leave it!' At eleven o'clock, with a leg of lamb left in the oven and the timer set, after Luke had been told that no, he couldn't take his iPad on the boat, and one full start, due to the need to return to the house for Polworth's younger daughter to have a pee she'd insisted she didn't need before they left, the party made its way successfully down to the harbour, where they met Carenza the nurse and boarded Ted's old sailing boat, Jawanet. Strike, who'd once been his uncle's proud helpmeet, no longer had the balance to work either sails or rudder. He sat with the women and children, spared the necessity of making conversation by the noise of wind against canvas. Ted shouted commands to Polworth and Jack. Luke was eating chocolate, his eyes screwed up against the cold breeze. Polworth's daughters were huddled, shivering beside their mother, who had her arms around them. Tears were already trickling down Lucy's cheeks as she cradled the flat white urn in her lap. Beside her, Carenza held a bunch of dark pink roses, loosely wrapped in cellophane, and it was left to Greg and Polworth to shout at the children 
to watch out for the boom as they tacked around the peninsula where St. Maur's Castle stood sentinel. The surface of the sea changed from second to second, from rippling plain of sage and grey to mesh of diamond bright sparkles. The smell of ozone was as familiar and comforting to strike as that of beer. He was just thinking how glad he was that Joan had chosen this and not a grave, when he felt his phone vibrate against his chest. Unable to resist the temptation to read what he knew would be a text from Charlotte, he pulled it out and read it. I thought you'd come back. I thought you'd stop me marrying him. I didn't think you'd let me do it. He put the phone back into his pocket. Luke was watching him, and Strike thought he saw the idea occur of asking why Uncle Cormoran could look at his phone, whereas he was banned from bringing his iPad. But the look his uncle gave him seemed to make him think better of the idea, and he merely stuffed more chocolate in his mouth. A feeling of constraint seemed to fall over everyone, even Luke, as Ted turned the boat into the wind and brought the boat slowly to a halt, the sail flapping loudly in the wind, St. Moore's Castle now the size of a sandcastle in the distance. Carenza handed around the roses, one for everyone except Ted, who took the remainder of the bouquet between the hands that were forever sunburned. Nobody spoke, and yet the moment didn't feel anticlimactic. While the sails flapped angrily overhead, Ted bent low over the side of the boat and dropped the urn gently into the sea, murmuring his farewell, and the object Strike had imagined would look inadequate and tawdry became, precisely because of its smallness as it bobbed gallantly on the ocean, affecting and strangely noble. Soon the last earthly remains of Joan Nancaro would dissolve into the sea, and only the pink roses, tossed one by one into the sea by each of them, would remain to show the place where she disappeared. Strike put his arm around Lucy, who rested her head on his shoulder as they sailed back to shore. Roswin, the elder of Polworth's daughters, broke into sobs initially provoked by the sight of the urn vanishing in the distance, but sustained by her enjoyment of her own grief and the sympathy of her mother. Strike watched until he could no longer see the white dot, then turned his eyes towards shore, thinking of the leg of lamb waiting for them back at the house. His phone vibrated again, minutes after he'd regained firm ground. While Polworth helped Ted tie up the boat, Strike lit a cigarette and turned away from the group to read the new text. I want to die speaking the truth. People are such liars. Everyone I know lies in such, if them, swant to stop pretending. I'll walk back, he told Lucy. You can't she said at once. Lunch will be ready for us. I'm going to want another one of these, Strike said firmly, holding up his cigarette in her disapproving face. I'll meet you up there. You want company, Diddy? asked Polworth. Penny can take the girls back up to the house. No, you're all right, mate, said Strike. Need to make a work call, he added quietly, so that Lucy couldn't hear. As he said it, he felt his mobile vibrate again. Goodbye, Coram said Carenza, her freckled face kindly as ever. I'm not coming for lunch. Great, said Strike. No, sorry, I mean, thanks for coming, Carenza. Joan was so fond of you. When Carenza had finally got into her mini and the family's cars were driving away, Strike pulled out his phone again. Never forget that I loved you. Goodbye, Blues. Kiss. Strike called the number. After a few rings it went to voicemail. Charlotte, it's me, said Strike. I'm going to keep ringing till you pick up. He hung up and dialed again. The number went to voicemail a second time. Strike began to walk because his anxiety required action. The streets around the harbour weren't busy. Most people would be sitting down to Easter lunch. Over and again he dialed Charlotte's number, but she didn't answer. It was as though a wire was tightening around his skull. His neck was rigid with tension. From second to second, his feelings fluctuated between rage, resentment, frustration, and fear. She'd always been an expert manipulator. She'd also narrowly escaped death by her own hand, twice. The phone might be going unanswered because she was already dead. 
There could be sporting guns at the Castle of Croy, where her husband's family had lived for generations. There'd be heavy-duty medications at the clinic. She might have stockpiled them. She might even have taken a razor blade to herself, as she'd once tried to do during one of her and Strike's more vicious rows. After calling the number for the tenth time, Strike came to a halt, looking out over the railings at the pitiless sea, which breathed no consolation as it rushed to and then retreated from the shore. Memories of Joan and the way she'd clung so fiercely to life flooded his mind. His anxiety about Charlotte was laced with fury for throwing life away. And then his phone rang. Where are you? he almost shouted. Bluey? She sounded drunk, or very stoned. Where are you? Told you, she mumbled. Bluey, do you remember? Charlotte, where are you? Told you. Simmons. He turned and began to half run, half hobble back the way he'd come. There was an old fashioned red telephone box twenty yards back, and with his free hand he was already pulling coins from his trouser pocket. Are you in your room? Where are you? The telephone box smelled urinous of cigarette butts and dirt from a thousand silt clogged soles. Can I see sky, bluey, I'm so. She was still mumbling, her breathing slow. One one eight, one one eight, said a cheery voice through the receiver in his hand. Simmons House. It's a residential psychiatric clinic in Kent. Shall I connect? Yes, connect me. Charlotte, are you still there? Talk to me. Where are you? But she didn't answer. Her breathing was loud and becoming guttural. Simmons House, said a bright female voice in the other ear. Have you got an impatient there called Charlotte Ross? I'm sorry, sir said the receptionist. We don't disclose. She's overdosed. She's just called me from your facility, and she's overdosed. You need to find her. She might be outside. Have you got grounds there? Sir, can I ask you, check Charlotte Ross's whereabouts now. I've got her on another line, and she's overdosed. He heard the woman speaking to someone away from the phone. Mrs. Ross, first floor, just to make... The voice spoke in his ear again, still professionally bright, but anxious now. Sir, what number is Mrs. Ross calling from? She, inpatients, don't have their own mobiles. Well, she's got one from somewhere, said Strike, as well as a shitload of drugs. Somewhere in the background of the call, he heard shouting, then loud footsteps. He tried to insert another coin into the slot, but it fell straight through and came out at the bottom. Fuck! Sir, I'm going to ask you not to talk to me like that. No, I just... The line went dead. Charlotte's breath was now barely audible. Strike slammed as much change as he had in his pockets into the slot, then redialed telephone inquiries. Within a minute, he was again connected to the female voice at Simmons' house. Simmons' house? Have you found her? I got cut off. Have you found her? I'm afraid I can't disclose, said the harassed-sounding woman. She got hold of a mobile and the means to kill herself on your watch, said Strike, so you can bloody well disclose whether she's dead. Sir, I'd appreciate you not shouting at me. But then Strike heard distant male voices through the mobile clamped to his other ear. There was no point hanging up and ringing. Charlotte hadn't heard his ten previous calls. She must have the mobile on silent. She's here, he bellowed, and the woman on the payphone line shrieked in shock. Follow my voice, she's here. Strike was bellowing into the phone, well aware of the almost impossible odds of searchers hearing him. He could hear swishing and cracking and knew that Charlotte was outside, probably in the undergrowth. Then, through the mobile, he heard a man shout. Shit! She's here! She's here! Fuck! Get an ambulance! Sir, said the shell-shocked woman, now that Strike had stopped yelling. Could I have your name? But Strike hung up. Over the sound of his change clattering into the returned coin box, he continued to listen to the two men who'd found Charlotte, one of them shouting details of her overdose to the emergency services, the other repeatedly calling Charlotte's name, until somebody noticed that the mobile beside her was active and turned it off. Chapter 55 Of lovers' sad calamities of old, full many piteous stories do remain. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen As a noted beauty and socialite, with a tantalizing number of celebrity connections and a rebellious, self-destructive past, 
Charlotte was an old staple of the gossip columns. Naturally, her emergency hospitalization out of a private psychiatric clinic made news. The tabloids ran photo-heavy stories showing Charlotte at the ages of fourteen when she'd first run away from her private school and sparked a police hunt. Eighteen, arm-in-arm arm with her well-known broadcaster father, a thrice-married heavy drinker. Twenty-one, with her model-turned-socialite mother at a cocktail party. And thirty-eight, where, as beautiful as ever, she smiled blankly alongside her white-blonde husband, twin babies in her arms, an exquisite drawing-room in the background. Nobody had been able to find a picture of her with Cormoran Strike, but the fact that they'd once dated, which Charlotte herself had been careful to mention to the press when she got engaged to Jago, ensured that his name appeared in print alongside hers. Emergency hospitalization, history of addiction issues, troubled past. Though the tabloids didn't say so explicitly, only the most naive reader could be left in doubt that Charlotte had attempted to take her own life. The story gained a second wind when an unnamed inside source at Simmons' house confided that the future Viscountess Ross had allegedly been found face down in a shrubbery right behind an old summer house. The broadsheet stories led with the questionable practices of the exorbitantly priced Simmons' house, which, said the Telegraph, has a reputation for being the last resort of the wealthy and well-connected. Controversial treatments include transcranial magnetic stimulation and the hallucinogen psilocybin, more commonly known as magic mushrooms. They, too, used large photographs of Charlotte to embellish their stories, so Robin, who furtively read all of them and felt guilty afterwards, was reminded constantly how very beautiful Strike's ex had always been. Strike hadn't mentioned a word of the business to Robin, and she hadn't asked. A moratorium had lain over Charlotte's name ever since that night, four years previously, when Robin had still been the temp, and an extremely drunk strike confided in her that Charlotte had lied about being pregnant with his child. All Robin knew right now was that Strike had returned from Cornwall in a particularly buttoned-up mood, and while she knew that the disposal of his aunt's ashes must have been a sad occasion, she couldn't help suspecting this other source for his moodiness. Out of loyalty to Strike, she refused to gossip about his ex, even though everyone around her seemed to want to talk about it. A week after Strike returned from Cornwall, Robin entered the office, already in a bad mood, because Matthew had again postponed mediation. On seeing the door open, Pat the secretary hastily tried to hide a copy of the Daily Mail she'd been poring over with Morris. On realising that the new arrival was Robin rather than Strike, Pat had given her Raven's core of laughter and slapped the paper back onto her desk. Caught red-handed, said Morris, with a wink at Robin. Seeing all this about the boss's ex? He's not my boss, he's my partner, thought Robin. But she merely said, yes. Talk about punching above his bloody weight, said Morris, examining a picture of Charlotte at twenty-one in a beaded mini-dress. The fuck did a bloke who looks like him end up with that? Robin wasn't even safe from it at home. Max, whose floppy hair had been cropped short to play the ex-army officer, had begun shooting his TV series and was more cheerful than she'd ever known him. Max was also thoroughly intrigued to know that Strike had been involved with Charlotte for sixteen years. I met her once, he told Robin, who'd come upstairs after several hours in her room combing online records for Betty Fuller. The one-time prostitute was proving harder to find than she'd anticipated. Really? said Robin who both wanted and didn't want to hear the story. Yeah, I was in a play years ago with a half-brother. Simon Lagarde? He starred in that mini-series about the financial crash. What was it called? She came to watch our play and took us all out for dinner afterwards. I liked her, actually. She was a real laugh. Some of those posh girls are a lot funnier than you'd think. Hmm, said Robin, non-committally, and she returned immediately to her room with her cup of tea. I bet she tried to call Coram before she did it was Ilse's cool comment on the phone, two weeks after Easter, by which time Robin had succeeded, through patient cross-referencing, in identifying the woman she thought was most likely to be the Betty Fuller who'd lived in Skinner Street at the time of Margot Bamborough's disappearance. Betty was now living in sheltered housing in Sands Walk, not far from her original flat, and Robin planned to pay her a visit the following afternoon, after the mediation with Matthew, which seemed at last to be going ahead. 
Ilsa had run to wish Robin good luck. Robin had been trying not to think about having to see Matthew, telling herself that the ordeal would be over in a couple of hours, but it had become progressively harder to focus on her list of questions for Betty Fuller as the evening progressed, and she'd been glad, initially, to be interrupted by Ilsa. "'What's Corm saying about the whole Charlotte thing?' Ilsa asked. "'Nothing,' said Robin truthfully. "'No, he never talks about her any more,' said Ilsa. "'I wonder how much longer her marriage is going to last. Must be hanging by a thread. I'm quite surprised it's limped on this long, actually. She only did it to get back at Corm. "'Well, she's had children with Jago,' Robin pointed out, then instantly regretted it. Ilsa had already told her that she and Nick had decided not to try a fourth round of IVF. "'She never wanted kids,' said Ilsa. "'That was something she and Corm had in common. "'That and having really similar mothers. "'Drink, drugs and a million men each. "'Except Charlotte's is still alive. "'So you haven't spoken to him about it all?' "'No,' said Robin, "'who was feeling marginally worse for this conversation "'in spite of Ilsa's kind intentions.' Ilsa, sorry, but I better go. I've got work to do for tomorrow. Can't you take the afternoon off? We can meet for a coffee. You'll probably need some R and R afterwards. Corn wouldn't mind, would he? I'm sure he wouldn't, said Robin. But we're so busy, and I'm following up a lead. Anyway, work gives me something to think about other than Matthew. Let's catch up at the weekend, if you're free. Robin slept badly that night. It wasn't Charlotte who wove her way in and out of her dreams, but Miss Jones the agency's client who, as everyone had now noticed, had taken such a shine to strike that he'd had to ask Pat to stop putting her calls through. Robin woke before her alarm went off, glad to escape a complicated dream in which it was revealed that Miss Jones had been Matthew's wife all along and that Robin was defending herself against a charge of fraud at the end of a long polished table in a dark boardroom. Wanting to look professional and confident, she dressed in black trousers and jacket, even though Matthew knew perfectly well that she spent most of her investigative life in jeans. Casting one last look in her mirror before leaving her room, she thought she looked washed out. Trying not to think of all those pictures of Charlotte Ross, who rarely dressed in anything but black, but whose porcelain beauty merely shone brighter in contrast, Robin grabbed her handbag and left her room. While waiting for the tube, Robin tried to distract herself from the squirming feeling of nerves in her stomach, by checking her emails. Dear Miss Ellicott, As previously stated, I am not prepared to talk to anyone except Mr. Strike. This is not intended as any slight on you, but I would feel more comfortable speaking man to man. Unfortunately, I will be unavailable from the end of next week due to work commitments which will be taking me out of the country. However, I can make space on the evening of the 24th. If this is agreeable to Mr. Strike, I suggest the American bar in the Stafford Hotel as a discreet meeting place. Kindly let me know if this is acceptable. Sincerely, C. B. Oakden Twenty minutes later, when she'd emerged from Hoban Tube Station and had reception again, Robin forwarded this message to strike. She had a comfortable quarter of an hour to spare before her appointment, and there were plenty of places to grab a coffee in her vicinity. But before she could do so, her mobile rang. It was Pat at the office. Robin, said the familiar croaking voice. Do you know where Cormoran is? I've tried his phone, but he's not picking up. I've got his brother Al here in the office wanting to see him. Really, said Robin, startled. She'd met Al a couple of years previously, but knew that he and Stripe weren't close. No, I don't know where he is, Pat. Have you left a message? He's probably somewhere he can't pick up. Yeah, I've left a voicemail, said Pat. All right, I'll keep trying him. Bye. Robin walked on, her desire for a coffee forgotten in her curiosity about Al turning up at the office. She'd quite liked Al when she'd met him. He seemed in slight awe of his older half-brother, which Robin had found endearing. Al didn't look much like Strike, being shorter with straight hair, a narrow jaw, and the slight divergent squint he'd inherited from their famous father. Thinking about Strike's family, she turned the corner and saw— with a thrill of dread that brought her to a halt, Matthew climbing out of a taxi, wearing an unfamiliar dark overcoat over his suit. His head turned, and for a moment they were looking at each other, fifty yards apart, 
like gunslingers ready to fire. Then Robin's mobile rang. She reached for it automatically, and when she put it to her ear and looked up, Matthew had disappeared into the building. Hello? Hi, said Strike. Just got the email from Oakden. Out of the country, my arse. Robin glanced at her watch. She still had five minutes, and her lawyer, Judith, was nowhere in sight. She drew back against the cold stone wall and said, Yeah, I thought that too. Have you rung Pat back? No, why? Al's at the office. Al who? Your brother Al, said Robin. There was a brief pause. Fuck's sake, said Strike under his breath. Where are you? asked Robin. At a B&Q in Chingford, our blonde friend in Stoke Newington shopping. What for? Rubber foam and MDF, for starters, said Strike. That bloke from Shift is Jim's helping her. Where are you? Waiting outside Matthew's lawyers. It's mediation morning, said Robin. Shit, said Strike. I forgot. Best of luck. Listen, take the rest of the day off if you'd... I don't want time off, said Robin. she just spotted Judith in the distance, walking briskly towards her in a red coat. I'm planning to go and see Betty Fuller afterwards. I better go, Cormoran. Speak later. She hung up and walked forwards to meet Judith, who smiled broadly. All right, she asked, patting Robin on the arm with a hand not holding her briefcase. Should be fine. You let me do the talking. Right, said Robin, smiling back with as much warmth as she could muster. They walked up the steps together into a small lobby area, where a stocky, suited man, with a haircut like Caesar's, came forward with a perfunctory smile, his hand outstretched to Judith. Miss Cobbs? Andrew Shentstone, Miss Ellicott, how do you do? His handshake left Robin's hand throbbing. He and Judith walked ahead of Robin through double doors, chatting about London traffic, and Robin followed, dry-mouthed and feeling like a child trailing its parents. After a short walk up a dark corridor, they turned left into a small meeting room with an oval table and a shabby blue carpet. Matthew was sitting there alone, still wearing his overcoat. He readjusted himself in his chair when they entered. Robin looked directly into his face as she sat down, diagonally opposite him. To her surprise, Matthew looked instantly away. She'd imagined him glaring across the table with that strange muzzle-like whitening around his mouth he'd worn during arguments towards the end of their marriage. Right then, said Andrew Shenstone with another smile, as Judith Cobbs opened the file she'd brought with her. He had a leather document holder sitting, closed, in front of him. Your client's position remains as stated in your letter of the 14th, Judith. Is that correct? That's right, said Judith, her thick black glasses perched on the end of her nose as she scanned a copy of said letter. Miss Ellicott's perfectly happy to forego any claim on your client, except in respect of the proceeds from the sale of the flat in, um... Hastings rolled, thought Robin. She remembered moving into the cramped conversion with Matthew, excitedly carrying boxes of pot plants and books up the short path, Matthew plugging in the coffee machine that had been one of their first joint purchases, the fluffy elephant he'd given her so long ago, sitting on the bed. Hastings Road, yes, said Judith, scanning her letter, from which she'd like the ten thousand pounds her parents contributed to the deposit upon purchase. Ten thousand, repeated Andrew Shenston. He and Matthew looked at each other. In that case, we're agreeable. You're agreeable, said Judith Cobbs, as surprised as Robin herself. My client's circumstances have changed, said Shenstone. His priority now is securing the divorce as speedily as possible, which I think your client has indicated is also preferable to her, accepting the ten thousand pounds. Of course, added Shenstone, we're almost at the requisite two years, so— Judith looked at Robin, who nodded, her mouth still dry. "'Then I think we can conclude things today. Very good indeed,' said Andrew Shenstone complacently, and it was impossible to escape the suspicion that he was addressing himself. "'I've taken the liberty of drawing up—' He opened his document holder, spun it around on the polished tabletop, and pushed it towards Judith, who read the document inside carefully. "'Yes,' she said finally sliding the document sideways to Robin, who learned that Matthew was promising to transfer the money to Robin's account within seven days of signature. Happy? Judith added in an undertone to Robin. Yes, said Robin, slightly dazed. 
what she wondered had been the point of dragging her here. Had it been one last demonstration of power, or had Matthew only decided that morning to give in? She reached into her handbag, but Judith was already holding out her own fountain pen, so Robin took it and signed. Judith passed the document back to Andrew Shenstone, who slid it over to Matthew, who scrawled a hasty signature. He glanced up at Robin when he'd done so, then looked quickly away again. And in that moment Robin knew what had happened, and why he'd given her what she wanted. "'Very good,' said Andrew Shenstone again, and he slapped the table with his thick hand and laughed. "'Well, short and sweet, eh? I think we're—' "'Yes,' said Judith, with a little laugh. "'I think we are.' Matthew and Robin rose, and watched their lawyers gathering up their things, and in Judith's case, pulling her coat back on. Disorientated by what had just happened, Robin again had the sensation of being a child with its parents, unsure how to quit the situation, waiting for the lawyers to release her. Andrew Shenstone held the door open for Robin, and she passed back into the corridor, heading towards the lobby. Behind her, the lawyers were talking about traffic again. When they paused in the lobby to take leave of each other, Matthew, after a brief word of thanks to Shenstone, walked straight out past Robin into the street. Robin waited for Andrew Shenstone to disappear inside the building again before addressing Judith. Thanks so much, she said. <laughs> well, I didn't really do much, did I? said Judith, laughing. But mediation often brings people to their senses. I've seen it happen before. Much harder to justify yourself in a room with objective observers. They shook hands, and Robin headed out into a spring breeze that blew her hair into her mouth. She felt slightly unsettled. Ten thousand pounds. She'd offered to give it back to her parents, knowing that they'd struggled to match Matthew's parents' contribution, but they'd told her to keep it. She'd have to settle her bill with Judith, of course, but the remainder would give her a buffer, maybe even help her back towards her own place. She turned a corner, and there, right in front of her, Standing at the curb, his arm raised in his attempt to hail a taxi, was Matthew. Catching sight of her, he stood frozen for a moment, his hand still raised, and the taxi he'd been trying to hail slowed ten yards away and picked up a couple instead. Sarah's pregnant, isn't she? said Robin. He looked down at her, not quite as tall as Strike, but as good-looking as he'd been at seventeen on the day he'd asked her out. Yeah, he hesitated. It was an accident. Was it hell? thought Robin. Sarah had always known how to get what she wanted. Robin realised at last how long a game Sarah had played, always present, giggling, flirting, prepared to settle for Matthew's best friend to keep him close. Then, as her clutch tightened, but Matthew threatened to slip through it, there'd been the diamond earring she'd left in Robin's bed, and now— still more valuable, a pregnancy to make sure of him before he could enter a dangerous state of singledom. Robin had a strong suspicion that this was what had lain behind the two postponements of mediation. Had a newly hormonal and insecure Sarah made scenes, frightened of Matthew coming face to face with Robin while he hadn't yet decided whether he wanted either the baby or its mother. And she wants to be married before she has it. Yeah said Matthew. Well, so do I. Did the image of their own wedding flash across his mind as it flashed across Robin's? The church in Massam that both of them had attended since primary school, the reception in that beautiful hotel with the swans in the lake that refused to swim together, and the disastrous reception during which Robin had known, for a few terrifying seconds, that if Strike had asked her to leave with him, she'd have gone. How are things with you? Great, said Robin. She put up a good front. What you do when you meet the ex, isn't it? Pretend you think you did the right thing. No regrets. Well, he said, as the traffic rolled past, I need to... He began to walk away. Matt, he turned back. What? I'll never forget how you were when I really needed you. Whatever else, I'll never forget that part. For a fraction of a second his face worked slightly, like a small boy's. Then he walked back to her, bent down, and before she knew what was happening, 
He'd hugged her quickly, then let go as though she was red hot. Good luck, Robs, he said thickly, and walked away for good. Chapter 56 Whereas this lady, like a sheep astray, now drowned in the depth of sleep all fearless lay. Edmund Spencer, the Fairy Queen At the precise moment Matthew turned to walk away from Robin in Hoban, Strike, who was sitting in his parked car three miles away, outside the familiar terraced house in Stoke Newington, decided to call his brother, lest Al sit in wait for him at the office all day. The detective's anger was shot through with other, less easily identifiable feelings, of which the least painful to acknowledge was grudging admiration for Al's persistence. Strike didn't doubt that Al had come to the office for a last-ditch attempt to persuade Strike into some form of reconciliation with his father, preferably before or during the party to celebrate his father's new album. Having always considered Al a fairly weak and sybaritic character, Strike had to admit he was showing guts, risking his older brother's fury. Strike waited until Eleanor Dean had unloaded the foam and the cheap wood from her car and carried it all inside with the aid of her friend from Shifty's gym, watched the front door close, then called Al's number. Hi, said Al, picking up after a single ring. Why are you in my office? asked Strike. Wanted to see you, bruv. Talk face to face. Well, I won't be back there today, lied Strike. So I suggest you say whatever it is you've got to say now. Bruv, who's there with you? Uh, your secretary, Pat, is it? Strike heard Al turn away from his mobile to check, and heard Pat's core of agreement. And a bloke called Barclay, said the Scot loudly in the background. Right, well, go into my office for some privacy, said Strike. He listened while Al told Pat what Strike had asked him to do, heard the familiar sound of his own office door closing, then said, If this is about what I think it's about, Cormoran, we didn't want to tell you this, but Dad's got cancer. Oh, for fuck's sake. Strike leaned forwards momentarily and rested his forehead on the steering wheel of his car before he sat up again. Prostate, Al continued. They reckon they caught it early. But we thought you should know because this party isn't just about celebrating the band's anniversary in the new album. It's about giving him something to look forward to. There was a silence. We thought you should know, Al repeated. Why should I fucking know? Thought Strike, eyes on the closed door of Eleanor Dean's house. He had no relationship with Rokeby. Did Al expect him to weep, to rush to Rokeby's side, to express compassion or pity? Rokeby was a multimillionaire. Doubtless he'd enjoy the very best treatment. The memory of Joan's lily urn bobbing away on the sea recurred as Strike said, OK, well, I don't really know how to respond to that. I'm sure it's a bugger for everyone who cares about him. Another long silence followed. We thought this might make a difference, said Al quietly. To what? To your attitude. As long as they've caught it early, he'll be fine, said Strike bracingly. Probably live to father another couple of kids he never sees. Jesus Christ, said Al, really angry now. You might not give a shit, but he happens to be my dad. I give a shit about people who've ever given a shit about me, said Strike. And keep your fucking voice down. Those are my employees you're airing my private business in front of. That's your priority. Strike thought of Charlotte who, according to the papers, remained in hospital, and of Lucy, who was agitating to know whether Strike would be able to take the weekend off to join Ted at her house in Bromley for the weekend. He thought of the clients in the Shifty case, who were hinting they'd terminate payment in a week's time unless the agency found out what hold Shifty had on his boss. He thought of Margot Bamborough and the rapidly vanishing year they'd been allotted to find out what had happened to her. Inexplicably, he thought of Robin and the fact that he'd forgotten that today was her mediation session with Matthew. "'I've got a life,' said Strike, keeping a curb on his temper only by exercising maximum self-control, which is hard and complicated, just like anyone else's. 
Rugby's got a wife and half a dozen kids, and I'm at maximum capacity for people who need me. I'm not coming to his fucking party. I'm not interested in hearing from him. I don't want a relationship with him. I don't know how much clearer I can make this, Al, but I'm... The line went dead. Without regretting anything he'd said, but nevertheless breathing heavily, Strike threw his mobile onto the passenger seat, lit a cigarette, and watched Eleanor Dean's front door for another fifteen minutes, until, on a sudden whim, he snatched up the phone from beside him again and called Barclay. "'What are you doing right now?' "'Following my expenses,' said the Scot laconically. "'That casino cost ye a fortune.' "'Is my brother still there?' "'No, he left.' Good. I need you to come and take over in Stoke Newington. I haven't got my car with me. OK, well, fuck it then, said Strike angrily. I'm sorry, Strike, said Barclay, but I'm supposed to have this afternoon off. No, I'm sorry, said Strike, closing his eyes. He had the same sensation of a wire tightening around his forehead that he'd experienced in St. Moore's. Getting frustrated. Enjoy your afternoon off. Seriously, he added, in case Barclay thought he was being sarcastic. Having hung up on Barclay, Strike rang Robin. How did mediation go? Fine, said Robin, though she sounded strangely flat. We've settled. Great. Yeah, it's a relief. Did you say you were going to Betty Fuller's? Yes. I was just about to head into the tube. Remind me where she lives. Sheltered housing on Sands Walk in Clerkenwell. OK, I'll meet you there, said Strike. Really? I'm fine to... I know, but I want to be there. Strike cut across her. He pulled away from Eleanor Dean's house, knowing that he'd just been abrasive towards his two favourite colleagues. If he was going to vent his temper, it could at least have been at Pat and Morris's expense. Twenty minutes later... Strike entered Clerkenwell via Percival Street. To his right were the nondescript red brick flats where Janice Beatty and Steve Douthwaite had once lived, and he wondered yet again what had become of Margot's one-time patient, whose whereabouts, in spite of his and Robin's best efforts, remained unknown. Sands Walk was a narrow, pedestrianised one-way street. Strike parked his BMW as close to it as possible. The day was surprisingly warm, in spite of a good amount of cloud. As he approached Sands Walk, he saw Robin waiting for him at the entrance. Hi, she said. It's up the other end, that red brick modern building with the circular tower thing on top. Great, said Strike, as they set off together. Sorry for earlier, I... No, it's fine, said Robin. I know we really need results soon. But Strike thought he detected a slight coolness. Al piss me off, he explained. So I might have been a bit. Cormoran is fine, repeated Robin, but with a smile that reassured Strike. Great news about the mediation, he said. Yes, said Robin, though she didn't look particularly pleased. So what do you think's the best tack to take with Betty Fuller? Be honest and direct about who we are and what we're investigating, said Strike, and then play it by ear, I think and hope to Christ she's not demented. Priory House was a modern, multi-level building with a shared garden at the back. As they approached the front doors, a middle-aged couple came out. They had the relieved look of people who'd just done their duty, and, smiling at Strike and Robin, they held open the door to let them walk inside. Thanks very much, said Robin, smiling at them. As the couple walked on, she heard the woman say, At least she remembered who we are this time. Had it not been for the mobility scooters, the place would have resembled a hall of residence, with its hardy dark grey carpet underfoot, its bulletin board bristling with pamphlets, and a depressing smell of communal cooking hanging in the air. She's on the ground floor, said Robin, pointing towards a corridor. I checked the names on the buzzer. They passed a number of identical pine doors, until they reached the one with Elizabeth Fuller, printed on a card in a metal holder. Through the wood came the muffled sounds of voices. Just as it had been when he'd visited Janice Beatty, the TV was turned up very high inside. Strike rapped hard on the door. After a lengthy wait, 
the door opened very slowly to reveal a panting old lady wearing a nasal cannula, who pulled her oxygen tank to the door with her. Over her shoulder, Strike saw a TV blaring the reality show, The Only Way is Essex. I'm fine. You just upset me, Og, a heavily made-up girl in bright blue was saying on screen. Betty Fuller looked as though she'd been subject to heavier gravity than the rest of humankind. Everything about her had sagged and drooped. The corners of her lipless mouth, her papery eyelids, her loose jowls, the tip of her thin nose. It appeared that the flesh had been sucked down out of her upper body into her lower. Betty had almost no bust, but her hips were broad, and her poor bare legs were immensely swollen, both ankles thicker than her neck. She wore what looked like a pair of men's slippers and a dark green knitted dress, on which there were several stains. A yellowish scalp was clearly visible through the sparse grey hair slicked back off her face, and a hearing aid was prominent in her left ear. "'Who are you?' she wheezed, looking from Robin to Strike. "'Afternoon, Mrs. Fuller,' said Strike loudly and clearly. "'My name's Cormoran Strike, and this is Robin Ellicott.' He pulled his driver's license out of his pocket and showed it to her with his card. She made an impatient gesture to show she couldn't read them. Her eyes were milky with glaucoma. "'We're private detectives,' said Strike voice still raised over the arguing pair on screen. At the end of the day, Lucy, she slept on a one-night stand with a boy. Arg, 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 this is irrelevant. We've been hired to try and find out what happened to Margot Bambara. She was a doctor who... Who? Dr. Margot Bambara, Strike repeated, still more loudly. She went missing from Clerkenwell in 1974. We heard you... Oh, yeah! said Betty Fuller, who appeared to need to draw breath every few words. Dr. Bambara, <gasps> yeah. Well, we wondered whether we could talk to you about her. Betty Fuller stood there for what seemed a very long twenty seconds, thinking this over, while on screen a young man in a maroon suit said to the over-made-up girl, I didn't want to bring it up, but you come over to me. Betty Fuller made an impatient gesture, turned and shuffled back inside. Strike and Robin glanced at each other. "'Is it all right to come in, Mrs. Fuller?' asked Strike loudly. She nodded, having carefully positioned her oxygen tank. She fell back into her armchair, then tugged the knitted dress in an effort to make it cover her knees. Strike and Robin entered the room and Strike closed the door. Watching the old lady struggle to pull her dress down, Robin had an urge to take a blanket off the unmade bed and place it decorously over her lap. Robin had discovered during her research that Betty was eighty-four. The old lady's physical state shocked her. The small room smelled of B.O. and urine. A door showed a small toilet leading off the single bedroom. Through the open wardrobe door, Robin saw crumpled clothes which had been thrown there and two empty wine bottles, half hidden in underwear. There was nothing on the walls except a cat calendar. The month of May showed a pair of ginger kittens peeking out from between pink geranium blossoms. "'Would it be all right to turn this down?' Strike shouted over the TV. Where the couple on screen continued to argue, the woman's eyelashes as thick as woolly bear caterpillars. "'Turn it off,' said Betty Fuller. "'It's a recording.' The Essex voices were suddenly extinguished. The two detectives looked around. There were only two choices for seats, the unmade bed and a hard, upright chair. So Robin took the former, Strike the latter. Removing his notebook from his pocket, Strike said, We've been hired by Dr. Bambara's daughter, Mrs. Fuller, to try and find out what happened to her. Betty Fuller made a noise like, Hmm? which sounded disparaging, although Strike thought it might also have been an attempt to clear phlegm out of her throat. She rocked slightly to one side in her chair and pulled, ineffectually, at the back of her dress. Her swollen lower legs were knotted with varicose veins. So, you remember Dr. Bambara disappearing, do you, Mrs. Fuller? Yes, she grunted, still breathing heavily. In spite of her incapacity and unpromising manner, Strike had the impression of somebody both more alert than they might appear at first glance, and happier to have company and attention 
than the unprepossessing exterior might suggest. You were living in Skinner Street then, weren't you? She coughed, which seemed to clear her lungs, and in a slightly steadier voice she said, Was there till last year? Michael Cliff, house, top floor. Couldn't manage no more. Strike glanced at Robin. He'd expected her to lead the interrogation, assumed Betty would respond better to a woman, but Robin seemed oddly passive, sitting on the bed, her gaze wandering over the small room. Were you one of Dr. Bamborough's patients? Strike asked Betty. Yeah, wheezed Betty. <gasps> I was. Robin was thinking, is this where single people end up, people without children to look out for them, without double incomes, in small boxes, living vicariously through reality stars? Next Christmas, no doubt, she'd run into Matthew, Sarah, and their new baby in Massam. She could just imagine Sarah's proud strut through the streets, pushing a top-of-the-range pushchair, Matthew beside her, and a baby with Sarah's white blonde hair peeking over the top of the blankets. Now, when Jenny and Stephen ran into them, there'd be common ground, the shared language of parenthood. Robin decided there and then, sitting on Betty Fuller's bed, to make sure she didn't go home next Christmas. She'd offer to work through it if necessary. Did you like Dr. Bamborough? Strike was asking Betty. She were all right, said Betty. Did you ever meet any of the other doctors at the practice? asked Strike. Betty Fuller's chest rose and fell with her laboured breathing. Though it was hard to tell with the nasal cannula in the way, Strike thought he saw a thin smile. Yeah, she said. Which ones? Brenner, she said hoarsely, and coughed again. Needed an house call. <gasps> Emergency. She weren't available. So Dr. Brenner came out to see you? Hmm, <clears throat> said Betty Fuller. Yeah. There were a few small, cheaply famed photographs on the windowsill, Robin noticed. Two of them showed a fat tabby cat, presumably a lamented pet, but there were also a couple showing toddlers, and one of two big-haired teenaged girls wearing puff-sleeved dresses from the eighties. So you could end up alone in near squalor, even if you had children. Was it solely money, then, that made the difference? She thought of the ten thousand pounds she'd be receiving into her bank account later that week, which would be reduced immediately by legal bills and council tax. She'd need to be careful not to fritter it away. She really needed to start saving, to start paying into a pension. You must have been seriously unwell, were you? Strike was asking Betty, to need a house call. He had no particular reason for asking, except to establish a friendly conversational atmosphere. In his experience of old ladies, there was little they enjoyed more than discussing their health. Betty Fuller suddenly grinned at him, showing chipped yellow teeth. You ever taken it up the shitter with the nine-inch cock? Only by exercising the utmost restraint did Robin prevent herself letting out a shocked laugh. She had to hand it to strike. He didn't so much as grin as he said, can't say I have. Well, wheezed Betty Fuller, you can take it from me. Fucking agony. Geezer went at me like a fucking power drill. Split my arsehole open. She gasped for air, half laughing. My Cindy hears me moaning. Blood says, Mum, you gotta get that scene to called Doctor. Cindy's your daughter, said Betty Fuller. Yeah, got to Cindy and Kathy. And Dr. Brenner came out to see you, did he? asked Strike, trying not to dwell on the mental image Betty had conjured. Yeah, takes a look, sends me to A&A, yeah. Nineteen stitches, said Betty Fuller, and I sat on an ice pack for a week. And no fucking money coming in. After that, she panted, no anal, unless they was paying double and nothing over. Six inches, neither. 
she let out a cackle of laughter, which ended in coughs. Strike and Robin were carefully avoiding looking at each other. Was that the only time you met Dr. Brenner? asked Strike, when the coughing had subsided. No, croaked Betty Fuller, thumping her chest. I'd seen him regular, every Friday night, for months after. She didn't seem to feel any qualms about telling Strike this. On the contrary, Strike thought she seemed to be enjoying herself. When did that arrangement start? asked Strike. Couple of weeks after he'd seen me for me arse, said Betty Fuller. Knocked on me door with his doctor's bag, pretending he'd come to check. Then he says, wants a regular appointment, Friday night, half past six. Tell the neighbours, medical, if they ask. Betty paused to cough noisily. When she'd quelled her rattling chest, she went on. And if I told anyone, he'd go to cops, say I was extorting him. Threatened you, did he? Yeah, panted Betty Fuller, though without rancour. But he wasn't trying to get it free, so I kept me mouth shut. You never told Dr. Bamborough what was going on, asked Robin. Betty looked sideways at Robin, who in Strike's view had rarely looked as out of place as she did sitting on Betty's bed. Young, clean and healthy, and perhaps Betty's drooping, occluded eyes saw his partner the same way, because she seemed to resent both question and questioner. Course I fucking didn't. She tried to get me to stop working. Brenner, easiest job of the week. Why was that? asked Strike. Betty laughed wheezily again. <laughs> he liked me, lying still like I was coma, plain dead. He fucked me, saying his dirty words. I pretended, couldn't hear, except once, <laughs> said Betty, with a half chuckle, half cough. The bleeding firearm went off halfway. I said in his ear, I'm not staying dead if we're on fucking fire. I've got kids next room. He was livid. Turned out it was false alarm. She cackled, then coughed again. Do you think Dr. Bamborough suspected Dr. Brenner of visiting you? asked Robin. No, said Betty testily, with another sideways glance. Course she fucking didn't. Was either of us going to tell her? Was Brenner with you? asked Strike, the night she went missing. Yeah, said Betty Fuller indifferently. He arrived and left at the usual times? Yeah, said Betty again. Did he keep visiting you after Dr. Bamber had disappeared? No, said Betty. Police all over the surgery. No, he stopped coming. I heard he retired not long after. Dead now, I suppose. Yes, said Strike. He is. The ruined face bore witness to past violence. Strike, whose own nose had been broken, was sure Betty's hadn't originally been the shape it was now, with its crooked tip. Was Brenner ever violent to you? Never. While your arrangement was going on, said Strike, did you ever mention it to anyone? Nope, said Betty. What about after Brenner retired? asked Strike. Did you happen to tell a man called Tudor Aythorn? Clever, ain't you? said Betty, with a cackle of mild surprise. Yeah, I told Tudor. He's long gone as well. Used to drink with Tudor. His nephew's still round here grown up. I see him about retarded, said Betty Fuller. In your opinion, said Strike, given what you know about Brenner, do you think he'd have taken advantage of a patient? There was a pause. Betty's milky eyes surveyed Strike. Only if she was out cold. Not otherwise, said Strike. Taking a deep breath of oxygen through her crooked nose, Betty said, Man like that, when there's one thing what really gets him off, that's all he wants. Did he ever want to drug you? asked Strike. No, said Betty. Didn't need to. Do you remember, asked Strike, turning a page in his notebook, a social worker called Wilma Bayliss? Coloured girl, said Betty. Yeah, you smoke, don't you? She added. 
can smell it. Give us one, she said, and out of the wrecked old body came a whiff of flirtatiousness. I don't think that's a good idea, said Strike, smiling, seeing as you're an oxygen. Oh, fuck off, then, said Betty. Did you like Wilmer? Who? Wilma Bayliss, your social worker. She were, like they all are, said Betty, with a shrug. We spoke to Mrs. Bayliss's daughters recently, said Strike. They were telling us about the threatening notes that were sent to Dr. Bamborough before she disappeared. Betty breathed in and out, her collapsed chest doing its valiant best for her, and a small squeak issued from her ruined lungs. Do you know anything about those notes? No, said Betty. I heard they'd been sent. Everyone heard round here. Who did they hear it from? Probably that Irene Bull. You remember Irene, do you? With many more pauses to catch her breath, Betty Fuller explained that her younger sister had been in the same year as Irene at school. Irene's family had lived in a road off Skinner Street, Corporation Row. Thought her shit smelled of roses, that one, said Betty. She laughed, but then broke yet again into a volley of hoarse coughs. When she'd recovered, she said, The police asked them all not to talk, but the math on that girl, everyone knew there'd been threats made. According to Wilma's daughters, said Strike, watching for Betty's reaction, you knew who sent those notes. No, I never, said Betty Fuller, no longer smiling. You were sure Marcus Bayliss hadn't sent them, though? Marcus, never. He was a lovely. You know, I always liked a darky, me, said Betty Fuller. And Robin, hoping Betty hadn't seen her wince, looked down at her hands. Very handsome. I'd have given it him for free. <laughs> Big, tall man, said Betty wistfully. Kind man. No, he never threatened no doctor. So who do you think? My second girl, my Cathy, continued Betty, determinedly deaf. Her dad was a darky. Dunno who he was. Condom split. I kept her cause I, I like kids, but she don't give a shit about me. Smackhead, said Betty fiercely. I never touched it. Seen too many go that way. Stole from me. I told her, keep the fuck my house. Cindy's good, gasped Betty. She was fighting her breathlessness now, though still relishing Strike's captive attention. Cindy drops by, earning decent money. Really? said Strike, playing along, waiting for his opportunity. What does Cindy do? Escort, wheezed Betty. Lovely figure, up west, making more than I ever. Arabs and what not. But she says, Ma, you wouldn't like it these days. All they want is anal. Betty cackled, coughed, and then, without warning, turned her head to look at Robin perched on the bed, and said with vitriol, She don't find it. Funny, this one, do you? She demanded of Robin, who was taken aback. Spect, you give it away for meals and jewellery and think it's, think it's free. Look at her face, wheezed Betty, eyeing Robin with dislike. You're the same as the sniffy fucking social worker we had round when I, minding Cathy's kids, Gone now, said Betty angrily. Took into care. Knew, Mrs. Fuller, said Betty, adopting a grotesquely genteel accent. Knew, it makes new difference to me how you ladies make ends meet. Sex work is work. They'll tell you that, patronising fucking. But would they want their daughters doing it? Would they fuck? said Betty Fuller, and she paid for her longest speech yet with her most severe spate of coughing. Cindy does too much coke, Betty wheezed, her eyes watering when she could talk again. 
keeps the weight off. Kathy, it was smack. Boyfriend, working for him, beat her blue, pregnant, and lost it. I'm sorry to hear that, said Strike. It's all kids on the street these days, said Betty, and a glimmer of what Strike thought was real distress showed through the determinedly tough exterior. Thirteen, fourteen, children, my day. We'd have marched them right back home. It's all right, grown women, but kids. What you fucking staring at? She barked to Robin. Cormoran, I might, said Robin, standing up and gesturing towards the door. Yeah, off you fuck, said Betty Fuller, watching with satisfaction as Robin left her room. You doing her, are you? She wheezed at strike, once the door had clicked shut behind Robin. No, he said. What the fuck's point, then? She's very good at the job, said Strike. When she's not up against someone like you, that is. And Betty Fuller grinned, displaying her cheddar yellow teeth. Ha, <laughs> I know her, her type. Knows fucking nothing about real life. There was a man living in Leather Lane back in Margot Bamborough's day, said Strike. Name of Niccolò Ricci. Mucky, they used to call him. Betty Fuller said nothing, but the milky eyes narrowed. "'What do you know about Ricci?' asked Strike. "'Same as everyone,' said Betty. Out of the corner of his eye, Strike saw Robin emerge into the daylight. She lifted her hair briefly off her neck, as though needing to remove weight from herself, then walked out of sight with her hands in her jacket pockets. "'It weren't mucky what threatened her.' said Betty. He wouldn't write notes. Not his style. Ricci turned up at the St. John's practice Christmas party, said Strike, which seemed odd. Don't know nothing about that. Some of the people at the party assumed he was Gloria Conti's father. Never heard of her, wheezed Betty. According to Wilma Bayliss's daughters, said Strike, you told their mother you were scared of the person who wrote the notes. You said the writer of the notes killed Margot Bamborough. You told Wilma he'd kill you too if you said who he was. Betty's milky eyes were expressionless. Her thin chest laboured to get enough oxygen into her lungs. Stryker just concluded that she definitely wasn't going to talk when she opened her mouth. Local girl I knew she said. Friend of mine. She met Mucky. He come cruising our corner. He says to Jen, You're better than this. Work in the street. Body like yours. I could get you five times what you're earning here. So off Jen goes, said Betty. Up west, Soho, stripping for punters, sex with his mates. I met her a couple of years later, visiting her mum. And she told me a story. Girl at their club, gorgeous girl, Jen said, <gasps> got raped. Knife point. Cut, said Betty Fuller, indicating her own sagging torso. Right down the ribs <gasps> by a mate of Ricci's. Some people, said the old woman, think a hooker being raped. It just means she never got paid. Spec your miss stick it up her ass, said Betty, glancing at the window. Thinks that, but it ain't that. This girl, angry, wants revenge. Get back at Ricci. So the silly bitch turns police informer. And Mucky found out, wheezed Betty Fuller. And he filmed it as they killed her. My mate Jem was told by someone what had seen the film. Ricci kept it in the safe, show people, if they needed scaring. Jen's dead now, said Betty Fuller. Overdosed, thirty-odd years ago. Thought she'd be better up west than here's me, working the streets, still alive. I ain't got nothing to say about no notes. It weren't Marcus, that's all. That's my meals on wheels, said Betty her head turning, and Strike saw a man heading towards the outside door 
with a pile of foil trays in his arm. I'm done, Betty said, who seemed suddenly tired and cross. You can turn, telly back on, and move that table over. Pass me that knife and fork in the loo. She'd rinsed them off in the bathroom sink, but they were still dirty. Strike washed them again before taking them to her. After arranging the table in front of her armchair and turning the only wears Essex back on, he opened the door to the Meals on Wheels man, who was grey-haired and cheery. "'Oh, hello,' said the newcomer in a loud voice. "'This your son, Betty?' "'Is he fuck?' wheezed Betty Fuller. "'What you got?' "'Chicken casserole and jelly and custard, love.' "'Thanks very much for talking to me, Mrs. Fuller.' said Strike. But Betty's stock of goodwill had plainly been exhausted, and she was now far more interested in her food. Robin was leaning against a nearby wall, reading something off her phone, when Strike emerged from the building. I thought it was best to clear out, she said in a flat voice. How did it go? She won't talk about the notes, said Strike, as the pair of them headed back down Sands Walk. And if you ask me why... I'd say it's because she thinks Mucky Ricci wrote them. I found out a bit more about that girl in the snuff movie. You're joking, said Robin, looking worried. Apparently she was a police informer in one of Ricci's... Robin gasped. Cara Wolfson. What? Cara Wolfson. One of the women they thought Creed might have killed. Cara worked at a nightclub in Soho. The owners put it about after she disappeared that she'd been a police informer. How did you know that? asked Strike, taken aback. He couldn't remember this information from the Demon of Paradise Park. Robin suddenly remembered that she'd heard this from Brian Tucker, back at the Star Cafe. She hadn't yet heard back from the Ministry of Justice about the possibility of interviewing Creed, and as Strike still had no inkling what she was up to, she said, Think I read it online but with a new heaviness pressing on her heart. Robin remembered that Kara's only remaining close relative, the brother she'd raised, had drunk himself to death. Hutchins had said the police weren't able to do anything about that film. Kara Wolfson's body might be anywhere. Some stories didn't have neat endings. There was nowhere to lay flowers for Kara Wolfson, unless it was on the corner near the strip joint, where she'd last been seen. Fighting the depression now threatening to overwhelm her, Robin raised her phone to show Strike what she'd been looking up, and said in a determinedly matter-of-fact voice, I was just reading about somnophilia, otherwise known as sleeping princess syndrome. Which I take it was Brenner's kink, said Robin, and reading off her phone she said, Somnophilia is a paraphilia in which the individual is sexually aroused by someone non-responsive. Some psychologists have linked somnophilia with necrophilia. Cormoran. You know how he had barbiturates stocked up in his office? Yeah, said Strike slowly, as they walked back towards his car. Well, this is going to give us something to talk to Dorothy's son about, isn't it? I wonder whether she was game for playing dead, or whether she found herself sleeping a long time after Brenner had been round for lunch. Robin gave a small shudder. I know, Strike continued, as he lit up. I said he'd be a last resort, but we've only got three months left. I'm starting to think I'm going to have to pay Mucky Ricci a visit. Chapter 57 But all his mind is set on Mucky Pelf, to hoard up heaps of evil-gotten mass, for which he others wrongs and wrecks himself. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Adding daytime surveillance of St. Peter's Roman Catholic nursing home to the rota meant that as May progressed, the agency was again struggling to cover all open cases. Strike wanted to know how many visitors were going in and out, and at what times, so that he might ascertain when he'd have the best chance of entering the building without running into one of the old gangster's relatives. The nursing home lay in a quiet Georgian street on the very edge of Clerkenwell, in a quiet, leafy enclave where dun-coloured brick houses sported neoclassical pediments and glossy black front doors. A dark wood plaque on the exterior wall of the nursing home was embellished with a cross and a biblical quotation in gold. For you know 
that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Peter 1, 18-19 Nice sentiment, a strike commented to Robin on one of their handovers, but nobody's getting in there without a good bit of cash. The private nursing home was small and clearly expensive. The staff, all of whom the agency quickly grew to know by sight, wore dark blue scrubs and hailed mostly from abroad. There was a black male nurse who sounded as though he'd come from Trinidad, and two blondes who talked Polish to each other every morning as they passed whichever agency member happened to be loitering in the area at the time, feigning a call on their mobile, reading a newspaper, or appearing to wait, slightly impatiently, for a friend who never showed up. A podiatrist and a hairdresser went regularly in and out of the home, but after two weeks' daytime surveillance, the agency tentatively concluded that Ricci only received visits on Sundays when his two sons appeared, wearing the resigned looks of people for whom this was an unwelcome chore. It was easy to identify which brother was which from pictures that had appeared in the press. Luca looked, in Barclay's phrase, like a piano fell on his head, having a bald, flat, noticeably scarred skull. Marco was smaller, slighter, and hairier, but gave off an air of barely contained violence, slamming his hand repeatedly on the nursing home's doorbell if the door wasn't opened immediately, and slapping a grandson round the back of the head for dropping a chocolate bar on the pavement. Both the brothers' wives had a hard-boiled look about them, and none of the family had the good looks Robin associated with Italians. The great-grandfather sitting mutely behind the doors of the nursing home might have been a true Latin, but his descendants were disappointingly pallid and Saxon in appearance, right down to the little ginger-haired boy who dropped his chocolate. It was Robin who first laid eyes on Ricci himself. On the third Saturday the agency was watching the home. Beneath her raincoat Robin was wearing a dress because she was meeting Strike later at the Stafford Hotel in Mayfair to interview C.B. Oakden. Robin, who'd never been to the hotel, had looked it up and learned that the five-star establishment, with its bowler-hatted doormen, was one of the oldest and smartest hotels in London, hence her atypical choice of surveillance wear. As she'd previously disguised herself while lurking outside St. Peter's, alternately beanie hat, hair up, dark contact lenses and sunglasses, she felt safe to look like herself for once as she strolled up and down the street, pretending to talk on the phone although she'd added clear-lensed glasses she'd removed for the Stafford. The elderly residents of St. Peter's were occasionally escorted or wheeled down the street in the afternoon to the nearby square, which had a central private garden enclosed by railings, open only to keyholders, there to doze or enjoy the lilac and pansies while well wrapped up against the cold. Hitherto the agency had seen only elderly women taken on the outings, but today, for the first time, an old man was among the group coming down a ramp at the side of the building. Robin recognised Ricci instantly, not by his lion ring, which, if he was wearing it, was well hidden beneath a tartan rug, but by the profile that time might have exaggerated, but could not disguise. His thick black hair was now dark grey, and his nose and earlobes enormous. The large eyes that reminded Strike of a basset hound had an even more pronounced droop these days. Ricci's mouth hung slightly open as one of the Polish nurses pushed him towards the square, talking to him brightly, but receiving no response. "'You are right in it, love,' the black male nurse called ahead to a frail-looking old lady wearing a sheepskin hat, and she laughed and nodded. Robin gave the group a head start, then followed, watching, as one of the nurses unlocked the gate to the garden, and the party disappeared inside. Walking around the square with her phone clamped to her ear, pretending to be in conversation, Robin thought how typical it was that today, of all days, she'd worn heels, never imagining that there might have been a possibility of approaching Ricci and chatting to him. The group from the nursing home had come to a halt beside flower beds of purple and yellow, Ricci parked in his wheelchair beside an empty park bench. The nurses chatted amongst themselves, and to those old ladies capable of doing so, while the old man stared vacantly across the lawns. If she'd been wearing her usual trainers, Robin thought, 
she might possibly have been able to scale the railings and get into the garden unseen. There was a clump of trees that would provide cover from the nurses, and she could have sidled over to Ricci and found out, at the very least, whether he had dementia. Unfortunately, she had absolutely no chance of managing that feat in her dress and high heels. As she completed her walk around the square, Robin spotted Saul Morris walking towards her. Morris was early, as he always tended to be, whenever it was Robin from whom he was taking over. He's gone to mention either the glasses or the heels first, Robin thought. High heels, said Morris, as soon as he was within earshot, his bright blue eyes sweeping over her. Don't think I've ever seen you in heels before. Funny. I never think of you as tall, but you are, aren't you? Sexy specs, too. Before Robin could stop him, he'd stooped and kissed her on the cheek. I'm the guy you're meeting on a blind date, he told her, straightening up again and winking. How do we account for the fact that I'm about to leave you standing here? Robin asked, unsmiling, and Morris laughed too hard, just as he did at Strike's mildest jokes. Dunno. What would it take to make you walk out on a blind date? asked Morris. You turning up, thought Robin. But ignoring the question, she checked her watch and said, If you're okay to take over now, I'll head. Here they come, said Morris quietly. Oh, the old fellow's outside this time, is he? I wondered why you'd abandon the front door. The comment aggravated Robin almost as much as his flirtatious manner. Why did he think she'd leave the front door unless the target had moved? Nevertheless, she waited beside him while the small group of nurses and residents, having decided that twenty minutes was enough fresh air, passed them on the other side of the street, heading back to the home. My kids were taken out like that at nursery, said Morris quietly, watching the group pass. All bundled up in pushchairs, the helpers wheeling them out. Some of that lot are probably wearing nappies, too, he said, his bright blue eyes following the St. Peter's party. Christ! I hope I never end up like that. Ricci's the only man, too, poor sod. I think they're very well looked after, Robin said, as the Trinidadian nurse shouted, Up we go in it! Like being a kid again, though, isn't it? said Morris, as they watched the wheelchairs rolling along in procession. But we're none of the perks. Suppose so, said Robin. I'll head off, then, if you're ready to take over. Yeah, no problem, said Morris but he immediately added, Where are you going, all dressed up like that? A meeting strike. Oh, said Morris, eyebrows raised. I see. No, said Robin, you don't. We're interviewing someone at a really smart hotel. Ah, said Morris. Sorry. But there was a strange complacency, bordering on complicity, about the way Morris bade a goodbye, and it wasn't until Robin had reached the end of the street that the unwelcome thought occurred to her that Morris had entirely misread the sharpness of her denial that she was going on a date with Strike, that he might, in fact, have interpreted it as Robin wanting to make it quite clear that her affections weren't engaged elsewhere. Was Morris, could he be, so deluded as to think that Robin was secretly hoping that his unsubtle flirtation might lead to something happening between them? Even after what had happened on Boxing Day, when she'd shouted at him for sending her that dick pic. Little though she wanted to believe it, she was afraid that the answer was yes. Morris had been extremely drunk when she'd shouted at him, and possibly incapable of judging just how truly angry and disgusted she'd been. He'd seemed sincerely ashamed of himself in the immediate aftermath, so she'd forced herself to be friendlier than she wanted to be, purely out of a desire to foster team cohesion. The result had been that Morris had returned to his pre-dick-pick ways. She only answered his late-night texts, mostly containing jokes and attempts at banter, to stop him pestering her with Have I Offended You follow-ups. Now it occurred to her that what she considered professionalism, Morris took as encouragement. Everything he said to her about work suggested that he saw her as less able and less experienced than the rest of the agency. Perhaps he also thought her naive enough to be flattered by the attentions of a man she actually found condescending and slimy. Morris, Robin thought, as she headed towards the tube, didn't actually like women. He desired them, but that, of course, was an entirely different matter. Robin, who was forever marked by the ineradicable memory of the man in the gorilla mask, 
knew better than most that desire and liking were different, and sometimes mutually exclusive things. Morris gave himself away constantly, not only in the way he spoke to Robin, but in his desire to call Mrs. Smith rich bitch, his attribution of venal or provocative motives to every woman under surveillance, in the barely disguised disgust with which he noted that Mucky Ricci was now forced to live in a houseful of females. Christ, I hope I never end up like that. Robin walked another few steps, and suddenly stopped dead, earning herself a curious glance from a passing traffic warden. She'd had an idea, triggered by what Morris had just said to her, or rather, the idea had slammed its way into the forefront of her mind, and she knew that it had been there in her subconscious all along, waiting for her to admit it. Moving aside so as not to get in the way of passers-by, Robin pulled out her phone and checked the list of paraphilias she'd last consulted when looking up sleeping princess syndrome. Auto nepiophilia. Oh, God, Robin muttered. That's it. That's got to be it. Robin called Strike, but his number went to voicemail. He was doubtless already on the tube, heading for the Stafford. After a moment or two's thought, she called Barclay. Hiya, said the Scot. Are you still outside Eleanor Dean's? Yeah. Is there anyone in there with her? No. Sam, I think I know what she's doing for those men. What? Robin told him. The only answer was a long silence. Finally, Barclay said, You're off your head, Robin. Maybe, said Robin. But the only way to know for sure is to knock on the door and ask if she'll do it for you. Say you were recommended to her by S.B. Will I fuck? said Barclay. Does Strike know you're asking me to do this? Sam, we've got a week left before the client pulls the plug. The worst that can happen is that she denies it. We're not going to have many more chances. She heard Barclay exhale, hard. All right, but it's on ye if you're wrong. Robin hurried onwards towards the tube station, second-guessing herself as she went. Would Strike think she was wrong to tell Barclay to go in, on her hunch? But they had a week left before the client withdrew funding. What was there now to lose? It was Saturday evening, and Robin arrived on the crowded tube platform to find she'd just missed a train. By the time she exited at Green Park Station, she'd lost the chance of arriving at the American bar early, which she'd hoped to do, so that she and Strike would have a few words together before Oakden arrived. Worse still, when she hurried down St. James's Street, she saw, with a sense of deja vu, a large crowd blocking the bottom of the road, being marshalled by police. As Robin slowed down, wondering whether she'd be able to get through the dense mass of people to the Stafford, a couple of sprinting paparazzi overtook her in pursuit of a series of black Mercedes. As Robin watched them pressing their lenses against windows, she became aware that the crowd in the distance was chanting, Johnny! Johnny! Through the windows of one of the cars heading towards the event, Robin glimpsed a woman in a Marie Antoinette wig. Only when she was nearly knocked sideways by a sprinting pair of autograph hunters, both of them holding deadbeats posters, did Robin realise with a thrill of shock that Strike's father was the Johnny whose name was being chanted. Shit! she said aloud, wheeling around and hurrying back up the road, pulling out her mobile as she went. She knew there was another entrance to the Stafford via Green Park. Not only was she going to be late, but a horrible suspicion had just hit her. Why had Oakden been so determined to meet on this specific evening? And why had it had to be this bar, so close to what she was afraid was an event involving Strike's father? Did Strike know, had he realised, what was happening close by? She called him, but he didn't pick up. Still walking, she typed out a text. Cormoran, I don't know whether you know this, but Johnny Rope is having an event around the corner. I think it's possible Oakden's trying to set you up. Breaking into a jog, because she was already five minutes late, she knew she'd just told Strike, for the very first time, that she knew who his father was. On her arrival in Green Park, she saw from a distance a policeman at the rear entrance, who, with one of the hotel's bowler-hatted attendants, was politely but firmly turning away two men with long-lensed cameras. "'Not this way, sorry,' said the policeman. Only for tonight. If it's the hotel you want, you'll have to go round the front. What's going on? 
demanded a suited man, hand in hand with a beautiful Asian woman in a Cheong Sam. We've got a dinner booking. Why can't we go through? Very sorry, sir, but there's an event on at Spencer House, explained the doorman, and the police want us to stop people using this as a shortcut. The two men with cameras swore and turned away, jogging back the way Robin had come. She lowered her head as they passed her, glad that she was still wearing her unneeded glasses, because her picture had appeared in the press during a court case a couple of years back. Maybe she was being paranoid, but Robin was worried the pressman had been trying to use the Stafford not as a shortcut to Ropeby and his guests, but as a means of getting to his estranged son. Now that the photographers had gone, the bowler-hatted attendant permitted the woman in the Chion Sam and her companion to enter, and after giving Robin a shrewd up-and-down glance, evidently decided she wasn't a photographer and allowed her to proceed through the gate into a courtyard where well-dressed drinkers were smoking beneath exterior heaters. After checking her mobile and seeing that Strike hadn't answered her text, she hurried up the steps into the American bar. It was a comfortable, elegant space of dark wood and leather, with pennants and baseball caps from many American states and universities hanging from the ceiling. Robin immediately spotted Strike standing in a suit at the bar, his surly expression lit by the rows of illuminated bottles on the wall. Cormoran, I just... If you're about to tell me my father's just round the corner, said Strike tersely, I know. This arsehole doesn't realise I'm wise to his attempted set-up, yet. Robin glanced into the far corner. Carl Oakden was sitting there, legs spread wide, an arm along the back of the leather bench. He was wearing a suit, but no tie, and his attitude was clearly meant to suggest a man at ease in these cosmopolitan surroundings. With his slightly too close-together eyes and his narrow forehead, he still resembled the boy who'd smashed Roy's mother's crystal bowl all those years ago. "'Go and talk to him. He wants some food. I'm getting menus,' muttered Strike. "'We just got started on Steve Douthwaite. Apparently Dorothy's always thought the bloke was suspicious.' Heading towards Oakden, Robin prayed that Strike was going to keep his temper. She'd only once seen him lose his cool with a witness, and had no desire to see it happen again. "'Mr. Oakden,' she said, smiling, as she reached him and extending her hand, "'I'm Robin Ellicott. We've emailed.' "'I know,' said Oakden, turning his head slowly to look her up and down with a smirk. He ignored her outstretched hand, and Robin could tell he did so deliberately. Refusing to show that she realised that he was trying to be offensive, she shrugged off her raincoat. "'Nice bar,' she said pleasantly, sitting down opposite him. "'I've never been here before.' "'Normally takes you to cheaper places, does he?' asked Oakden. "'Cormoran was just telling me you remember your mother talking about Steve Douth. "'Love,' said Oakden, legs still wide apart, arm along the back of the leather bench. "'I told you all along.' I'm not interested in being palmed off with assistants or secretaries. I'll talk to him or nobody. I'm actually Cormoran's. I bet you are, said Oakden, with a snigger. Don't suppose he can get rid of you now, can he? Sorry? Not now you've been knifed trying to do a man's job, said Oakden, with a glance towards her forearm as he raised his cocktail to his lips. You'd probably sue the shit out of him if he tried. Oakden, who'd evidently done his homework on the detectives, was clearly revelling in his rudeness. Robin could only suppose that the conman assumed she was too desperate for his information to take offence at his manner. He seemed determined to derive maximum pleasure from this encounter, to enjoy free alcohol and food, and bait a woman who was unlikely to walk away. Robin wondered which paper or picture agency he'd contacted to propose luring strike within a few hundred yards of his father's party and how much Oakden stood to gain if they could get a picture of Strike apparently publicly snubbing his father, or catch the detective on record saying something angry and quotable. "'There you go,' said Strike, throwing a couple of leather-bound menus onto the table and sitting down. He hadn't thought to bring Robin anything to drink. Oakden picked up a menu and perused it slowly, and he seemed to enjoy keeping them waiting. "'I'll have the club sandwich,' he said at last, and Strike hailed a waiter. The order given, Strike turned back to Oakden and said, "'Yeah, so you were saying, your mother found Douthwaite.' "'Oh, she definitely thought he was a charmer,' said Oakden. 
His eyes, Robin noted, kept moving to the entrance of the bar, and she was sure Oakden was waiting for photographers to burst in. Wide boy, you know the type, chatting up the slags on reception. The old woman said he tried it on with everyone. The nurse got all giggly when he was around and all. Robin remembered the gambling black skeleton of Talbot's notebook and the words written beside Crowley's figure of death. Fortuna says Pallas Athena, Ceres, Vesta and Cetus are scarlet women who ride upon the beast. And did your mother think he fancied Dr. Bamber? Oakden took a sip of his cocktail and smacked his lips. Well, I mean Margot, he said, with a small snort of laughter, and Robin found herself irrationally resentful of Oakden using the missing doctor's first name. You know, she was the classic wanted it always, wasn't she? What ways were those? said Strike. Bunny girl, said Oakden, taking another sip of his drink. Legs out, tits out. Then quick, get the white coat on. Don't think GPs wear white coats, said Strike. I'm talking metaphorically, said Oakden airily. Child of her time, wasn't she? How's that? The rise of gynocentric society, said Oakden, with a slight bow towards Robin, who suddenly thought his narrow head resembled a stoat's. Late sixties, early seventies, it's when it all started changing, isn't it? You've got the pill, consequence free fucking. Looks like it benefits the male, but by enabling women to avoid or subvert the reproductive function, you're repressing natural and healthy patterns of sex behaviour. You've got a gynocentric court system, which favours the female, even if she didn't want the kids in the first place. You've got a misandrist authoritarianism masquerading as a campaign for equal rights, policing men's thoughts and speech and natural behaviour. And you've got widespread sexual exploitation of men. Playboy club, that's all bullshit. Look, but don't touch. It's the old courtly love lie. The woman's there to be worshipped, the man's there to spew cash but never get satisfaction. Suckers, the men who hang around those places. Bamborough didn't look after her own kid, said Oakden, his eyes again darting to the entrance and back to strike. Didn't fuck her own husband, from what I heard. He was nearly always too ill to perform. He had plenty of cash, though, so she gets a nanny and goes lording it over men at work. Who specifically did she lord it over? asked Strike. Well, Douthwaite ran out of there practically crying last time he saw her, my old woman said. But that's been our culture since the sixties, hasn't it? Male suffering, nobody gives a shit. People whine when men break, when they can't handle it any more, when they lash out. If Douthwaite did her in, I don't personally think he did, said Oakden, with an expansive gesture, and Robin reminded herself that Carl Oakden had almost certainly never laid eyes on Stephen Douthwaite, and that he'd been fourteen years old when Margot disappeared. But if he did, I'd lay odds it's because she kicked his pain back in his teeth. Only women bleed, said Oakden, with a contemptuous little laugh. Isn't that right? He shot at Robin. Ah, there's my sandwich. While the waiter served him, Robin got up and headed to the bar, where the beautiful woman in a Cheong Sam whose hair hung like black silk in the light of the banked bottles of spirits, was standing with her partner. Both were ordering cocktails and looked delighted to be in each other's company. For a few seconds Robin suddenly wondered whether she'd ever again feel as they did. Her job reminded her almost daily of the many ways in which men and women could hurt each other. As she ordered herself a tonic water, Robin's phone rang. Hoping it was Barclay, she instead saw her mother's name. Perhaps Linda had got wind of Sarah's pregnancy. Matthew might have taken his wife to be back to Massam by now to share the good news. Robin muted the phone, paid for her drink, wishing it was alcoholic, and carried it back to the table in time to hear Oakden say to Strike, No, that didn't happen. You didn't add vodka to the punch at Dr. Bamborough's barbecue. Oakden took a large bite of his free sandwich and chewed it insolently. In spite of his thin hair and the many wrinkles around his eyes, Robin could clearly see the spoiled teenager inside the fifty-four-year-old. "'Nick some,' said Oakden thickly, then drank it in the shed. "'Surprised they missed it, but the rich are tight. How they stay minted, isn't it?' "'We heard the punch made someone sick. Not my fault,' said Oakden. "'Dr. Phipps was pretty annoyed, I hear.' "'Him,' said Oakden, with a smirk. Things worked out all right for old Phipps, didn't they? In what way? asked Strike. 
Wife out the way, marrying the nanny. All very convenient. Didn't like Phipps, did you? said Strike. That came across in your book. You've read it, said Oakton, momentarily startled. How come? Managed to track down an advance copy, said Strike. It should have come out in eighty-five, right? Yeah, said Oakton. Do you remember the gazebo that was under construction in the garden when the barbecue happened? One of Oakton's eyes flickered. He raised a hand quickly to his face and made a sweep of his forehead, as though he felt a hair tickling him. No, he said. It's in the background of one of your photos. They just started building the columns. I expect they'd already put down the floor. I can't remember that, said Oakden. The shed where you took the vodka wasn't near there then. Can't have been, said Oakden. While we're on the subject of nicking things, said Strike, would you happen to have the obituary of Dr. Brenner you took from Janice Beatty's house? I never stole no obituary from her house, said Oakden, with a display of disdain. What would I want that for? To get some information you could try and pass off as your own. I don't need to look up old Joe Brenner. I know plenty about him. He came round our house for his dinner every other Sunday. My old woman used to cook better than his sister, apparently. Go on, then, said Strike, his tone becoming combative. Amaze us. Oakden raised his sparse eyebrows. He chewed another bite of sandwich and swallowed it before saying, Hey, this was all your idea. You don't want the information? I'm happy to go. Unless you've got more than you put in your book. Brenner wanted Margot Bamborough struck off the bloody medical register. Come round our house one Sunday full of it. Couple of weeks before she disappeared. There, said Oakden pugnaciously. I kept that out of the book because my mother didn't want it in there. Why was that? Still loyal to him, said Oakden, with a little snort of laughter. And I wanted to keep the old dear happy at the time, because noises had been made about writing me out of the will. Old women, said the convicted con man, are a bit too persuadable if you don't keep an eye on them. She got chummy with a local vicar by the eighties. I was worried it was all going to go to rebuild the bloody church steeple unless I kept an eye on her. Why did Brenner want Bambara struck off? She examined some kid without parental permission. Was this Janice's son? asked Robin. Was I talking to you? Oakden shot at her. You, growled Strike, want to keep a civil tongue in your bloody head. Was it Janice's son, yes or no? Maybe, said Oakden, and Robin concluded that he couldn't remember. Point is, that's unethical behaviour, looking at a kid without a parent there, and old Joe was all worked up about it. I'll have her struck off for this, he kept saying. There, didn't get that from no obituary, did I? Oakden drank the rest of his cocktail straight off, then said, I'll have another one of those. Strike ignored this, saying, And this was two weeks before Bamborough disappeared. About that, yeah. Never seen the old bastard so excited. He loved disciplining people, old Joe. Vicious old bastard, actually. In what way? Told my old woman in front of me she wasn't hitting me enough, said Oakden. She bloody listened, too. Tried to lay about me with a slipper a couple of days later, silly cow. She learned not to do that again. Yeah? Hit her back, did you? Oakden's two close-together eyes raked Strike, as though trying to ascertain whether he was worth educating. If my father had lived, he'd have had the right to punish me, but her trying to humiliate me because Brenner told her to, I wasn't taking that. Exactly how close were your mother and Brenner? Oakden's thin brows contracted. Doctor and secretary, that's all. There wasn't anything else between them, if that's what you're implying. They didn't have a little lay down after lunch, then, said Strike. She didn't come over sleepy after Brenner had come over. You don't want to judge everyone's mother by yours, said Oakden. Strike acknowledged the jibe with a dark smile and said, Did your mother ask Brenner to sign the death certificate for your grandmother? The hell's that got to do with anything? Did she? I don't know, said Oakden his eyes darting once again towards the bar's entrance. Where did you get that idea? What are you even asking that for? Your grandmother's doctor was Margot Bamborough, right? I don't know, said Oakden. You can remember every word your mother told you about Steve Douthwaite, right down to him flirting with receptionists and looking tearful the last time he left the surgery, but you can't remember details of your own grandmother falling downstairs and killing herself. 
I wasn't there, said Oakden. I was out at a mate's house when it happened. Come home and seen the ambulance. Just your mother at home, then. The hell's this relevant to? What's the name of the mate whose house you were at? asked Strike, for the first time taking out his notebook. What are you doing? said Oakden, with an attempt at a laugh, dropping the last portion of his sandwich on his plate. What are you fucking implying? You don't want to give us his name. Why the fuck should... He was a schoolmate. Convenient for you and your mother, old Maud falling downstairs, said Strike. My information is she shouldn't have been trying to navigate stairs alone in her condition. Inherited the house, didn't you? Oakden began to shake his head very slowly, as though marvelling at the unexpected stupidity of Cormoran Strike. Seriously, you're trying to... Well, well. Not going to tell me the name of your school friend, then? Well, said Oakden, attempting a laugh. You think you can drop a word in a friendly journalist's ear to the effect that your long career of screwing over old ladies started with a good hard push in the small of your grandmother's back? Oh, yeah, I definitely can. Now you wait a fucking... I know you think it's me being set up tonight, said Strike, leaning in. His body language was unmistakably menacing, and out of the corner of her eye, Robin saw the black-haired woman in a Cheong Sam and her partner watching warily, both with their drinks at their lips. But the police have still got a note written to them in 1985, telling them to dig beneath the cross of St. John. DNA techniques have moved on a lot since then. They expect they'll be able to get a good match from the saliva under the envelope flap. Oakden's eyelid twitched again. You thought you were going to stir up a bit of press interest in the Bamber case to get people interested in your shitty book, didn't you? I never... I'm warning you. You go talking to the papers about me and my father, or about me working the Bamber case, and I'll make sure you get nailed for that note. And if by chance that doesn't work... I'll put my whole agency onto turning over every part of your miserable fucking life until I've got something else on you to take to the police. Understand? Oakden, who looked momentarily unnerved, recovered himself quickly. He even managed another little laugh. You can't stop me writing about whatever I want. That's freedom of... I'm warning you, repeated Strike, a little more loudly. What'll happen if you get in the way of this case? and you can pay for your own fucking sandwich. Strike stood up, and Robin, caught off guard, hastened to grab her raincoat and get up too. Cormoran, let's go out the back, she said, thinking of the two photographers lurking at the front of the building, but they hadn't gone more than two steps when they heard Oakden call after them. You think I'm scared of your fucking agency? Some fucking detective you are, he said, and now most of the heads in their vicinity turned. Glancing back, Robin saw that Oakden had got up too. He'd come out from behind the table and was planted in the middle of the bar, clearly set on making a scene. Strike, please, let's just go, said Robin, who now had a presentiment of real trouble. Oakden was clearly determined to come out of the encounter with something sellable, or at the very least, a narrative in which he'd come out on top. But Strike had already turned back towards their interviewee. You didn't even know your own fucking father's having a party round the corner, said Oakden loudly, pointing in the direction of Spencer House. Not going to pop in, thanking for fucking your mother on a pile of beanbags while fifty people watched. Robin watched what she had dreaded unfold in apparent slow motion. Strike lunged for Oakden. She made a grab for the arm Strike had drawn back for a punch, but too late. His elbow slammed into Robin's forehead, breaking her glasses in two. Dark spots popped in front of Robin's eyes, and the next thing she knew, she'd fallen backwards onto the floor. Robin's attempted intervention had given the con man a few seconds in which to dodge, and instead of receiving what might have been a knockout punch, he suffered no worse than a glancing blow to the ear. Meanwhile, the enraged strike, who'd barely registered his arm being impeded, realised what he'd done only when he saw drinkers all over the bar jumping to their feet, their eyes on the floor behind him. Turning, he saw Robin lying there, her hands over her face, a trickle of blood issuing from her nose. Shit! Strike bellowed. 
the young barman had run out from behind the bar. Oakton was shouting something about assault. Still slightly dizzy, tears of pain streaming from her eyes, the humiliated Robin was assisted back onto her feet by a couple of affluent-looking grey-haired Americans who were fussing about getting her a doctor. "'Um, absolutely fine,' she heard herself saying. She'd taken the full force of Strike's elbow between her eyebrows, and she realised her nose was bleeding only when she accidentally sprayed blood onto the kind American's white shirt front. "'Robin! Shit!' Strike was saying. "'Sir, I'm going to have to—' "'Yes, we're absolutely going to leave,' Robin told the waiter, absurdly polite, while her eyes watered and she tried to stem the bleeding from her nostrils. "'I just need—oh, thank you so much.' she said to the American woman, who'd handed Robin her raincoat. "'Call the police!' Oakden was shouting. Thanks to Robin's intervention, he was entirely unmarked. "'Someone call the bloody police!' "'I won't be pressing charges,' Robin said to nobody in particular. "'Robin, I'm so—' Grabbing a handful of Strike's sleeve, warm blood still trickling down onto her chin, Robin muttered, "'Let's just go.' She trod on the cracked lens of her glasses— as they headed out of the silent bar, the drinkers staring after them. Chapter 58 His lovely words, her seemed due recompense of all her past pains, one loving hour for many years of sorrow can dispense. A dram of sweet is worth a pound of sour, she has forgot how many, a woeful stour for him she late endured, she speaks no more of past. Before her stands her knight, for whom she toiled so sore. Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen Robin, don't tell me I shouldn't have tried to stop you, she said through gritted teeth, as they hurried through the outside courtyard. Her vision was blurred with tears of pain. Smokers turned to gape as she passed, trying to staunch her bleeding nose. If that punch had connected, we'd be back there waiting for the police. To Robin's relief, there were no paparazzi waiting for them as they headed into Green Park, but she was scared that it wouldn't take long, after the scene Strike had just made, for them to come hunting again. "'We'll get a cab,' said Strike, who was currently consumed with a mixture of total mortification and rage against Oakden, his father, the press, and himself. "'Listen, you're right.' "'I know I'm right, thanks,' she said, a little wildly. Not only was her face throbbing, she was now wondering why Strike hadn't warned her about Ropey's party, why, in fact, he'd let himself get lured there by a second-rate chancer like Oakden, careless of consequences for their case and for the agency. "'Taxi!' bellowed Strike, so loudly that Robin jumped. Somewhere nearby she heard running footsteps. A black cab pulled up, and Strike pushed Robin inside. "'Denmark Street!' he yelled at the cabbie, and Robin heard the shouts of photographers as the taxi sped up again. It's all right, said Strike, twisting to look out of the back window. They're on foot. Robin, I'm so fucking sorry. She pulled a mirror out of her bag to try and clean up her smarting face, wiping blood from her upper lip and chin. It looked as though she was going to have two black eyes. Both were rapidly swelling. Do you want me to take you home? said Strike. Furious at him, fighting the urge to cry out of pain, Robin imagined Mac's surprise and curiosity at seeing her in this state, imagined having to make light again of the injuries she'd sustained while working for the agency. She also remembered that she hadn't gone food shopping in days. No. I want you to give me something to eat and a strong drink. You've got it, said Strike, glad to have a chance to make reparations. Will a takeaway do? No, said Robin sarcastically pointing at her rapidly blackening eyes. I'd like to go to the Ritz, please. Strike started to laugh, but cut himself off, appalled at the state of her face. Maybe we should go to casualty. Don't be ridiculous. Robin, you're sorry, I know, you said. Strike's phone rang. He glanced down. Barclay could wait, he decided, and muted it. Three quarters of an hour later, the taxi dropped them at the end of Denmark Street, with a takeaway curry and a couple of clinking bottles. Once upstairs, Robin repaired to the toilet on the landing, where she washed dried blood from her nostrils and chin with a wad of wet toilet paper. 
Two increasingly swollen, red-purplish mounds containing her eyes looked back at her out of the cracked mirror. A blue bruise was spreading over her forehead. Inside the office, Strike, who'd normally have eaten the curry straight out of the foil tray it had come in, had brought out mismatched plates, knives and forks. Then, because Robin wanted a strong drink, went upstairs to his flat, where he had a bottle of his favourite whisky. There was a small freezer compartment in his fridge, where he kept ice packs for his stump, in addition to an ice tray. The cubes within this had been there for over a year, because although Strike enjoyed the odd drink of spirits, he generally preferred beer. About to leave the flat with the ice tray, he had second thoughts, and doubled back for one of the ice packs as well. Thank you, muttered Robin, when Strike reappeared, accepting the proffered ice pack. She was sitting in Pat's seat, behind the desk where she'd once answered the phone, where Strike had laid out the curry and plates. And you better redo next week's rota, she added, applying the ice pack gingerly to her left eye first, because there isn't a concealer in the world that's going to cover up this mess. I'm not going to have much chance of going unnoticed on surveillance with two black eyes. Robin, said Strike yet again, I'm so fucking sorry. I was a tit, I just... What do you want, vodka? Whiskey? Whiskey, she said, on the rocks. Strike poured both of them a triple measure. I'm sorry, he said yet again, while Robin took a welcome gulp of scotch, then began helping herself to curry. Strike sat down on the fake leather sofa opposite the desk. Hurting you's the last thing. There's no excuse for... I saw Red. I lost it. My father's other kids have been pestering me for months to go to that fucking party, said Strike, running his hand through the thick, curly hair that never looked disarranged. He felt she was owed the whole story now, the reason, if not the excuse, that he'd fucked up so badly. They wanted us to get a group photo taken for a present. Then Al tells me Rugby's got prostate cancer, which doesn't seem to have prevented him having four hundred mates over for a good old knees-up. I ripped up the invitation without registering where the thing was being held. I should have realised Oakton was up to something. I took my eye off the ball and... He downed half his drink in one. There's no excuse for trying to punch him, but everything... These last few months, Rokeby rang me in February. First time ever. Tried to bribe me into meeting him. He tried to bribe you, said Robin, pressing the ice back to her other eye, remembering the shouted, Go fuck yourself, from the inner office on Valentine's Day. As good as, said Strike. He said he was open to suggestions for helping me out. Well, it's forty years too fucking late for that. Strike down the rest of his whiskey, reached for the bottle, and poured the same again into his glass. When did you last see him? Robin asked. When I was eighteen. I've met him twice, Strike said. First time was when I was a kid. My mother tried to ambush him with me outside a recording studio. He'd only ever told Charlotte this. Her family was at least as dysfunctional and peculiar as his own, riven with scenes that to other people might have been epoch-defining. It was a month before Daddy torched Mummy's portrait in the hall, and the panelling caught fire, and the fire brigade came, and we all had to be evacuated via the upstairs windows. But the Campbells were so normalised they seemed routine. I thought he wanted to see me, said Strike. The shock of what he'd done to Robin, and the whisky scorching his throat, had liberated memories he usually kept locked up tight inside him. I was seven. I was so fucking excited. I wanted to look smart so he'd be... so he'd be proud of me. Told my mum to put me in my best trousers. We got outside his studio. My mother had music industry contacts. Someone had tipped her off he was going to be there and they wouldn't let us in. I thought there'd been a mistake. The bloke on the door obviously didn't realise my dad wanted to see me. Strike drank again. The curry lay cooling between them. My mother kicked off. They were threatening her when the band's manager got out of his car behind us. He knew who my mother was, and he didn't want a public scene. He took us inside, into a room away from the studio. The manager tried to tell her it was a dumb move, turning up. If she wanted more money, she should go through lawyers. That's when I realised my father hadn't invited us at all. She was just trying to force her way in. I started crying, said Strike roughly. 
just wanted to go. And then, while my mother and Rokeby's manager are going at it hammer and tongs, Rokeby walks in. He heard shouting on the way back from the bathroom. Probably just on a line. I realised that later. He was already wound up when he came into the room. And I tried to smile, said Strike. Snot all over my face. I didn't want him to think I was a whiner. I'd been imagining a hug. There you are at last. But he looked at me like I was nothing. Some fan's kid in too short trousers. My trousers were always too fucking short. I grew too fast. Then he clocked my mother. And he twigged. They started rowing. I can't remember everything they said. I was a kid. The gist was how dare she butt in. She had his lawyer's contact details. He was paying enough. It was her problem if she pissed it all away. And then he said, This was a fucking accident. I thought he meant he'd come to the studio accidentally or something. But then he looked at me. And I realised he meant me. I was the accident. Oh, God, Cormoran, said Robin quietly. Well, said Strike, you've got to give him points for honesty. He walked out. We went home. For a while afterwards, I held out a bit of hope he'd regretted what he'd said. It was hard to let go of the idea he wanted to see me deep down. But nothing. While the sun was far from setting, the room was becoming steadily darker. The high buildings of Denmark Street cast the outer office into shadow at this time of the evening, and neither detective had turned on the interior lights. Second time we met, said Strike, I made an appointment with his management. I was eighteen, just got into Oxford. We hadn't touched any of Rokeby's money for years. They'd been back to court to put restrictions on what my mother could do with it, because she was a nightmare with cash, just threw it away. Anyway, Unbeknownst to me, my aunt and uncle had informed Rokeby I'd got into Oxford. My mother got a letter saying he had no obligations to me now I'd turned eighteen, but reminding her I could use the money that had been accumulating in the bank account. I arranged to see him at his manager's office. He was there with his long-time lawyer, Peter Gillespie. Got a smile off Rokeby this time. Well, I was off his hands financially now, but old enough to talk to the press. Oxford had clearly been a bit of a shock to him. He'd probably hoped, with a background like mine, I'd slide quietly out of sight forever. He congratulated me on getting into Oxford, and said I had a nice little nest egg all built up now, because my mother hadn't spent any of it for six, seven years. I told him, said Strike, to stick his fucking money up his arse and set fire to it. Then I walked out. Self-righteous little prick I was. Didn't occur to me that Ted and Joan were going to have to stump up if Rokeby didn't, which is what they did. I only realised that later. But I didn't take their money long. After my mother died, midway through my second year, I left Oxford and enlisted. Didn't he contact you after your mum died? asked Robin quietly. No, said Strike. Or if he did, I never got it. He sent me a note when my leg got blown off. I'll bet that put the fear of God into him, hearing I'd been blown up. Probably worried sick about what the press might make of it all. Once I was out of Selly Oak, he tried to give me the money again. He'd found out I was trying to start the agency. Charlotte's friends knew a couple of his kids, which is how he got wind of it. Robin felt something flip in her stomach at the sound of Charlotte's name. Strike so rarely acknowledged her existence. I said no, at first. I didn't want to take the money. But no other fucker wanted to lend a one-legged ex-soldier without a house or any savings enough money to set up a detective agency. I told his prick of a lawyer I'd take just enough money to start the agency and pay it back in installments, which I did. That money was yours all along, said Robin, who could remember Gillespie pressing strike for repayments every few weeks when she'd first joined the agency. Yeah, but I didn't want it. Resented even having to borrow a bit of it. Gillespie acted as though, you get people like Gillespie around the rich and famous, said Strike. His whole ego was invested in being my father's enforcer. The bastard was half in love with my old man, or with his fame, I don't know. 
I was pretty blunt on the phone about what I thought about Rokeby, and Gillespie couldn't forgive it. I'd insisted on a loan agreement between us, and Gillespie was going to hold me to it, to punish me for telling him exactly what I thought of the pair of them. Strike pushed himself off the sofa, which made its usual farting noises as he did so, and began helping himself to curry. When they both had full plates, he went to fetch two glasses of water. He'd already got through a third of the whisky. Cormoran, said Robin, once he was settled back on the sofa and had started eating. You do realise I'm never going to gossip about your father to other people. I'm not going to talk to you about him if you don't want to, but we're partners. You could have told me he was hustling you and let off steam that way, instead of punching a witness. Strike chewed some of his chicken jalfrezi, swallowed, then said quietly, Yeah, I know. Robin ate a bit of Nan. Her bruised face was aching less now. The ice pack and the whiskey had both numbed her in different ways. Nevertheless, it took a minute to marshal the courage to say, I saw Charlotte's been hospitalised. Strike looked up at her. He knew, of course, that Robin was well aware who Charlotte was. Four years previously, he'd got almost too drunk to walk and told her a lot more than he'd ever meant to about the alleged pregnancy Charlotte had insisted was his, which had broken them apart forever. Yeah, said Strike. And he told Robin the story of the farewell text messages and his dash to the public payphone, and how he'd listened until they'd found Charlotte lying in undergrowth in the grounds of her expensive clinic. Oh, my Christ, said Robin, setting down her fork. When did you know she was alive? Knew for sure two days later when the press reported it, said Strike. He heaved himself back out of his chair, topped up Robin's whiskey, then poured himself more before sitting back down again. But I concluded she must be alive before that. Bad news travels faster than good. There was a long silence in which Robin hoped to hear more about how being drawn into Charlotte's suicide attempt, and by the sounds of it, saving her life, had made him feel. But Strike said nothing, merely eating his curry. Well, said Robin at last, again, in future, maybe we could try that talking thing, before you die of a stress-induced heart attack or, you know, end up killing someone we need to question. Strike grinned ruefully. Yeah, we could try that, I suppose. Silence closed around them again, a silence that seemed to the slightly drunk strike to thicken like honey, comforting and sweet, but slightly dangerous if you sank too far into it. Full of whiskey, contrition, and a powerful feeling he preferred at all times not to dwell upon, he wanted to make some kind of statement about Robin's kindness and her tact, but all the words that occurred to him seemed clumsy and unserviceable. He wanted to express something of the truth, but the truth was dangerous. How could he say, look, I've tried not to fancy you since you first took off your coat in this office. I try not to give names to what I feel for you, because I already know it's too much, and I want peace from the shit that love brings in its wake. I want to be alone, and unburdened, and free. But I don't want you to be with anyone else. I don't want some other bastard to persuade you into a second marriage. I like knowing the possibilities there, for us too, maybe. Except it'll go wrong, of course. Because it always goes wrong. Because if I were the type for permanence, I'd already be married. And when it goes wrong, I'll lose you for good. And this thing we've built together, which is literally the only good part of my life, my vocation, my pride, my greatest achievement, will be forever fucked because I won't find anyone I enjoy running things with, the way I enjoy running them with you, and everything afterwards will be tainted by the memory of you. If only she could come inside his head and see what was there, Strike thought, she'd understand that she occupied a unique place in his thoughts and in his affections. He felt he owed her that information, but was afraid that saying it might move this conversation into territory from which it would be difficult to retreat. But, from second to second, sitting here, now with more than half a bottle of neat whiskey inside him, a different spirit seemed to move inside him, asking himself for the first time whether determined solitude 
was what he really wanted forevermore. Joanie reckons you're going to end up with your business partner, that Robin girl. All or nothing, see what happens. Except that the stakes involved in making any kind of move would be the highest of his life. Higher by far than when he'd staggered across a student party to chat up Charlotte Campbell, when, however much agony he'd endured for her later, he'd risked nothing more than minor humiliation and a good story to tell. Robin, who'd eaten as much curry as she could handle, had now resigned herself to not hearing what Strike felt for Charlotte. She supposed it had been a forlorn hope, but it was something she was very keen to know. The neat whisky she'd drunk had given the night a slight fuzziness, like a rain haze, and she felt slightly wistful. She knew that if it hadn't been for the alcohol, she might feel simply unhappy. I suppose, said Strike, with a fatalistic daring of a trapeze artist, swinging out into the spotlight, only black air beneath him. Ilsa's been trying to match make your end as well. Across the room, sitting in shadow, Robin experienced something like an electric shock through her body. That Strike would even allude to a third party's idea of them being romantically involved was unprecedented. Didn't they always act as though nothing of the sort could be further from anyone's mind? Hadn't they always pretended certain dangerous moments had never happened, such as when she'd modelled that green dress for him and hugged him while wearing her wedding dress and felt the idea of running away together pass through his mind as well as hers? Yes, she said at last. I've been worried, well, embarrassed about it, because I haven't... No, said Strike quickly. I never thought you were... She waited for him to say something else, suddenly acutely aware, as she'd never been before, that a bed lay directly above them, barely two minutes from where they sat. And, like Strike, she thought, everything I've worked and sacrificed for is in jeopardy if I take this conversation to the wrong place. Our relationship will be forever marred by awkwardness and embarrassment. But worse than that, by far, she was scared of giving herself away. The feelings she'd been denying to Matthew, to her mother, to Ilsa and to herself, must remain hidden. Well, sorry, said Strike. What did that mean, Robin wondered, her heart thumping very hard. She took another large gulp of whiskey before she said, why are you apologising? You're not. She's my friend. She's mine too now, said Robin. I don't think she can help herself. She sees two friends of the opposite sex getting on. Yeah, said Strike. All antennae now. Was that all they were? Friends of the opposite sex? Not wanting to leave the subject of men and women, he said, You never told me how mediation went. How come he settled after dragging it out all this time? Sarah's pregnant. They want to get married before she has it, or before she gets too big for a designer dress, knowing Sarah. Shit, said Strike quietly, wondering how upset she was. He couldn't read her tone or see her clearly. The office was now full of shadow, but he didn't want to turn on the lights. Is he? Did you expect that? Suppose I should have, said Robin, with a smile Strike couldn't see but which hurt her bruised face. She was probably getting annoyed with the way he was dragging out our divorce. When he was about to end their affair, she'd left an earring in our bed for me to find. Probably getting worried he wasn't going to propose, so she forgot to take her pill. It's the one way women can control men, isn't it? She said, momentarily forgetting Charlotte and the baby she claimed to have lost. I've got a feeling she just told him she was pregnant when he cancelled mediation the first time. Matthew said it was an accident. Maybe he didn't want to have it when she first told him. Do you want kids? Strike asked Robin. I used to think so, said Robin slowly. Back when I thought Matthew and I were, you know, forever. As she said it, memories of old imaginings came to her of a family group that had never existed, but which had once seemed quite vivid to her. The night that Matthew had proposed, she'd formed a clear mental picture of the pair of them with three children, a compromise between his family, where there had been two children, and her own, which had had four. She'd seen it all quite clearly, 
Matthew cheering on a young son who was learning to play rugby, as he'd done himself. Matthew watching his own little girl on stage, playing Mary in the school nativity play. It struck her now how very conventional her imaginings had been, and how much Matthew's expectations had become her own. Sitting here in the darkness with Strike, Robin thought that Matthew would, in fact, be a very good father to the kind of child he'd be expecting. In other words, a little boy who wanted to play rugby, or a little girl who wanted to dance in a tutu. He'd carry their pictures around in his wallet, he'd get involved at their schools, he'd hug them when they needed it, he'd care about their homework. He wasn't devoid of kindness. He felt guilty when he did wrong. It was simply that what Matthew considered right was so heavily coloured by what other people did, what other people considered acceptable and desirable. But I don't know any more, said Robin, after a short pause. I can't see myself having kids while doing this job. I think I'd be torn, and I don't ever want to be torn again. Matthew was always trying to guilt me out of this career. I didn't earn enough, I worked too many hours, I took too many risks. But I love it, said Robin, with a trace of fierceness, and I don't want to apologise for that any more. What about you? she asked Strike. Do you want children? Nope, said Strike. Robin laughed. Was funny. I give a whole soul-searching speech on the subject, and you're just... No. I shouldn't be here, should I? said Strike, out of the darkness. I'm an accident. I'm not inclined to perpetuate the mistake. There was a pause. Then Robin said with asperity, Strike, that's just bloody self-indulgent. Why? said Strike, startled into a laugh. When he'd said the same to Charlotte... She'd both understood and agreed with him. Early in her teens, her drunken mother had told Charlotte she'd considered aborting her. Because, for God's sake, you can't let your whole life be coloured by the circumstances of your conception. If everyone who was conceived accidentally stopped having kids, we'd all be better off, wouldn't we? said Strike robustly. The world's overpopulated as it is. Anyway, none of the kids I know make me particularly keen to have me own. You like Jack? I do. But that's one kid out of God knows how many. Dave Polworth's kids. You know who Polworth is. Your best mate, said Robin. He's my oldest mate, Strike corrected her. My best mate? For a split second, he wondered whether he was going to say it. But the whiskey had lifted the guard he usually kept upon himself. Why not say it? Why not let go? Is you. Robin was so amazed she couldn't speak. Never in four years had Strike come close to telling her what she was to him. Fondness had had to be deduced from offhand comments, small kindnesses, awkward silences, or gestures forced from him under stress. She'd only once before felt as she did now, and the unexpected gift that had engendered the feeling had been a sapphire and diamond ring, which she'd left behind when she walked out on the man who'd given it to her. She wanted to make some kind of return, but for a moment or two, her throat felt too constricted. I, well, the feeling's mutual. Thank <laughs> you.